The world's population is increasing rapidly. The number of people alive now exceeds the number of people who have died in the last few hundred years. With the development of civilization, the number of people committing sins is increasing. Lucifer, the Lord of Hell, asked Bahamark if he understood what it meant. The supreme demon Bahamark is in an eternal prison for dead sinners. Lucifer said that his hell was becoming very crowded. Its population density has increased dramatically. Lucifer ordered his faithful servant Bahamark to create a new hell. Bahamark gathered all his subordinates and gave them the task he had received from Lucifer. Bahamark showed everyone the key of the Lord of Hell that he had gotten his hands on. The demons looked at him in surprise. Is this really the key of the Lord of Hell? Demoness Anaktor said that her master Bahamark had succeeded. Anaktor says her master has become Lord of the New Hell, and she congratulated him on that. Bahamark explained that he has been Lucifer's servant for almost 500 years and has fulfilled his every whim and that's why his new appointment is natural. An actor asked, Has the master thought what the new hell will be like? Bahamark stated that a demon always lacks imagination. He is no exception. However, there's a man he's had his eye on for a long time, someone who should be able to help. An actor wondered, Did my master really say that man? Bahamark confirmed. The supreme demon said this man, rejected by society and locked alone in his room. This man, the ban of all men. He has an awakened talent for creating hell. Bahamark has been watching him for a long time. This person has had old food scraps in their room for a long time. Plastic bottles of urine scattered around the room. The windows and curtains haven't been open for three whole months. The doorknob was covered in dust and cobwebs because the door hadn't been opened in a long time. The young man naturally has a reason for living this way. The young man's three-month refusal to attend school is due to the fact that he has been betrayed by everyone. The young man has his own point of view about this voluntary imprisonment. He is willing to share it, and maybe then no one will judge him. There are several reasons that prompted him to do this. The father knocks on the young man's room and tells Yom Shungi to come out of the room at last. The first reason is this man. The man calls the young man names and says that his father's words mean nothing to him. The father tells the woman to bring him a hammer. His patience is wearing thin. In addition to his father, there's this woman. This is the same parasite who climbed on his father's back and scratches her to get crumbs to live on. The woman tells the man to control himself. The woman suggests that she is very unpleasant to the young man because his mother was kicked out. For this reason, he doesn't even leave the room. The woman tells Nam Kyung to calm down. The man says that Jong is not guilty of anything. She is the one who helps him cope even with such immoral behavior of the young man. The woman thanks him for thinking so. She tries to reassure him. A man suggests going out for dinner. The woman asks, maybe you want something specific? The man said he was going to use the savings he had set aside for his son's schooling. He is now offering to buy her a new handbag. The woman said that one good handbag just came to her mind. The young man sitting lurking in his room heard it all. He hated them terribly. The second reason for the young man was the man who betrayed him and those who had taunted him at school three months before. Our hero takes a powerful punch to the stomach. The guy flies far back and falls on his back. He's hit pretty hard. The young man who saw it all smirked and said the guy flew far away. The young men continue to taunt the young man and tell him to take the first stance. The boy gets on his knees, lowers his head and says that he is crushed from the first blow. A young man on all fours crawls up to the instigators. A guy says to one of the guys, help me, after all, we've been friends since middle school. The young man looks at him pleadingly. The young man does nothing in response and he doesn't even have anything to say. As children, the young people were firm friends. They spent a lot of time together. One of the guys asks, Did Xiong Huan really befriend that poor guy? Why doesn't he beat him? The head bully says, Now he understands why he's acting like that. Xiong Huan doesn't want to fall behind his buddies. He moves away from the young man, his former friend. Xiong Huan lashes out at his childhood friend and says, They weren't friends. He doesn't look that easy and punches the young man several times. A guy's glasses broke, he asks, why? The young man was hurt and offended. The guy kept hitting the young man and says he's not like that. 
he could never be a friend to such a loser. And he doesn't look like an easy target like that. Guy beat his ex-boyfriend to a bloody pulp. The bullies decided that Xiong Wan was being set up and that he shouldn't socialize with that weakling. They told Xiong Wan to keep hitting him. A young man was lying on the ground with his face smashed in. He was covered in blood. Xiong Wan took his former friend by the chest and told him not to pretend they knew each other from now on. The angry guy told him not to make him a loser like himself. Xiong Wan betrayed his friend. Now the reason why the young man voluntarily imprisons himself in the room becomes clear. It is not a mere excuse. The young man was creating his worlds in the computer. Here was another map completed. He tried to upload it. The computer screen indicated that the map maker Sand specialized in crafting maps. The young man published a new hell survival map. The world that the young man was not hiding was in this monitor, and the boy was quite satisfied with it. The young man lay in bed and felt sad. He felt secure only inside this room. The young man cried. He knew that if he stayed inside this room, no one else would betray him. The young man was interested in something in the room. He reached for his glasses. The boy thought his father and that woman were already asleep. The young man was interested in the feedback on his new card and pulled himself closer to the monitor. The guy read the reviews on his new card. The reactions were good. He was told it was the best map this year. In the corner of the screen, the young man read that he had received a message. Who stays awake at this hour, he thought. The boy was surprised to read what it said. It intrigued him. An interlocutor wrote that he had a lot of fun playing this map. It was a level of perfection comparable to real hell. The interlocutor wanted to talk to the young man about the creation of hell and offered to meet. The boy noted to himself that his interlocutor had a strange manner of speech. Probably some inexperienced user, thought the boy. What kind of a meeting can we talk about? How could he possibly know where I am right now? The Supreme Demon naturally knew the place to find this guy. Suddenly the young man had some unusual lighting in his room. The boy wondered, what could it be? The young man stared in amazement at the strange phenomenon that had arisen in his room during the night. The whole room lit up in an unnatural way. The young man was frightened. He assumed it was something supernatural. The room was on fire. Suddenly someone appeared out of the fire. At first the young man saw his foot. The boy thought, could there really be a man in the fire? This is some kind of nonsense. A huge monster appeared out of the fire. The boy pushed himself against the wall out of fear. The monster said that he was a great demon. The great demon introduced himself and said he was the lord of a new 20th hell named Bahamurk. The young man realized that there was no such thing. He decided he was depressed, plus the refusal to go to school. And then there were the ghost hallucinations. He was clearly on a downward slope. The demon grabbed the young man's arm and lifted him up. He said that he was not a low creature like a ghost, and he was not a hallucination. He is the demon Bahamurk himself. Bahamurk said he came here to utilize the young man's talent. The demon said a friendly hello to the young man, bumping his fist together. The boy became even more frightened and retreated to a corner of the room. The demon said that he was pissed off by the young man's behavior. He should be serious. Bahamurk stated if the young man did not calm down, he would pull out his brain and immediately swallow it raw. The demon sat the young man in front of him on the bed. He said he had a business conversation. The young man took a can of soda to calm down. The guy opened his jar, it hissed and bubbles came out. The man calmed down a bit and asked if his interlocutor was really a demon. Bahamurk declared that he was not just a demon, but a supreme demon. And after that, he took the can of soda from the young man. He was interested in it. The supreme demon Bahamurk poured this soda into his weird mouth to taste test it. When the young man had finally calmed down, he asked, Has the supreme demon been watching my new card? The demon liked the soda and continued to drink it. Bahamurk said the young man has talent. In particular, the hell card he made this time around is really impressive. This card with no way to get out of hell is exactly what he needs. There's a torture of false hope in the map made by a small passageway through which it seems you can escape. It's grandiose. Bahamurk noted that the map is meticulously designed. It has many traps that constantly torment the players. 
The look of this card looks very elegant despite such brutality all around. The young man thought it was just a card made because of the desire for revenge that was clouding his brain. The higher demon told the young man that hell could not sustain such a rapid increase in population over the last 100 years. It had simply exploded and expanded in size. Behamark boasted that Lucifer had appointed him Lord of the New Hell. He deserved it. Bahamurg has come to the young man with a business proposition. He wants the young man to set up this hell for him. The demon would be satisfied if the young man created a hell like his map, or maybe even better. The boy was surprised. He couldn't believe that all this was happening to him in reality. The young man said that he hadn't thought of doing something like that and he added that he didn't want anything to do with a higher demon. It's immoral. The young man said that he was happy with his life as it was. Bahamark looked around the young man's room and wondered, Are you really satisfied with this life? Bahamark asked, How can one be satisfied with such a miserable life? Does the young man not see what is going on around him? The high demon said the young man didn't finish his business proposition. Bahamark said that in order to build hell, and make sure it works properly, an experiment would have to be done. The young man didn't understand what it was supposed to look like. The boy had already not ruled out his participation in this project. Bahamark said he would give the young man the right to put the sinners he wanted into the hell he had built. The demon added that everyone who made him suffer would be able to go to that hell. Wouldn't the young man want that? The boy was ready to sign the contract already. That day, Weak and pathetic, running away from the world, the young man said he agreed. The boy agreed. If only he could get revenge on all those scoundrels. The young man said he would do anything under those conditions. And he and the demon struck a deal. The demon's power and the young man's talent are the key to the success of this event. Bahamark noted that this young man took the key without a single hesitation, as if he had only been waiting for it. The demon noted philosophically that this was excellent. The beginning of the cooperation had been made. Bahamark's eyes glowed with a demonic light. He could accomplish his goals. The contract was done. The young man said he would have to set a goal so he would have something to build off of. The demon gave the young man the key and said he would explain how to use it. The boy's eyes sparkled with joy. He had a chance to take revenge on all the scoundrels. The Supreme Demon was glad that so far he had been able to carry out everything according to the plan he had conceived. Bahamark said that man is free to decide what kind of hell he will create. It all depends on his imagination. The Demon added that there are two mandatory elements to its creation. The guy asked what those terms and conditions were. That would be the terms of reference, he explained. First condition. Bahamark said that the hell created by the young man must have a sin for which he would be imprisoned. The name of this sin would be the name and nature of the hell. Hell of greed, hell of lies, something like that? The young man asked. The demon declared that the young man was smart, kind of like greed hell and lie hell. Bahamark said that these two hells already exist, so something else must be chosen. The young man immediately thought about it. He needs to pick a sin so that he can target and throw anyone he wants at it. Second condition. The new hell must have a structure from which there is no exit. The point is to make sinners suffer eternally. If the sinner somehow gets out of this hell, hell will disappear naturally. And the demon, the master of this hell, will also disappear. The young man interjected so if there was a hole in the hell he made, Bahamark would be responsible. Bahamark agreed. However, he does not feel burdened in this case. If he is to disappear, he is ready. However, before doing so, he would definitely destroy the young man's soul. The guy decided that this demon was shameless. He's saying something creepy. Bahamark said that he would now give the young man the tools to create this hell. The young man sat down at his desk and began loading the program the demon had given him into his computer. The night sky in his world turned blood red. Deadly lightning flashed over the city. The monitor was almost out of commission from the intense work. Lightning bolts were popping out. Bahamark said that the young man would design with this program, and his servants and younger demons will already build on the likeness. The young man saw on the monitor screen how the little demons were building hell out of bricks. The demon said that now the young man must show what he can do. 
Hell's construction site. Construction is underway under the direction of Bahamark. The project manager, under an umbrella on a chaise lounge, watched the construction in silence. To keep from dying of thirst, the demon stocked up on sodas. He liked that drink. There were many minions and they all participated in the construction work with great enthusiasm. Among the minions was, as it were, the management staff who oversaw a portion of the project and made sure the tasks were accomplished. The mainstream working class has been relentlessly bringing up the bricks and creating step by step a new hell. The demon continued to watch the young man create this world on his computer. Bahamark thought that seven days, four hours, and 37 minutes had passed since he had given the young man his work. All this time, the young man did not sleep. He was creating this incredible and seemingly huge structure. The young man himself was very incredible. The demon thought there was a huge hatred living inside this young man. Bahamark was pleased with himself. He had chosen the right man. At one point, the young man said that he had finished creating hell. Job done. The demon praised the young man and said it was excellent. The young man showed his creation. Bahamark noticed that the young man had done it faster than he had thought. The demon asked if the young man had chosen a name for this hell. The guy said one word, betrayal. The young man added that it would be a hell of a betrayal. The young man and the demon decided to test this project. The boy looked out of the room. The young man was curious to see what was being done outside his room. His father's girlfriend was sitting in the next room, looking at something on her phone. The young man decided that it was not worth procrastinating, and the hour of revenge had come. The demon admonished the young man. The person who can be imprisoned in hell is the one who committed the sin that the young man himself chose already after the hell of betrayal had been created. The conditions are satisfied only when the sin is committed, after hell has been created. If the sin was before the creation of hell, it does not count. The young man realized that if this condition was not met, the key would not respond. The demon said if the key reacted, it would open the door to hell and drag the sinner there. The young man approached the woman. She was looking at her phone and did not get distracted. The lady took a picture of her purse standing nearby on the table. The woman said the young man stank. She told the boy to wash up and go away. The woman added that the young man reeked just like his mother. The guy immediately looked at the key. The key was unresponsive. The young man thought that not even an hour had passed since the creation of his project. The woman had not yet committed a sin. The guy clutched the key in his hand and thought the surest way, wait a few days. The woman, without taking her eyes off her phone, said, if nothing was wrong, that rascal boy could go back to his place. The women wondered why he was out. After all, he hadn't been seen for a long time. The guy's all indignant. He wants to get rid of her right now because she's trash worthy of it. The young man recalled that his mother married at 23. She was sold. A woman from a poor family married a man from a rich family. His mother had to live under the guidance of her mother-in-law, who constantly oppressed her. And despite this, the woman constantly forced herself to smile in front of her son. The woman was constantly friendly to the young man and always wished him well. His mother was constantly bearing grudges had a right to cry all the time because of her hard life. There were always scandals in the young man's family. His father often drank and had scandals with his wife. The young man covered his ears and eyes to avoid seeing this horror. The woman often had signs of beatings on her face. Eventually, his mother lost that too. Her husband kicked her out, but it wasn't out of love. His father's new woman preferred to date older men because they had lots of money. A woman brags on the phone to her girlfriend about how good her life is now and how many gifts she has. A young man overhears a woman on the phone telling him he's a jerk. The lady noticed that someone was standing behind her back. She turned around. The woman noticed it was a young man. He was leaning on a crutch. The woman asked, Why are you eavesdropping on my conversations? Haven't you been taught good manners? The woman warned him to keep his mouth shut or he would be thrown out of here like his mother. The woman warned him to keep his mouth shut or he'd be thrown out, just like his mother. The woman asked again, Why did he leave his room? Why is he silent and unresponsive? The young man asked how much she wanted to get to leave his father and get out of here. The lady was surprised at the young man's question. What does he mean? The guy says she doesn't have to pretend to be in front of him. He knows she's only staying with his father for the money. 
The woman laughed and said she found communication in words. If need be, she herself would take whatever she saw fit. What could she get from this stinking boy who had nothing? The young man said he is there to give the 100 million money his father had saved for his studies. The kid said he knows where the father keeps his finances. The young man said it was a substantial sum. She has enough for the rest of her life. The young man said if the woman didn't believe it, he could show her. The woman wondered, did the young man really know where his father's finances were? The guy opened the closet and walked over to the safe. He knew the secret code. The woman caught herself thinking that she used to think only about brand name clothes and living in a luxury apartment. The lady thought she had hit the jackpot this time. The young man opened the safe and showed its contents. It was a real treasure for the woman. She had never seen so much money at once. The young man asked the woman, with that kind of money, you can get a good job abroad, right? The woman suspected something wrong. Why is the young man doing this all of a sudden? Shouldn't he keep quiet about it? After all, it's money for his future. Bahamark, observing these actions, decided that the woman was not so simple. The demon asked the young man what he was going to do next. The guy wondered what else he should do. He should push her harder. Suddenly he cried and said that he wanted his mother back. As soon as the woman left, his mother could come back. The guy added, that's why he's willing to do anything. The woman can take it all and get out of here. The woman thought that this young man was really stupid. Could it really be that simple? The lady pulled out her large bag and began shifting the contents of the safe into it. The young man, watching the actions of this treacherous woman, thought that this would satisfy the condition, the betrayal of his father. The woman wanted to know more passwords and other bank details of the young man's father. The guy agreed to give it to her. The young man then said that the woman would not need all of this in hell. The lady looked back and asked what the young man meant. The guy pointed the key at his interlocutor and pushed it down. The next moment, something incredible happened in the room. It glowed red. Lightning appeared. There was a crackling sound. A door to hell appeared before the young man, which he immediately began to unlock. The door swung open. From there, an infernal entity appeared and captivated the woman. The woman screamed in fear. The next moment, the woman was placed on the other side of the door in the most real hell. Her screaming did not stop. It was a scream of horror. A young man sent a living man to hell. The woman screamed, for what? Where am I? She swore, screamed and went mad with despair. There was no escape for her. The young man understood in his heart that such an act could not be justified. The chief demon was watching the progress of events in his new hell through his tablet. It was like watching a computer game. Bahamark was an advanced demon. Bahamark offered the young man a look and handed him a clipboard. The young man said he was nauseous and wouldn't watch anything. The demon calmly asked the young man if he felt remorse. The boy turned away, not showing his face to the demon. What kind of remorse are we talking about? The young man covered his face with his hands and smiled quietly. He felt good. The young man put on his school suit. He thought he had lost a lot of weight while he had been holed up in his room. The uniform fit him more loosely. Bramark was surprised. It had been less than an hour since that woman had been sent to hell, and he was already rushing for the next one. The boy said if he was going to take a knife, he had to get rid of everyone. The young man remarked to the demon that he didn't like the fact that his hell was empty either, did he? We need to increase its occupancy. The demon stated that the young man was only pretending to care, actually acting for his own gratification. Bramark, however, agreed with the young man. Completed hell is the screams of prisoners. It would be better to fill it up tighter. The young man, wearing his school uniform for the first time in three months, went to class. He said he was done with his training. The guy said he would have the opportunity to use this key at school too. The young man at school would be looking for the next traitor. The demon thought with satisfaction that his hell would gradually fill up. Brahamark was all about anticipation and anticipation. The students walked into their classroom and thought some celebrity had come to their school. Turns out it was Yeom Seungi who came back to study. The young man set down his bag and sat down at his desk. The students were paying attention to him. The classmates who were constantly beating the young man began to insult and call him names. Many people couldn't understand why he came to class. After all, 
he refused to go to school. His classmates reasoned that he was being chased by a gang of hooligans. He shouldn't have come here. It didn't take long for the bullies to show up. They too fit into this class. The classmates said that the atmosphere in the class had gone bad again. Why did that loser come back to class? The kid heard it all. The young man decided that today he would show everyone why he came to class. All the scoundrels, the bullers, will get what they deserve today. Shungi held the key in his hand and thought he had come to send these scum to hell. The bullies stopped near the entrance to the classroom and looked at the young man. They had a threatening look on their faces. The bullers called the young man's name and were glad they now had someone to mock. The bullies approached the young man and told him if he was going to come to school today, he should have warned them. After all, they are friends and he doesn't count with them. That offends them. Brahamurk said the young man was popular in class, judging by the uproar when he arrived. The young man ignored the bullies and prepared for class. The young man's former childhood friend threw his textbooks on the floor and yelled at him. The boy yelled that he had scratches on his face from his last encounter with the young man that were not easy to heal. The bully shouted that the young man should make up for it. The bully said if the young man didn't want to get punched in the face, he should follow him quietly. They won't make a fuss in class. The young men made their way to the men's room. The bullies encircled Yeom Seongi from all sides. The bullers said the young man should make it up to them. One of the villains hit the young man in the face with his fist with all his might. The young man staggered and fell on his back. The blow was very strong. The boy did not utter a word. The villain said that the weakling must have swallowed his tongue. Why doesn't he talk all the time? The demon looked at the young man and realized the meaning of the phrase, looking like a hunted rat. Braham Merck told the young man, it's not like they had any relationship before. It's not going to be easy to get those guys to commit the sin of betrayal. The demon asked the young man what ideas he had about it. The boy had to think of something urgently. The young man didn't yet understand how to send them all to hell. Brahamurk was right. There was no relationship between him and these guys. The bullers looked down at the young man and smirked gloatingly. The guy didn't yet understand how he could get these guys to betray him. Xiongi decided to get clever. Since ancient times, people have used improvised means to catch animals several times bigger and stronger than themselves. The young man decided to use a decoy. For this, he needed the necessary tool. Bait has at all times been the most effective weapon. The guy went into his inside pocket. The hooligans thought that Xiongi had brought the knife with him. The young man decided to use a money trap as bait. The hooligans' eyes went wide when they saw that the young man took money out of his pocket. Was he offering a bribe so that they would not hit him anymore? The young man's former childhood friend decided he was being stupid, probably because his head hit the floor. After all, he could just smack him around and take the money. Why would he do that? The young man said, now he will explain what he wants to do with that money. Siungi's eyes lit up like a real demon. He said that his former friend wouldn't do that. After all, it wouldn't be fair. The demon watched the young man's action. He wondered how it would end. The guy threw the wrap of money on the floor. The young man said he wanted to clarify something. The former friend pounced on the young man and told him to shut his mouth. He was ready to hit him. The associate stopped the guy and prevented him from hitting Siungi. They suggested we listen to what Siungi has to say first. It's money after all. The young man realized that the bullies had taken his bait. One of the villains picked up a wad of money. It was a considerable sum. The bully reasonably thought that the young man could most likely give more money. The bully walked over to Siunga, sat down, and asked in a friendly manner what his request would be. The young man pointed his finger at his former childhood friend and told him to beat him up along with the young man. Siungi showed that he still had money in his pocket, and he said that in that case he would give as much money as they wanted. The young man said they should beat Siung Huan, who was his childhood friend and betrayed him very badly. Siungi thought the trap had been slammed. Now hunting time has begun. One of the hooligans looking at the money said that this young man was quite an interesting young man, 63. One of the bullies put the money in his pocket and told Sung Hwan that he really was that loser's childhood friend, so he was pretending the whole time, so let him not take offense at them. Buller added that Xiong Hwan might consider it retribution or karma. 
The bullies grabbed Xiong Huan with the intention of beating him up. The guy screamed for them not to touch him. He was really scared. Xiong Huan wanted to justify himself and shouted that they had gotten it all wrong. It was different, and he wasn't a friend to this unfortunate man. Why didn't they believe him? The bully said that this young man is some kind of disgusting jerk. Can't he see that his friends just want to make some money? What's he trying to do? Xiong Wan grabbed Xiong Yi's chest and asked him why he was dragging him into this. How could he do this to a childhood friend? The young man said that Xiong Wan made him like that himself. And when they were kids, they were real friends. Things are different now. Seung-gi laughed and said that now the former childhood friend could experience everything on his own skin. Seung wan pounced on the young man and wanted to hit him. The bullies shoved Seung wan away from the young man and said they had already been paid. Beating up Seung wan now would be the right thing to do in terms of trade morality. Seung-gi watched bullies beat up his former childhood friend who deserved it all. Seung wan lands a front kick to the jaw. The bullies counted the number of punches paying off the advance. The blows came from all directions. Xiong Huan sank to the floor and clasped his head with his hands. The young man watched Xiong Huan get kicked in the body. The man screamed in pain and resentment. Xiong Yi thought that's what a beating sounds like from the outside. The young man thought it was duller than he thought. When they beat him, the sounds were louder. The guy decided he was really bored right now. He didn't find anything appealing about it. Seung-gi couldn't understand why the scum did this all the time. The young man took out the key and noticed that it was activated. It was possible to proceed according to the plan. Brahamurk was pleased with the young man's behavior. He had succeeded in causing dissension within the gang so that they would commit the sin of betrayal. The former demon noted that the stepmother's sin had a very different flavor than this one. Seung-gi pointed the key in the direction of the bullies and pressed it. A young man called out to them and told them they were human garbage. The hooligans looked back. They did not like the young man's words. The guy stood to his full height and showed with his whole appearance how much he despised them. Seung-gi said his words must have hurt them. If they turned around, the bullies hadn't expected such audacity. The young man said he wasn't afraid. They will do the same thing, but in hell. The guy was still holding the key, pointed in the direction of the bullies. The next moment, the door leading to hell appeared. The hooligans could not understand what was happening. Infernal tentacles entangled the young men and dragged them to the underworld. One of the bullers had his hand on the door and was trying to stay out of hell, but he couldn't figure out who the young man really was. The guy took his time walking up to him and began to finger the entire hand, preventing the villain from holding on to the door. Sayungi said that nothing can keep this buller on this earth now. The young man recalled how it was a gang of hooligans who bullied him. They took away his food. He remembered being beaten with his feet. The boy remembered hiding behind the door to keep those bullies away. After all these reminiscences, Xiong Yi said that this rascal could go to a place suitable for him. The guy unhooked the last finger and the villain, screaming in terror, fell into hell. There were two young men left in the restroom. Xiong Wan was terrified. The young man looked indifferently at his former childhood friend. The demon noticed that there was one more person left. xiong -gi took his time walking over to the frightened boy. He was squatting on the floor with his head down, crying in fear. xiong -gi asked, isn't the guy curious about what just happened? The young man explained, it may seem unrealistic, but he could open the gates to hell. The young man showed the key and said that he had recently received this key. And with this key, he could open the gates of hell. Xiong Huan asked, he wouldn't touch him, would he? After all, they used to be friends. Xiong Yi looked at his opponent and saw the young youth he used to be friends with. They had once spent a lot of time together and were cronies. Young people used to spend time together on the playground when they were children. They were interested in each other. The children spent all their free time playing the same games. They thought it would go on like this all the time. The children went to school at the same time. They were in the same class, and here they continued to be friends. xiong -gi said he doesn't know what xiong Wan will think of him now, but he still thinks of him as a friend. The young man said he had to end things now with a few punches. He has no regrets about the way things turned out. xiong Wan said he did it because he was afraid of those bullies, and he missed his friend too. 
Seungi said he understands everything and holds no grudge. The young man stood up, turned around, and walking away said, he suggests from now on to try and restore their friendship. Sheng Wan looked at the pocket that held the key that unlocked the gate to hell. The boy remembered what Seungi had told him, that this key could open the gates to hell. It was a key he had recently gotten hold of. Sheng Wan rushed to the young man and grabbed the key, which he had dropped as he was leaving. Sheng Wan shouted at him not to try to pick his soul with his pathos speeches. He doesn't believe him anyway. The young man looked more closely at the key that had just appeared in his hand. It was a completely different key. Seungi said that this key he had just dropped was the key to his room. The young man realized that his former friend could not be reformed. So he took another key out of his pocket. He said he was going to fix it. Seungi noted that his opponent has no desire at all to improve. The young man stood before the demon. He had completed the tasks he had set himself before going to school. The demon noticed that the young man always completed his tricks to the end. It was a clever and amusing con. The young man said the last one wasn't a trick. It was an exam. He really, really wanted to give his former childhood friend a chance. The guy said all those who betrayed him were total lowlifes. Brahamark observed that there are no classes in hell. All are equal and equally, equally suffer equally. The demon noticed that the young man was slowly becoming loose. Brahamark advised the young man to hurry up and make hell noisier. The young man washed his face and looked at himself in the mirror. He still had a black eye. The high demon said that the more he knew the young man, the more new things he would discover about him. When the young man was sending his stepmother to hell, all he could see in him was vengeance. But when he was sending his classmates, the demon noticed an emotion similar to self-hatred. Demon said he doesn't particularly like the ambiguity. Some might take offense to being called a sweet potato, too. The boy noticed that he never fell into sentimentality. He was always thinking about a future plan. It was just that he was feeling a little uncomfortable right now. The young man noticed that it wasn't because he felt sorry for these guys, nor was it because he felt guilty. The boy noticed that all his life he had been unable to cope with these rascals, which today took only half a day to clean up. He was pathetic, and his whole existence was ruined. The boy was about to leave the school. The demon followed him silently. The young man sat in the room, the demon standing there in the distance looking out the window. As someone was walking up the steps into the building, the demon said he was on his way. The demon said the young man's father was coming. He had already entered the house. Brahamark asked, what trick had the young man prepared this time? What methods would he use now? The high demon noticed that the young man, like his peers, had no trusting relationship with his father. But where could they come from if he sat in his room for so long, living his empty life? The demon noticed that the money trick wouldn't work this time. His father was the source of the money. The guy said he wasn't going to use any tricks this time. The guy said he knew better than anyone that the tricks wouldn't work on his father. The demon said he thinks their friendship is slowly strengthening. The guy said his dad has a small insurance company. This company's insurance claim protection ratio is incredibly high. In other words, this man's job to slap on the backs of those who paid out insurance money. The young man's father came into the room and asked who he was talking to now. The father said that at first the young man would lock himself in his room and play some computer games. Has he already reached schizophrenia? The man said the son turned out to be as weak as his mother, and he's very disappointed. The young man pulled a key out of his pocket and it was already glowing. The guy looked at the demon and said, he warned he wasn't going to use any tricks. The young man said that his father was betraying people today as he had always done before. The man called his son an obnoxious little rascal. The father took a swing at his son and shouted how dare he talk to him like that. The guy activated the key, and a distinctive red glow appeared in the room. Lightning flashed. The young man regularly wondered why his father had abandoned his mother. How can this man be so hard on the guy since they share the same blood? This man began to oppress people at work on a daily basis, so betrayal became a habit for him. The young man shamelessly activated the key to the gates of hell. The man looked at the open doors behind which was pitch darkness, and at first he didn't understand anything. The boy's father inquired about the door. Where did they come from? It followed the same pattern. 
The infernal serpent wrapped itself around the man and pulled him into the darkness. The boy wished him a safe journey. The man screamed in terror. The young man said that man belonged in hell, and he got what he deserved. The boy was left sitting alone in the room in front of the dreaded gate. He performed another act of revenge. The great demon watched through his tablet as his hell continued to fill up. Everything was going according to plan. The young man looked at the family photo. Bramark asked if the young man had fulfilled his revenge. What does he plan to do next? The demon wondered if he was going to punish all the traitors in the world. Or are there still those who betrayed him? But who are where? He doesn't know. Bramark asked the young man to initiate him into his plans. The young man stated that he was done with revenge for the moment. The boy picked up the phone. The young man stated that he was now going to surrender to the authorities. He dialed the emergency phone number. A young man at the police station tries to give an explanation about what happened. The guy tells us what happened, hoping to be believed. In the same room was Brahamark who didn't realize what the young man was doing now. Suddenly a messenger from hell appeared in front of Brahamark. This messenger turned to the supreme demon and said that Lord Lucifer summons him, and he must come at once. Brahamark thought that Lucifer had summoned him because he had heard the news that hell was finished. The demon was glad because he was getting bored here. Bramark opened a window to the underworld and headed for Lucifer through it. Lucifer gathered all his subjects around a round table. The demons were in anticipation of Bramark. Everyone noticed that the great demon Bramark had finally appeared on the doorstep. Lucifer, Lord of all hells, announced that all 12 candidates for the position of the 20th Lord of Hell had gathered at the round table. Bramark looked around at those present. All the higher demons that could be compared to him were here. The demon wondered why they were gathered in one place. After all, they had never met in such company before. Lucifer motioned for Bramark to take an empty seat at the table. Bramark turned to the Supreme Commander. He had arrived later than everyone else, so he would like to know the reason they were all gathered here today. Lucifer looked menacingly at his subject and told him to sit down and not to ask too many questions. All in good time. Brahamark decided that Lucifer wasn't in the mood right now and it wasn't worth calling fire on himself. The High Demon of Gargamonga said that they didn't come here of their own free will either. All of them came here because Mr. Lucifer ordered it. Gargamonga added that they are now all lords of the reserve hells and all have equal footing. Brahamark wondered he hadn't heard that name before. Reserve hell. Who could have come up with that? Brahamark asked, what does that mean, backup hell? Lucifer explained that this was the most accurate definition of this reality. A few days ago, he had summoned each of the higher demons and authorized them to create their own hell. Lucifer continued, he didn't actually say then that each of them would be the sole master of hell. Lucifer smiled. Also, he never said he would accept each of these hells as official hells. The higher demoness Liazan interjected, Lucifer means to say that each of the twelve higher demons had their own hell created. The commander-in-chief pointed his finger at the demoness and said that she had hit the mark. He offered to tell an interesting fact. Lucifer stated that none of the demon towers had created hell on their own. They all used humans for that, whom they always looked down on. Lucifer thought the higher demons were dumber than he was, but that turned out not to be the case. Being able to ask a human for help is commonplace. Until now, the best was considered to be a hell created by a man named Dante. The higher demon Sadius asked what Lucifer was ultimately trying to say with this. Lucifer said that, in general, only one hell made by the best man of their choice would become official. The rest would be destroyed. Lucifer added that he was in favor of healthy competition. All the higher demons were wary. Each realized that the fruit of his hard work could be destroyed, and his dreams would not come true. Lucifer said he wanted to see the bloody battles of Hell's creators. I mean, everyone knows how devious Lucifer can be. That's what Lucifer is. Yeom Shungi was at the police station, in the interrogation room. He had filed a missing persons report, but there were still questions for him. The boy realized that in order to confuse the investigation, he went to the police station himself, he reported his father and stepmother missing. In fact, the problem was much bigger than the young man thought it was. 
An investigator entered the interrogation room. The cop had handcuffs in his hand. That didn't bode well. Seungi hadn't counted on it. A police station received a report about the disappearance of a group of students. The parents of these young people were outraged. Where are the police looking? Mothers screaming for the police to find their children. Why is this town in such a mess? In one area of the city alone, six people have gone missing in 24 hours. This city is going to hell. There was only one link that connected all the missing people, and that link was Yeom Shungi. The young man didn't understand why they couldn't take this extremely seriously from the beginning. Why was he able to emerge victorious in this game in just two days? The guy realized that even if he was the only common variable between the missing, there was no way they could catch him. The fact that the young man knew them all was just a coincidence, nothing more. That's what Yeom Seungi thought. After all, there were no witnesses who saw him open the doors to hell. There were no bodies, no tools, no weapons found. There is one thing in common with missing persons, but the law is lenient enough not to put a person behind bars with only that justification. Yeom Seungi knew that if he was in the interrogation room now, it wouldn't be long before he was released from here, for lack of evidence. The investigator reporting to his boss said that no matter how much he searched and pressed the young man, nothing came up. This kid doesn't look like a professional killer. There's no body, no crime weapon, no witnesses. The kid alone couldn't have kept track of all this. Operative Detective Park Sang-sik said we should frame this young man and lock him up, or let him go free. The detective said he decided to talk to this young man once, but only without the microphone, because it wouldn't constitute an interrogation, just a heart-to-heart. -heart. The detective walked into the room where the young man was and said he was sorry to hear that the young man's parents were missing and in doing so, the young man has to go through such an investigation. The detective tried to justify himself and said, they do it because it's their job, and they want to get to the truth. He needs to at least make sure the young man is innocent. The boy said he didn't kill anyone. The detective agreed and added because the young man had sent everyone to hell. The boy was very surprised to hear that. The detective showed the young man a key that looked like the key to the gates of hell that the young man had in his possession. The boy was even more surprised. The detective said that the young man was not the only one who had become a builder of hell. The investigator said the young man might not be so surprised. He'd been watching him for a long time, and he didn't think the guy would confess so immediately. The young man was shocked. This fact jarred him so much that he forgot to keep in character. Was it the keen sense of the detective? Seungi looked at his opponent. Could it be that the detective understood everything from the beginning? Looking at his face, it was hard to tell. The boy thought that after the other policeman had left, someone who had known everything for a long time had come, and he didn't know what to do next. Seungi decided that if that was the case, he should send this detective to hell and erase all traces of him. So the young man had a new plan. The young man realized that he now faced a new task. He must make the detective commit the sin of betrayal. A red glow appeared in the room and the young man thought that Bramerk might appear. That's exactly how it turned out. After the meeting with Lucifer, Bramerk returned to the young man. The investigator turned out to be a complicated man too. Since he had such a key, he must have a demon handler, which made sense. The demon detective's handler also appeared in this room. It was Gargamonga. Gargamonga told Brahamurk that they had met again. Brahamurk said, what a coincidence. It seems their people had already gotten to know each other. Gargamonga remarked that this was a good thing. The demon said it was worth it to get rid of that hostility. After all, they were no longer strangers to each other. Gargamonga pointed at Sayungi and said that this young man had just thought of opening the gates of hell. This is the hostility towards his ward. Brahamurk told the young man to leave the hostility behind, because the game had not yet begun. Seungi asked, what is the demon talking about? Are there really any other creators here besides him? Brahamurk said that besides him and this second demon, there are others who have also commissioned a certain person to create their hell. Brahamurk noticed that the deadly game would soon begin, and that would be the most interesting part of the quest. In the end, 
Lucifer will choose only one hell out of the twelve hells created in recent times. Seungi asked how the system worked. Why are there so many hells? Is there such a great need? Bramerk stated that it was Lucifer's whim. He is in favor of healthy competition. We should try harder, added the demon, to make the young man's hell out of the competition. All projects that lose will be destroyed. Gargamonga told his ward to let the young man go. If the young man is not released, they can find someone else to take his place. The detective said he was going to do it anyway. There is no way for the police to prove the young man's involvement in the crime. The investigator added, if he is also a hell builder, he is essentially the same criminal and with the same methods. Brahamark told the man that he didn't look as green. The demon added that he had said all the right things. Besides, it will be difficult to reach the end in this survival game where you might have to lose your strength early on. Brahamark stated that he is ready to take his ward now because he still has a lot of explaining to do. The detective had to let the suspect go. Objectively, there was no evidence against him. Xiongi walked out of the police station dumbfounded by the information he had received. The young man realized that he was in trouble now. Dragamanga told his ward not to regret it, because the name of his sin is more universal than any other hell. He suggested using this young man as a hunting dog and disposing of him when he became useless. The investigator thought that if he lived to see the end of this experiment, he could realize a just equal society. The young man couldn't calm down. This detective knew he was using the gates of hell. Plus, he turned out to be the same. The young man was very nervous. He could be arrested or sent to hell. The demon told him not to take his anger out on him. Bramerk stated that the young man made his own decision to go to the police station and give the investigator the opportunity to catch his tail. The young man shouted that he didn't know other creators existed. There were so many of them. The higher demon took him by the chin to calm him down and squeezed harder. Bramerk lifted his charge high above him. The boy startled and worried even more. The demon said fiercely for man to know his place. He is the great supreme demon Bramerk, and he can easily rip the soul out of a young man's body and not even blink an eye. The demon put the young man down and said that he was also very angry. This wasn't what he had expected. The demon said it never even occurred to him that Lucifer would give other higher demons the opportunity to create their own hell. Brahamark continued that Lucifer was not satisfied with that, and he had set up a deadly game between the creatures of hell. The demon was furious. His eyes were burning. For the past 500 years, all he had done was to serve the Supreme Commander and he hadn't received any privileges. The young man was frightened when he heard it was a deadly game. So the winner is the one who stays alive until the end? Brahamark, having calmed down a bit, asked the young man if he could make it to the end. The guy, also calming down, asked that he needed to know the rules of the game first. He also wants to know everything that happened while he was under investigation. The demon agreed and said that he would show the young man everything. The boy must trust him. The demon stuck its bony fingers into the young man's eyes. It looked unreal. The young man cried out in pain and covered his eyes with his hands. He hadn't expected this from a demon. Brahamark commented on his action with the words, better to see once than to hear a hundred times. The demon told the young man to look carefully. The boy, overcoming the pain, tried to open his eyes. He saw Lucifer in front of him. Lucifer said that was what he longed to see. The young man saw a round table in a room consecrated by a red light, with Lucifer and his twelve supreme demons sitting at it. Above, the demon ram told Lucifer that it was a very good decision that he wanted to organize a confrontation, Ram asked, telling them about the rules of this contest so that they could prepare themselves adequately for this massacre. Lucifer said it seems appropriate to explain the rules if everyone is here. Lucifer wants people to play the game of sending one, one to hell. Lucifer went on to say that the chosen sins of the rival's demons don't know. Neither do their people. You have to squeeze all the wisdom out of people to send each other to hell. That's the talent the demons have to show. Ram concluded that it would be a game of catch-up, where no one knows who the cat is. A game that would not end until all but one of the participants were eliminated. Lucifer said Ram hit the mark. Those are the rules of the game. 
that makes some hells universal and makes you realize how wise people are for creating them. Ram did not stop and said he had one more question. What are the other rules besides this one? Lucifer replied that you can't use the powers he gave them. People can only be helped with their original powers, so this is the limit of the minimum help they can give. In addition to that, the Supreme Commander added, you can use any, even the most despicable methods, just to send your rival to hell. Yeom Sungi saw it all, and he was amazed. Brahamurk stood in front of the young man. The young man said, now he understood why they called it a death game. There is no such thing as the right to choose. The boy realized that even if he put his hands down, he couldn't get out of the game. Someone would still come and throw him into their hell. Brahmerk said that's right, but it applies to him too, because Lucifer said there would be only one hell left. Only one will survive and the others bound by the treaty will die or disappear. The young man thought that he didn't care at all what would end up happening to this demon. He has no sympathy for the demon. They only have a business relationship, nothing personal. The guy decided that even if he went to someone else's hell, you could look at it as retribution. Xiongi said he had one question for Brahamark. The young man asked, if his hell disappears, what will happen to the people who are there now? What is envisioned in such a case? Brahamark said that all the sinners who are there will disappear with hell because they cannot get out of there. The young man decided that, in this case, he would not give up, because he doesn't want everyone he put there to die for nothing. They must continue to suffer forever. The demon thought that the man in front of him was crazy. He's not willing to cooperate for his own sake. He is willing to cooperate not for himself, but to keep sinners imprisoned forever. The young man asked, isn't that what nature is? Hell, it is a space in which people will suffer forever. Brahmerk said that with a psycho like this young man, the possibility of becoming the lord of a new hell would be more than just a dream for him. The demon said that he, great supreme demon Brahmerk, recognized the young man as his colleague and held out his bony hand to him. The boy shook it. They made an alliance with a handshake. The supreme demon Sadius saw it all and controlled it all. The man Sadius was working with also saw it. The girl with the huge sledgehammer was the ward of this Sadius. She was creating a hell of her own that she wanted to defend. Hell creator Ho Min Jae, 18 years old, said one had already been found. The young man wrote something on a piece of paper and said, if you put all the rules together, it would be like this. And he showed the list to his colleague Brahamark. Brahamark ran a quick glance over the list. The one who threw all the opponents into his hell wins. The demon can help the hell creator in the process, but must not use their powers. The creators may use any means they wish. This process continues until only one person remains. The demon said that the young man wrote everything down accurately. Until the supreme commander out of whim added a new rule, this list is correct. In that case, the young man said he had the first question. How can a demon help? If he can't use a power that can't be used, could it be that he has some other ability? The demon said he could use the power Lucifer had given him. Brahamur continued that this power includes traveling between this world and hell. Hellfire coming from his body. It's very creepy and scary. The demon has the ability to give orders to small demons and other minions. The demon went on to say that aside from that, each of the demons has one unique ability that manifests from their birth. The young man immediately realized that the unique ability was not a simple guessing game, but another variable. The young man wanted to know what unique ability Brahamark had. The demon's eyes lit up and he said that his unique ability was the ability to detect death. The demon said that when he was younger, or more accurately, was something of an animal, his role was to find the deceased and escort them to hell. The guy was interested and asked for more details about this ability, with all the little details. Suddenly the doorbell rang. The guy thought it was a cop again, or maybe some kind of delivery. The young man went to the intercom and saw an unfamiliar face. The guy noticed an unfamiliar girl standing on the other side of the door, looking directly into the camera. The girl lowered her mask in a gesture of confidence and said that she wanted to show the young man her face and one more thing. The girl loosened her tie and began to undo her blouse. 
The young man was dumbfounded. What is she doing? The boy resented. It's some kind of psycho, the young man decided. The young man did what was proper in such a case. He told the girl to get out of here immediately. Otherwise, he would call the police immediately. He's a very good citizen. At that moment, Bramerk appeared nearby. He was very interested in something. The demon said he could smell death. There's something fishy going on here. There's a reason that girl showed up here. Bramerk stated that this girl had come to take the young man's life. We must be wary of her. The young man was frightened and asked why this was happening. What does this girl want from him? After all, they don't even know each other. The boy thought he had spent three months in the corner of his room. There was nothing he could do that a stranger would want to destroy him. The young man decided that in that case, this girl might be the creator of hell, and she was indeed to be feared. The girl pulled out her key to the gates of hell. The sin of this hell was voyeurism. The key was glowing, so the sin was confirmed. A young man was watching this girl through the intercom. We got the kid. All that's left is to bag him and send him to hell. The girl thought that if the young man did not open the door, she had a sledgehammer for such an occasion. The stranger decided that all she had to do was break down that door, go inside, and throw the young man into hell, the girl asked, wondering how Sadius felt about her plan. After all, she had calculated everything correctly. The girl said her demon's observation ability was the best. He'd found a hunting target for her very quickly. The girl, swinging her sledgehammer, said that if the young man didn't open it himself, she would smash the door into splinters. Shungi thought the girl was completely crazy. She had already started kicking the door. The guy guessed the way she was rushing in here meant that the condition for activating the key had already been met. The young man was thinking fast. If this condition was fulfilled by simply showing her breasts through the intercom, then her sin, voyeurism, the boy looked regretfully at his key. It hadn't been activated. The young man stated to his colleague Bramerk, he doesn't know what kind of girl it is, but he looked into the intercom and got caught. Now a crisis situation has been created. The young man said that in this case, there are no conditions for the sin of betrayal. The demon agreed that the seriousness was too small to call it a sin. We need to organize something else. Some kind of provocation would do the trick. The demon said that to activate the key, the other party must reject the young man's offer. Brahamurk explained that it was unnatural that a sudden crisis situation created for a young man would be called treachery. The boy agreed, but said it was too petty to go to hell. The demon noticed that the young man looked absolutely calm, so he had already thought of something. The banging of a sledgehammer on the door could be heard throughout the apartment. The guy thought that the girl had already activated the key and all she had to do was go inside. So he had to make her believe that he could do the same thing as soon as he opened the door. The guy through the door shouted to the girl that she would walk in and go straight to hell. The girl didn't believe it. First he sat in the corner and now he had moved on to bluff. The girl assumed that the young man was deceiving her. The girl stated that she was now trying to open the door and get inside. The stranger boasted that her condition for opening the gates of hell had already been met, and it was only a matter of time. At some point, the girl managed to kick the lock out of the door. She rejoiced and thought she had succeeded in dealing with the door. The girl put down her sledgehammer and decided that all she had to do was walk over the threshold. The stranger approached the door. All she had to do was to see the young man. The girl looked through the hole and saw the young man. He said he was repeating the last time. As soon as she entered, she would go straight to hell. The stranger was puzzled. The young man didn't even try to escape, and not even begging her for mercy. Strange. Why? The boy sat quietly on the floor, opposite the door. He waited for the girl to come in. The young man watched the door from under his forehead. His eyes were glowing. He thought the stranger had been caught, the guy asked the girl probably wondering why he wasn't running away. The young man told the girl that his hell is called invasion hell, so he is waiting for her very much. The girl stood hesitating. The threshold she was about to cross could be the threshold to hell for him. The girl carefully opened the door. She didn't dare to go in yet. The tension was building. The guy thought his lie about a fictional hell, an invasion hell, was the best bluff ever. 
a very easy trick to come up with. Brahamurk said there was no clause about deception among Lucifer's rules. The demon was amazed. This man, despite having death at his doorstep, was able to think of such a trick at the most critical moment. Ho Min Jae, who had a high enough intelligence to be chosen by the demon, couldn't help but realize this. She knew that the probability of it being a bluff was more than 90%. However, there was a possibility that his words would be true, and by opening the door, the girl would satisfy the condition for activating the young man's key. The girl was afraid that when she entered, the invasion hell would be activated, and she would have only one road, the road to hell. The girl realized that if she inserted the key of hell into an open doorway and activated it, it could be counted as an intrusion. And that option was not a good one. The girl considered the option of just walking away, and she wouldn't have to humiliate herself and face this guy anymore. Plus, the young man realized the condition of activating her key. This could become her Achilles' heel in the future. Then it's checkmate. The girl hesitated. Either option seemed risky, too. She didn't know what to do. The guy asked the girl. She's thinking about what to do now, right? If the girl leaves now, she won't get anything, but it won't be much damage. She's afraid to come in, too. The young man said he had an offer that would benefit them both. The guy proposed to the girl to make an alliance. The girl was surprised. She had not even considered such an option. Ho Min Jae said that only one hell creator who survived to the last minute will end up alive in the end. There is no option to win together. The guy said it could only work now. Sooner or later, they'd have to betray each other. The young man said that this alliance could last as long as they got rid of the other 10 men. The young man asked if she was sure she could handle the other 10 creators alone without even knowing their sins. The girl thought it was feasible if she used the same method as today. But the longer it went on, the harder it would be to manage alone. The girl realized that if she retreated and left the young man as her enemy, he could spread the word of her sin to others, and she wouldn't be able to attack suddenly. Although that's her advantage. The girl turned to her demon and asked what she should do in this case. Sadius could only remain silent, so in response, he only spread his hands. The young man dictated his phone number to the girl. If she decided to make an alliance and talk to him, it would not be necessary to invade his space, which was a condition for activating the key. The young man suggested that the girl should leave now because she had raised a ruckus in the apartment building. The police might come here soon. In parting, he suggested that she think hard about his proposal. The girl wrote down the young man's phone number and thought that this guy was not so simple. Ho Min Jae wondered if all hell creators were roughly on the same level. When the girl left, the young man told his demon that he had just almost died. Was this really just the beginning? Brahamurk suspected that there was a demon who had developed the ability to detect the creators of hell, but he didn't think it was the young man who would be his first target. The demon praised the boy for his brilliant cleverness. The young man found a way out in an instant. The boy said that the demon's ability was much more useful than he had thought. The young man decided to further consider how he could utilize the demon's ability more effectively. That night, the girl did text the young man. The girl informed him that she agreed, but if he betrayed her, she would die. The guy decided that with one message, he had earned himself so much profit. The young man thought that if he pushed her to break the alliance, he could activate the hell of betrayal. The young man was pleased with himself. He had an incredible advantage over this girl. That night, the police detective didn't sleep either. He was also at his computer. The demon asked. The young man seemed to be obsessively searching for something. Could it be the other creators of the hells? The demon noticed that the guy was using his position of authority in doing so, and it's not a bad trick. The guy looked up the statistics on missing persons in their country over the last year and realized it's more complicated than he thought. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. A co-worker came up to the detective and asked him why he was working so long. Did he really take overtime? The co-worker said he brought the detective a change of socks and underwear just in case. The colleague said, as if by the way, that the young man he was interviewing had had police officers called to his home. The detective was surprised. 
A colleague said that some crazy schoolgirl had smashed his door with a big sledgehammer. The colleague said that the police were called by neighbors, but the young man assured that everything was fine and he had no claims to anyone. The suspect, unfortunately, managed to escape, but the information about her remains on the surveillance camera. The detective thought it was luck. The girl who suddenly caused havoc at Yeom Seungi's apartment. Now we have to find her. The investigator has decided that this girl is the creator of hell. Yom Seungi will play the role of a hunting dog. The policeman said he needed the video from the cameras the girl was on. The colleague said he would deliver the video to the detective. The detective asked his colleague for one more favor, if it's in his way. The investigator said he'd like to set up a surveillance on Seungi for a week. He still has some unanswered questions about this guy. While the three creatures of hell who revealed their identities are playing a game of wits, the first excluded person has appeared. The old man asks the young man to keep him alive. The grandfather has a very distressed look. The old man says he's not a sinful man at all. He doesn't deserve to be punished like that. The young man leaned over to the old man and said that sometimes existence itself is a sin. The guy mockingly told the old man that he was ruining his oxygen and humiliating himself. He can't turn a blind eye to it. The old man raised his hand and cried out in fear. He did not want to end his life in this way. The little demon said that Ram had been lucky. He does his work with human hands. The young man said it was a wretched demon and the man chose the same. Ram said that the young man must not insult True, the supreme demon. The young man said if Ram didn't want the same thing done to him, he should do the right thing. Ram looked at his man in surprise. He had not expected such insolence. The young man said he was joking. I mean, they're partners, and there's no need to take offense to that. The guy said there were 10 more people left. As soon as he'd sorted them out, he'd be able to carry out his plan. A young man has the idea of creating his own utopia. To do so, he must have no competitors, and no one must get in his way. Yom Seyungi does nothing but sleep and rest. The demon said that until three days ago, the guy was able to cope with the problem and even succeeded by making an alliance. But now he is so idle that it is even surprising and annoying. Brahamurk asked, wasn't the young man going to be that last survivor? Why was he acting like this? The guy says he understands the demon. The one wants him to get out of here now and start dealing with the rest of the creators. In fact, this kind of pastime pisses the boy off too. The demon asked, then why is the young man doing this? The guy said, since it's a deadly game, the closer the second half gets, the less time there will be to rest. He also needs to gather information. If a young man falls prey to an experienced hunter, will he be able to sleep properly afterwards? Sooner or later, someone's patience will run out and that someone will make a mistake. There are always fools who value winning a battle more than winning a war. The guy said he'll start hunting when someone makes a mistake. The girl tried to call the young man. The girl thought that it had been three whole days since the alliance had been made. What is he doing there? The guy replied to the girl that he doesn't do anything. Someone like the girl would want to break in and take out another opponent, and he has the sin of trespassing. The girl said while the young man was hanging out there, something happened. The girl said she will copy the link and send it to the young man's phone. After he looks at it, they can meet. In that case, she thinks they should get their act together. The young man received the link that his interlocutor had promised to send him. The guy followed the link and saw an excerpt from a fresh stream. Gagak's host said that he had recently started an interesting game. Gagaka said it's not an online game, but a real-life game, kind of like a squid game. The young man recounted, participants bide their time, not knowing each other's identities, until someone makes the first move, the guy went on. The ardent streamer, older brother Gagak, is so infuriated by this that words cannot express. If it's a deadly game, shouldn't they be constantly chasing each other, setting traps and yelling? In that case, the young man decided to be the first to reveal himself, and he provokes others to do the same. Gagaka showed the key and asked if the audience wanted it, or maybe they want to target other creators coming after him. Gagaka said he is inviting everyone to his house. He will post the location of the party and his home address in the attached comment at 12 o'clock tonight. 
Brehamerk said that everything had turned out just as the young man had envisioned. Now, it was time to act. The young man noted that now they would be able to learn more about the other creators than they had previously thought. And as a bonus, it would be nice to reduce the number of participants. Brehamerk said that free time was now over and crushed a can of soda. A girl came to a cafe and looks around. Young people nearby are sitting at a table. Yoam Shungi is sitting at a table in the same cafe, sipping a cocktail. He's waiting for someone. The girl, approaching the table, thought that this guy was very shy. He had specifically asked to meet in a crowded cafe so that it wouldn't open its gates. The young man said he left the house on purpose so the girl wouldn't worry that he might activate the sin of trespassing. The girl asked what Siyungi was thinking of doing with that guy in the video. Normal people thought it was just a new concept for the streamer. Siyungi said that judging by the large number of views, the likelihood that multiple creators have watched the video is pretty high. The girl suggested that a couple people would probably show up. The interlocutor asked what the young man was thinking of doing. The guy thought that if he agreed to this meeting too easily, she might think he was overconfident about his sin and start to doubt. He needed to pretend like he had no choice but to go. The young man says he has to go. He knows his sin won't work if he changes locations. Plus, it's a rare opportunity to learn more about other creators, their sins and personalities, at least those who buy into the provocation. The girl suggested waiting for the comment with the address to appear first and check it out. Then they will have more information. The guy looked up and saw another visitor. It was quite an unexpected encounter. A detective approached the table where the young man was sitting, along with his demon. The young man was wary. What was this man doing here? He hadn't told anyone about this meeting. The girl looked around and saw who the young man was watching. The detective walked closely to the table and examined the young men closely. The investigator smiled and said hello to the young men. His mood was high. The detective asked why the young men had gathered in such a place suddenly in the morning and were now arguing. The investigator called the young men by name. They both gave in to panic for a moment. The policeman decided to sit down at this table too and asked the young man for permission to try his cocktail. The young man thought, since when had the detective been following them? He showed up here without even knowing their sins. Syungi tensed up. Maybe this meant that the condition to activate his key had already been met. The detective set the cocktail glass on the table and said it was refreshing. The policeman told the young men not to move. He did not want them to take out their keys. Syungi had his key already in his hand. The detective revealed that he had his key behind his sinus, which was already activated. He said that if the young men moved without authorization, they would be killed immediately. The creator of Gagaka Hell was reading something on his phone. Nothing could distract him. The young man gave his address for the meeting and said that all that remained was to publish and secure it. Beside him was a strange creature with a bag over its head. Apparently, it was his demon. It was the supreme demon Jinky Johnny. He looked at his phone and liked the text of the message. The guy was pleased with himself and began spinning around the room in the wheelchair. Gagaka told his demon that he had already prepared everything so that he could immediately seize the initiative and revealed that he has security cameras everywhere. In addition, Gagaka added, his ability is a scam. The first large-scale event in the death game to Gagaka's attack is complete. The three young people are already discussing a plan of further action. Siungi kept thinking about the key in the detective's hand. The key was shining which meant that the sin condition he had set had been achieved. The young man wondered at what point this condition was reached. After starting the survival game, he was careful not to commit even one minor sin. What's this guy's activation sin? The guy remembered last time at the police station this key didn't respond to him. So this time, the key activated not because of him, but because of the girl, Ho Min Jae. The girl had a look on her face from which nothing could be understood. At that moment, a hypothesis popped into Yeom Syungi's head. The guy turned to the girl and called her by name. The detective told the young man to sit still. The young man, ignoring the investigator, told the girl as they were leaving the cafe. The detective became threatening and said that if the young man moved, he would send him straight to hell. The young man said it was a bluff. 
the investigator blackmailed someone who committed his sin and forced him to come here. The guy wondered if the girl and him hadn't sinned. What if what the detective said was a bluff, and he brought in someone who fell for it? In which case, the puzzle was coming together. Park Sang Six key was in his jacket when he came in here. He didn't see his condition when he came in. In other words, the detective already knew that the key had been activated. That was a good reason for his confidence. A young man approached one customer at the cafe and asked, did he come here because the detective threatened him? The girl jumped up from the table and said, it turns out the key wasn't reacting to them. Sayungi said it's a shame that the detective bluffs ineptly. He should do it more convincingly. The girl screamed that this man's behavior is what fraud is all about. The boy walked up to the detective and said quietly in his ear that he had done everything that was asked of him. There was no need for him to be here anymore. The detective replied that Yeom Seungi turned out to be quite a bright young man. The policeman added that he did not give the young man a chance to prove himself at the station. Seungi thought that since the scam didn't work, the policeman decided to play irrationally. The detective put his hands on the young men's shoulders and said it was a test because he couldn't form an alliance with stupid people. The young man said the detective threatened their lives first, and now if it didn't work, he was bluffing. That's a little over the top. The detective motioned for the young men to sit down again because he had a proposition for them. The girl asks Seyungi, is he really going to listen to this rogue? They are busy right now, aren't they? They have to leave now. The girl didn't understand why Yeom Seyungi decided to sit down and listen to this guy. Although it was actually simple, after all, this guy was a real detective. A detective can infer creators from case data. Xiongi knew that beyond that, the detective had the ability to detain or prosecute by forcibly using public power. Creator relies on one single hell ability card. The detective has the option of relying on two cards at once, utilizing his powers of service. The young man decided that if such a man offered an alliance, it was at least worth listening to. With the raid ahead, more people would be an absolute advantage. Seungi told the detective if he told them about his sin, they would accept his offer of an alliance. The detective didn't want to reveal his cards right away. His sin, he said, was a little complicated. The girl said that the detective was clearly not himself. How can people who don't know each other's sins become allies? That's reckless bravery. The policeman said that in return, he was willing to share good information that he had gotten using his official position. The detective said the number of people they sent to hell was very small, no more than 10. The detectives already sent 117 people to hell, and they are all confirmed and recorded in his notebook as proof of his work. The detective has all the data on exactly what circumstances trigger the key, or under what circumstances it doesn't work how far away the key can be used. He also has information about how many people can be sent at the same time. He learned all this in practice. The investigator concluded that the more subjects, the more data obtained. The young people themselves should realize this. The detective said he's willing to share absolutely all of that data. In return, in today's raid, he wants them to side with him. The young men made an arrangement with the detective. Xiongi got the detective's notebook with all the information he needed. After Xiongi left, the demon detective appeared and said that he was off to the side quietly watching. Was it too much of a story to make an alliance with these two? The demon noticed that the detective had done a lot of work to gather all this data. Wasn't that too frivolous an act he was doing now? The detective told Gargamonga not to worry. The notebook that the young men took had important numerical data slightly altered. If Seungi and that girl at the critical moment want to oppose the detective, they may be in for a fiasco. The detective would then be able to open his mouth and swallow them without any resistance. Young people were killing time in the playground in the evening. The young man glanced at the time periodically, calculating how much time was left before Gagaka would post his address. Better pump up the teamwork before that. The guy decided to ask Ho Min Jae one question. The girl promised to answer. Can the girl use her tracking ability now? If they succeeded, they could be the first to find out Gagaki's whereabouts. Then they could camp nearby before the others who would join the raid later.
The girl said that the guy didn't know the mechanism of her ability at all. Ho Min Jae took a twig and scribbled in the sand. The girl's ability is the division of vision with the closest pursued target. Simply put, among all the creatures of hell, she can only determine the position of the one closest to her. The guy immediately thought that the girl had tracked him down because he was closest to her, and now she couldn't use the ability as it would be useless while he was around. The time to reboot her system is once every 12 hours. Shungi immediately realized the girl knows he didn't leave the house. Guy thought there was a high probability that Ho Min Jae used her ability once every 12 hours, moving from place to place. There's also the possibility that the girl didn't have direct contact with anyone else. The young man decided that after the situation with him, Ho Min Jae had become much more cautious. Seungi asked the girl how many more people she had managed to track down. After all, she had never told him. Ho Min Jae thought that this young man was too guessing. She didn't want to tell him about it so that she would retain the advantage of information. The girl recalled the situation when the guy told her they were leaving the cafe to save her from the investigator. Ho Min Jae realized at that moment that the young man had taken care of her. There was nothing she could do on her own. I guess I should return the favor. The girl, after a little thought, decided to confess to the young man. Ho Min Jae replied that she managed to see two more people. One was checking in upon arrival at the airport. The other person was in the boardroom of a large company. Based on this information, Ho Min Jae concluded that one of them was a foreigner. The other one is from the management of a large company. The girl noted that none of them looked in the mirror, so unfortunately she didn't get a good look at their faces. The girl noticed that she purposely did not tell the young man this information earlier. She had no sufficient reason to trust the young man, but there was no intention of destroying the union. Seungi said to gain more trust from the girl he will tell her about himself. Seungi said that the ability of his partner, Bahamurk, to smell death. The demon lets the young man know when he's wearing a dead flag. This is a useful ability that can even predict the future if used correctly. The girl agreed that it was pretty good. This ability expands the possibilities of improvisation. Singi said that they had now sorted out the current issues to some extent, and the raid on Gagaku was about three hours away. The guy suggested we split up now and take a break, to meet already near the address, when he will publish it. The girl agreed. The young man offered the girl to take a picture of the detective's notebook and send it to her on Messenger to familiarize herself before the raid. The girl thanked him. The young man said goodbye to the girl and said, she doesn't want to give an easy death to those trapped in her hell either. Ho Min Jae remembered who she had locked in her hell. The girl asked why the guy was turning the camera on, and he, smiling, said it was just for collection, nothing more. Ho Min Jae is shy, she says she doesn't like it. The young man is begging her a lot. The next day at school, the young men are laughing at her. They say it was very interesting for them to watch. A girl sees dirty writing on her locker at school. Ho Min Jae is very upset and depressed. A girl takes revenge on a young man for doing this to her. The guy begs for mercy, cries and says he is sorry. The girl is adamant. Ho Min Jae says it's too late to apologize. The video has already spread all over the internet. The girl says their relationship broke up from the young man. Ho Min Jae agreed with Seungi. She can't let that guy die easily. He has to rot in her alone forever. Ho Min Jae said goodbye to the young man, making contact with him with her fists. The girl advised the young man to have a good rest to eat and gain strength. They parted for a while. The boy came to his house. Brahamark appeared from the floor. He asked if he could stop hiding in the floor already. Every muscle and bone in his body began to ache. The young man told the demon to stop crying and get up. The boy explained that the other creatures could see demons. If he kept following the boy, they might see him and realize he was one of them too. Seungi said that the demon must be tolerated for their own safety. Therefore, the demon can only appear in a house where it is safe. Bramerk said that the young man is always cautious. But doesn't he trust Sadius's partner too much? He even told her about the demon's ability. Seungi said it didn't matter. After all, he lied about the most important thing, his sin. He needs the girl for the next raid, to make this battle more honest. 
Singa's calculation was correct, because another alliance was formed just before the raid. The Supreme Demon Rom, the Supreme Demon S. Vampire, and the Supreme Demon Gordon Kilius. In another union, the form was different from that of the Yeom Seungi Union, in which the members were on equal footing. Yu Neong Han is the creator of Hell. There was a strict hierarchy in Yu Neong Han's alliance, two on a leash like dogs, one holding them. Yu Neong Han noted that Gagaka had finally written his address. It was time for them to move out as well. Yu Neong Han asked if the young man had a driver's license. The guy tossed him the car key and said he would go to Satamoon Gu. The girl Yu Yun Han said she'll go first. She'll do some kind of warm-up. The girl got angry. Why did she have to be the bait? Yu Yun Han explained because her life is in his hands now. Doesn't she realize that? The guy reminded the young men that they were now his pawns. If they want to live just one more day, they should do as Yu Neong Han says. Jong Jong Chul asked if the young man would really let them go when they were done with the case. Yu Neong Han said he'll let them go when they get wise. It's too early to talk about it now. The young man looked at the information in his tablet that the current number of participants, seven people, Siungi, Ho Min Jai, and the investigator met at the agreed-upon place, at the agreed-upon time. The attack on Gagaku has begun. Gagaka sat in front of his computers and looked at the security cameras. He decided that the show was starting. When they met, the detective asked if the young men had read the notes he had given them. Siungi said they looked at everything carefully and will take it into consideration for future collaborations. The young man learned that up to five people can be sent to hell at a time. A larger number at one time would not be possible. There is a delay of one minute after opening the gate. During this time, it is impossible to open them a second time. The maximum range to which the hell mouth can suck sinners in is 10 meters. Yom Seungi said he forgot something else. Even if a person commits a sin, but the owner of the key does not recognize him as a sinner, he will not go to hell. In other words, the door is properly activated only if two conditions are met. The victim has committed a sin and the owner of the key recognizes him as a sinner. The detective said the young men had memorized everything well. Now we can move on to their targets. The investigator remarked that we first need to visually confirm the identity of the creators of the Inferno. The detective went on to say to ask for and notice clues to see what sins others have. The most important thing is to survive, and don't get hung up on reducing the number of Hellmakers. The girl said that they had gathered, precisely to reduce the number of Hellmakers. The detective said it wasn't in the rules that there would be a reward for going to Hell, so there was no point in taking any unnecessary risks. The policeman remarked, if someone put something on the line, they would just take it and eat it. Let others take the risk, and they'll take advantage of it. The detective handed out walkie-talkies. He said they were gifts for the kids. He asked the young men to let him know if there was anything unusual or if they met anyone who seemed to be the creator of hell. Gagaki's apartment was under surveillance from a parked car. The guy asked, do they really have to go into that building first? They have to get in there first. There's no telling where the attack might come from. The young man suggested waiting for others to come and target the streamer first. The girl agreed to that suggestion. There was no reason for her to go in there first. Yu Nung Han said that they need to get rid of as many creators here as possible. Yu Neung Han remarked that he had already sent one such person to hell. The young man said that he had seen what was happening in hell through the clipboard. Yu Neung Han noticed that sending the creator to hell gave an extra ability, but he only found out about it after that old man was already there. The young people thought if it was true, it would be very useful to gather additional skills quickly in the beginning. The girl thought the more all sorts of means the better for the future game. She hoped to survive after all. The guy was also hoping to gain some extra ability and escape from Yu Neong Han. The boy was also willing to be an equal ally and could hope for a better future. Right now it all seems like a bogus carrot that makes submission easier. Yu Neong Han decided that he was dealing with two fools. If there was such a reward, they would definitely be told about it by the demons. Yu Neong Han's idea was simple. There was no particular benefit to getting rid of this couple with his own hands. After all, there was no bonus for defeating one. 
Besides, among the others, he was the first to send the other creator to his hell. Yu Nung Han remembered Ram telling him that there didn't seem to be any additional rules of this kind. The young man concluded that there was no need to kill other creators with his own hands, and it was even possible to rethink his strategy. Yu Nyung Han decided that he would leave it to someone else to deal with these two. In that case, Yu Nyung Han would be able to get information about the other person's hell while remaining in the shadows. Later, based on this information, he will find that person's weakness and make them his next slave and hunting dog. In the new strategy, Yu Nyung Han decided that he would continue this process until he and the last slave were left. Yu Nyung Han believed that when he killed the last slave, he would be the ultimate victor. The young man liked his new strategy and decided he needed to save face for now, until those two were sent away. The young man reached into his pocket and said it would make them more useful allies. The young man gave the CCTV camera and told them to take it with them. Gagaka continued to sit by his monitor and watch the traffic around his house. The young man was completely absorbed in his observation. The camera showed no movement. At some point, Gagaka turned around and saw a girl standing in front of him. She asked if he thought someone would come to him and ring the doorbell. The girl explained that she had moved here from another apartment with the help of a fire rope. The girl pulled out her key. It was glowing. A demoness appeared and said that the key was activated and the person could finish with it. The girl thought if she could get an extra ability with this, could free herself from Yu Nyung Han. The girl lifted her key and said for the vanity hell to open. The girl announced that Gagaka had been intoxicated by his powers and had himself told his address to others. Now he would have to accept his sentence. Vanity Hell opened up and from there came bones that grabbed Gagaka. Gagaka screamed and gasped. He resisted as best he could. At some point, the girl noticed that her key was no longer active. She was surprised. It had been the other way around until now. Gagaka said the girl had the wrong object. At some point, the demon removed the sack from his head, and the girl saw that Gagaka was hiding under the sack. Gagaka pointed the key at the girl and said that the invasion hell was activated. The key glowed as it did so. Suddenly, the girl found herself with a noose around her neck. Now she had only one road, the road to hell. The gates to hell swung open, and the rope pulled the girl into the abyss. The girl thought she hated vanity. She used to go to sports training, and she loved it. Coach was praising her and said she had done a good job. The girl watched the tape of her training and was pleased too. The girl didn't like the fact that she was still an intern. How much longer could this go on? Once a young man showed up at a sports club, girls surrounded him from all sides. The man announced that Yuli would make her debut this time. That was the decision. The girl was outraged. She thought it was unfair. She questioned why Julie was making her debut first. They were interns together. The man said it was a decision from above. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not his call. The man asked, why do we have to have a showdown? Can't you just congratulate Yuli and wish her good luck? The girl was sad and cried for a long time. She felt that she had been treated unfairly. Julie came up to the girl and said she was good at the audition. But if she's been interning for seven years, maybe she doesn't have the talent. Julie advised the girl to do something else, especially since she was already many years old. After all, no one would even call her an idol at that age. No matter how hard a girl tried, those with luck, talent, or connections made their debut. The girl believed that success could be achieved by having a close and intimate relationship with the leadership. Those who succeeded thus believed that it was their own ability. They were arrogant towards others. At some point, a demoness appeared in front of the girl. She told her the same story other demons told their people and offered her the key and the ability to send hateful people to hell. The girl was happy about this opportunity and decided that she could take revenge on everyone. However, the girl noticed that the key didn't work on Yu Neong Han. She was very surprised. Why didn't the key react in any way? The guy said he doesn't treat the girl vainly. That's why the key doesn't respond. The girl was surprised. The young man was the president of a huge corporation. That's the elite. He can't help but be vain. The guy laughed out loud in response. The girl, it turned out, was a bad judge of character. 
The guy stated that this sentiment is only for those stupid people who don't know how to self-identify who they are and what they are capable of. The young man stated that he has only reasonable certainty. Therefore, he is not vain. The girl believed that she could survive even after falling into submission to this guy. Now the girl realized it was vanity, and she was on her way to hell. The creator of Vanity Hell, An Eun Hyo, went to hell. In the end, it turned out that this girl was eliminated from the list of hell creators. The demoness regretfully realized that now she too had to disappear. Gagaka said, he thought it was just a theory, but it really caught on, and that's encouraging. The demon Gagaki had thought that his ability among other demons was nothing more than mere entertainment. Now it was coming in handy. The demon praised Gagaku and said that his head had thought of such a trick. Gagaka decided that he was going to keep it up in the same vein of sending everyone to hell. Shungi was watching Gagaki's apartment from the street when he saw a flash of light in the window. He realized what it meant. He asked on the radio if everyone had seen it. Ho Min Jae said she saw that flash and it was most likely the doors of hell. The girl added that at least one person could be crossed off the list. Yoam Shungi began to ponder. According to the detective's notes, there is a waiting time for the gate to reopen. That is, if someone in the building opens the gate within the next minute, they can't use it again. The guy wondered if he could go in, do a reconnaissance in one minute and get out safely. The young man realized that this could be very dangerous, and he had to think it over carefully. The detective noticed that the likelihood of the guy coming out of there in a minute and getting some valuable information was zero. The detective said to always report new information to him. Like this time, when the guy saw a flash of light and heard a woman screaming inside the building. Shungi said he would behave the same way in the next situation. The young man thought the detective would try to break into Gagaki's house. After he got the message. Whoever survived the opening of the gate won't be able to send the detective to hell easily. If one police officer is missing, other police officers will come and arrest the suspect. The young man didn't understand what he and Ho Min Jae should do in such a case. The detective said that they shouldn't let other creators come inside. The investigator went to an apartment in Gagak and said he would handle it there. The boy looked at the departing detective and thought that he could make quick decisions in difficult situations. He'd thought him less capable before. The young man had previously thought that the operation would be more passive. They had to wait for someone to enter the battle before them and give them a chance to intervene. The young man definitely wanted to send the fastest to hell before it was done to him. Yu Neong Han noted minus one chess piece. However, if he found out what Gagaki's sin was, it didn't matter anymore. The guy decides it's time for him to make his move. He's got everything he needs to make his move. Gagaka and her demon watched through the CCTV cameras as some stranger came up to their floor. It wasn't a resident of the building. They assumed it might be a new victim. Gagaka sat the demon down in his place and said the door was open, so he would go in now. Gagaka hid in the closet and told the demon to play along, and didn't stutter. There was a knock on the door and a shout from the other side that it was the police. There was a complaint against the tenants. Gagaka, sitting in the closet, thought it was a complaint because of the loud screams and bright lights. The guy got frustrated and decided it was annoying. It wasn't what he had in mind. Gagaka pondered if he sent this policeman who had come for complaints as well to hell, it might not end well. Other cops could come and send him to jail. Gagaka pondered further. If he opened the door to the policeman, he could stall until more of Hell's creators gathered. The guy decided he had to open the door. He went to the intercom and asked what the neighbors had reported. The policeman showed his ID and said it was nothing special. It was just a report from a neighboring house that a woman's screams had been heard. The investigator said that he would like to talk a little. Siungi remembered the interrogator telling him not to let others in. The young man had no idea how he could accomplish this. If they do manage to get there before Gagaka is caught, he will have to stop them at all costs. The young man tried to contact the girl on the radio and asked where she was at the moment. Ho Min Jae said she's on the roof of the opposite house right now. She saw a policeman enter. The young man said that the investigator should take Gagaku away. Until then, they should keep a close eye on the entrance and prevent other creatures from entering. 
The girl asked in that case what should she do next. The guy asked, she didn't use the tracking ability today, did she? The girl said that she had been with Xiongi all day so there was no need to use it. The young man said that she could now use this ability. Ho Min Jae objected because in that case she would see the same thing as the young man on the other side. What's the point? The guy said he had a hypothesis and he wanted to test it. What if the girl is not looking for the person closest to her, but the creator of hell? The girl clarified, does the guy really think the target will change if a creator shows up nearby? Ho Min Jae didn't think that the ability could be used in such a way, so I decided to give it a try. Originally, there was no such thing as creators gathering in one place. Besides, the target could change within a few minutes. The young man told the girl over the radio that if his hypothesis was correct, she would be the first to catch the creator approaching him. There is a high probability that the enemy will approach in hiding, and with this ability, they would be able to identify him among the people in the building. Gagaki's house, disguised as delivery men or tenants, is not difficult to sneak into. It's also not hard to sneak a key to activate the gates of hell. The girl noticed that the pattern Yeom Shungi had deduced was true, and now you can make it so that only he can recognize his opponents, and they him no. The young man will then be able to control all the creatures. If they do not obey, he will open the gates of hell. The girl said that Sadius should take up the cause. Ho Min Jae said she thought the closest person to her was Yeom Seungi, so his hypothesis is correct. The girl noticed that the target had just changed. She looked warily in that direction. Ho Min Jae told the young man that the person who approaches the building is the creator. One has to be careful. The boy saw two young men walking across the street. The young man asked as the girl checked the other one too. Is he the creator? Ho Min Jae stated that the target keeps changing. They're probably both creators. So, they also have a deal. Xiongi got upset. Two people at the same time, that's dangerous. It goes against their plans. The young man doubted whether he could bear the sins of two strangers at once. If he was lucky, he might be able to take at least one of them but then the other would catch him. This key works both ways. The young man tried to calm down. After all, the enemy still doesn't know that he is also a creator. Opponents thought, who could this young man be? Maybe he's an ordinary resident. If he's a creator, he'll go up to Gagaki's floor. If it's a simple man, you don't want to mess with him and complicate an already complicated life. The guy wondered if he should run away by pretending to be a mere tenant. The policeman would be with Gagaka, and he would be with Ho Min Jae. Only an alliance of two can endure to the end. The young man decided that he had already started running away from criminals, so he created hell to punish them. But even after that, he sometimes wants to escape again. Xiongi and the two strangers crossed paths near the entrance to the house. The young man pretended not to pay attention to them. The guy thought, he can't do this, he can't run away. Seungi said that these people should not go in. He raised that he must detain them at all costs. The young man was aware. All he needed to do now was not give his opponent time to think. They have to make their next move without having time to think. The guy decided that he needed to say something without stopping, so that the opponent couldn't have a chance to think about his next move. Yun Young Han thought, maybe this young man is also the creator of hell. Could he be Gagaki's ally? The boy dismissed such thoughts. This can't be it. Gagaki hell. This is an invasion hell. There's no reason to put your ally at the entrance to prevent them from entering. Yu Neong Han thought that maybe this was another group of creators? That version also seemed illogical to him. After they had dealt with Gagaka, wouldn't it be logical for him to stalk them and stab them in the back? The boy decided, and that his assumption that this young man was the creator of hell was not true. If he was the creator of hell, Yu Neong Han continued to reason. He wouldn't be stopping them now. Seungi said that a call had come in and the house was under police control. A woman was heard screaming from the seventh floor of the building. Yu Neong Han didn't think the neighbors would be able to report it and the police would arrive so quickly. Now the whole picture was beginning to emerge. The girl screamed in agony, caused a commotion. Neighbors called the police. A dispatch detective controls the area. Everything is as it should be. However, there were some things that didn't fit together. Shungi was worried about that. 
Would these guys believe that he was a detective? The young man was too skinny for a policeman. Cold sweat dripped from his gaunt and tortured face. All of this might have looked suspicious. The guy realized that these young men might ask him for identification or a search warrant. Shungi thought, before the doubts gained momentum, we need to increase the chance of the truth. Before Yu Nang Han could ask the young man a question, he radioed to Detective Park. Seungi radioed that controlling the passage had become a challenge. Young said residents living in the building are trying to get inside. Detective Park thought it was a dangerous situation because Seungi had contacted him first. The detective thought it was better to leave now. Puck said he was wrapping up the inspection and leaving. The incident turned out to be nothing. The resident was just watching a horror movie at high volume. The detective, having finished talking, said he was on his way downstairs. Seungi realized that when you were stumped, the best solution was to quickly change the subject and thus discourage your opponent. The young man knew he had to act quickly before his opponent had time to regain her senses. The young man said that his colleague would be along shortly. If they are interested in the details of the incident, they can find out everything from him so they can wait a little longer. After a while, Detective Pak showed up and said it was a futile call. The detective apologized and said he apologized for keeping people waiting. And now people can come in. Yu Neong Han thought that having the detective show up was not part of his plans. But the fact that he had learned from Gagaki was definitely worth it. He decided to proceed more carefully. Yu Neong Han thanked the detective for his work and said that the neighborhood has been a bit noisy lately. When the young men separated, Xiongi exhaled. The detective asked how the young man knew that these two were the creators of hell. The guy replied that with the help of the devil, Min Che. These two, both of them, are the creators of hell. Xiongi asked what was wrong with Gagaka. The detective said he had too little time. The mission failed. But on the plus side, they were able to reduce the risks. This team was able to identify three more hell makers today. The detective listed everyone they knew, and who was the creator of hell. At this point, it could be considered a success. The young man agreed that so much information in one day was certainly a good thing. Seven out of twelve. Seungi decided that the deadly game of the creators of hell was beginning. The girl suggested that everyone go out to dinner. That's how the first sortie ended. After that, the Yeom Seyong Alliance chose information as their main tactic in this game. The young people decided to have dinner together. The demons were nearby, watching them silently. Meanwhile, Yu Neong Han called Gagaki's apartment and told the blogger to meet the guests. The guy says he has a proposition. He offers Gagaka to be his faithful doggy. Gagaka thought the visitor was out of his mind. How could anyone barge into a house with such an offer? Yu Neong Han said that the girl Gagaka had sent to hell a little earlier worked for him. So he learned that unless he went into the apartment, the sin of invasion wouldn't work. The guest asked that Gagaka had not expected this development. How will he get out of this situation now? In this situation, Yu Neong Han can put people who will guard him 24 hours a day. Gagaka will be under constant surveillance. The moment he goes outside, it will be known. This information would be immediately dropped to Yu Neong Han, and he would personally rush over to take him to hell. The guy continued, Suppose Gagaka decides not to go out. How would he be able to get by with only the necessities he had left at home? Even if he orders delivery or is patient, he can keep this up for a month or two. Yu Neong Han said, It's like Gagaka is in prison now. Gagaka sent his guest out and showed him the finger. He said there was no way he was going to make it. Gagaka decided not to give up so easily. Yu Neong Han noticed, sooner or later the young man would break down and come out anyway, and it would look like a gesture of surrender. In other words, Gagaka decided to stage a sit-in at his home. The guy concluded that instead of his hell, Gagaka could enjoy hell by staying alive. Gagaka said they wouldn't starve, and if there were any suspicious faces, they would call the police. They decided not to give up, no matter how long the siege became. Even if time isn't on their side, they'll probably figure something out. Gagaka decided that this was going to be quite difficult, and it could go on for a long time. But you can't rule out the possibility that during that time, this guy could be sent to hell by someone. 
Gagaka decided that they should wait. If they were patient, they would win. Gagaki's hell started already in the first week. All the food ordered was mixed in with the waste. We had to practically starve. After the number of calls to the police exceeded three, their calls began to be responded to as pranks. The police responded that if they constantly felt that someone was following them, it was better to go to the hospital. In the next phase, Gagaki's power went out and the plumbing began to clog. There was a constant anxiety that the enemy might strike at any moment. Gagaksa really wanted to get out of this apartment. The freedom outside the apartment was very tempting. After all that, a business card showed up. It said, if you ever think of surrendering, call me. After that, Gagaka conceded defeat. Yu Nyung Han was at work in his office when a visitor came to see him. Yu Nyung Han told the assistant to let the visitor in. Gagaka came in. The guy said Gagaka lasted a lot longer than he thought he would. Somewhere in a factory, a man is asking to be spared. He's done nothing wrong. This man is asking for humanity, and he's asking to find someone else. He swears he won't say anything to anyone. The masked man said he had already given him a choice, and he swung a huge knife. The masked man spoke of the choices he provides. A man can go to hell or die at his hand. We must choose quickly. The masked man pulled out the key to the gates of hell. The man yells that he's not agreeing to any of these options. He just wants to go home. He watched people squirm in agony as the masked man opened that scary door. The key glowed, meaning it had been activated. The man yelled that he didn't want to choose, and he didn't deserve it. The masked man said if he didn't want to choose for himself, that choice would be made for him. The creator pressed the key and told him to go to hell. The gates of hell opened and the man's infernal essence began to pull him inside. He screamed and wriggled. The masked man walked over to his demon and laid his head on its chest. Why was the one only showing up now? He didn't even know this thing was that cool. The archdevil Black Knight said he liked this man's action. But if he doesn't start looking for other creators, they will come to destroy him. The masked man said he knew everything. He was just about to start searching, but he had to finish his business first. The masked creator said that the season for hunting humans is ending, and the hunt for the creators of hell begins. It had been ten days since the death game had begun. Lucifer watched it with interest. It had been five days since the attack on Gagaka. Gagaka was still feeling well. Yeom Seungi began to prepare his body for the long battle. He did grueling workouts and he increased his physical activity. In order to tone himself up, he started running. The young man switched to a healthy diet to improve his condition. Yom Seungi gathered information on the two men he met that day. The detective helped him do that. The detective said this envelope contained information on those two people that he was able to get. The first of those men was one of the directors of a large company. In fact, little was known about him. He had taken over the board of directors of the firm at the age of 31, a man born into a humble family and a man who had made it on his own. That's all that was known about him. Seungi decided that this was clearly an unusual guy. The young man realized that this man could quickly assess the situation. He was cold-blooded, able to read a person like a book with a single glance. Seungi would like to get rid of this guy quickly, before the deadly game goes into phase two but probably the other creators are also targeting him. The young man decided that things were taking a dangerous turn. We must be more prudent. The detective said this guy has status, money, and connections. A guy like this, he's gonna cause trouble for everybody. The detective said there's another guy next on the list. He's got some information on him too. This guy's an architect, Jong Jong Chul. He likes to play with a miniature model of the city. He's a bachelor. Xiongi assumed that that director had intimidated that architect and was now using him for his own selfish purposes. This is usually the method such guys use to make alliances. The investigator asked why the young man felt that way. The boy said that at the last meeting, the architect had not said a word, as if he had no will. Even if he wanted to say something, he hesitated and kept peeking to see how the other would behave. It wasn't like an equal union. Puck said that the analysis the young man just gave might help them break that alliance later. Xiongi said he would share the data with the girl, took the envelopes, and thanked the detective for his work. 
The detective assumed that the young man had changed since the last time they had met. When they had first met, Xiongi had been pale and skinned. The young man said his head has cleared up since then, and he sees the world in a different way. The young man continued. He was worrying too much about what was the point of him moving on with his life after his revenge. Xiongi added that now all his anxieties were gone, and now he is feeling satisfactory. The demon spent a lot of time wasting time. He said that the young man did nothing but do nothing. Brahamark asked, when is a man going to send people to hell? As long as he doesn't do it, someone else will do it. The young man said that there is such a human aphorism to win a hundred victories in a hundred battles. This is not the pinnacle of martial art. To defeat the enemy without a battle, that is the pinnacle. Xiongi explained that they are now engaged in a great information war. In this war, the one who is ahead in knowledge resources takes the initiative. You can't lose in this game, the young man added, or you'll have to rot in a foreign hell until the end of time. It is extremely illogical to seek adventure at such great risk. Most likely, the other creators are hiding and gathering information right now, just like him. Guy told Bahamark to think of it as the calm before the storm. He waited a little longer. Bahamark asked what the girl from his alliance was doing. The young man said that the girl is still on the hunt. She can only use her ability twice a day. Ho Min Jae called the young man. The guy got excited and answered her. The girl said she had finally found him. The young man became extremely serious. Xiongi wondered where the girl had found another maker. Ho Min Jae gave the address where she had located the target. Xiongi said he would inform the detective about it and asked the girl to keep an eye on him. The girl said she would try to eliminate him right now. Xiongi said he shouldn't because it was very risky. He told the girl to be quiet for now. Ho Min Jae said this is the city center, not a residential area. So that person is far away from her hiding place. Besides, she's blending in with the crowd now. Since that person doesn't know she's the creator of hell, she has a chance to get the upper hand. The young man thought the girl was talking business, but the risk was still too great. For now, there was no way they could lose such a convenient way to track the other creators in the form of Ho Min Jae. The girl said the young man is a good thinker, but he's too cowardly, and her blood runs cold with every useless day of the deadly game. The girl said she'd better get rid of any enemies she might catch as soon as possible. Ho Min Jae followed her target. The target turned down a narrow alley. The girl decided that this was perfect. The girl began to unbutton her blouse. He trapped himself. After all, if she showed it in public, the sin of voyeurism wouldn't work. Ho Min Jae took out the gate key and said that they would play now. At some point, the man turned around and said to the girl, Hello, baby. It was the creator of hell, Zhou and Han. The girl was scared. It turned out he knew she was following him. That ruined her plans. Ho Min Jae was startled. Why doesn't her key light up? The girl looked at her key in panic and couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. The hellmaker shouted, Let's play and lunged at the girl. Ho Min Jae came to her senses in the old factory. She didn't understand how she ended up here. The girl looked around and saw old abandoned crates all around. The surroundings were unfamiliar. The girl had a very bad headache. She tried to remember something. Some events flashed through her mind. She followed some stranger. Then this stranger attacked her. Then he put her to sleep. The girl thought he had put her to sleep with some substance he had impregnated the handkerchief with. Then he brought her here. There wasn't even anyone to blame. Shungi tried to warn her. And now that she's disappeared, he'll probably start looking for her. The girl closed her eyes. Panic wouldn't help her in any way. She had to pull herself together and try to find a way out of this situation. Ho Min Jae checked her pockets. Hell key, cell phone, wallet. He took everything. She can't call for help. Without the key, she is completely defenseless. The girl thought it was a tough case. The walls in this room appeared to be concrete. Iron door that only unlocks from the outside. There's no way to escape. The girl thought that the only remedy available to her was Sadius. She called out to him. Sadius came. The prisoner said she was frivolous and realizes that because of her, the demon is in danger of being destroyed. The girl said that in this situation, you have to think rationally. Sadius cried. The girl told him to stop because they were still alive. 
Ho Min Jae said that the detective and Seungi will come to rescue her. They definitely won't leave her in the lurch. At least she wanted to believe they wouldn't abandon her, even though their alliance was shaky. But they were already working together. It was irrational to throw away a teammate they'd already worked with. The girl realized that she was an important member of the team. She was the eyes of the alliance. Her ability could not be replaced so easily. The detective and Xiongi won't just leave her to her fate. The girl heard some sound outside the door. She picked up a brick in her hands. She should be able to hold out for now. After several unsuccessful attempts to contact the girl, Xiongi reported the incident to the detective. The young man told the investigator that during the last call, the girl said that she had found the creator of hell and decided to personally eliminate him herself. Then she disappeared. There's a chance the girl's already gone to hell. Although, it's possible that she was kidnapped to be used as a potentially useful person. The detective wrote down all the pertinent information and said he took note. He said he'd better find her soon. It would be a problem if she blabbed their identities. Her tracking ability, a major trump card in this game. The loss of a girlfriend could be fatal to this union. Without the ability to apply information in real time, all their initiative will be meaningless. Bram Merck rejoiced at last the young man stirred. Is he sure he can win? The boy said the demon could hide. They were going for a walk. The young man said that he had come up with a theory on how to properly utilize the demon's abilities. The only question is whether Ho Min Jae will be able to hold out while he waits for help. The man held the girl by the neck, raising her high above his head. He said she was a mischievous girl. She could have just laid there quietly. Why would she need a brick? The man said he would now know that a handkerchief soaked in machine oil has a fairly modest effective time. Ho Min Jae called the man a madman and a psycho. The girl's head was smashed and she was bleeding. The masked man said that such compliments about a psycho only fuel killers like him. This assassin's demon said there's only a battle going on between humans right now, and Sadius can rest easy. The demon added that Sadius' ability is the truth. The demon reminded him that Lucifer had warned against using any abilities other than his own. The demon said he hit Sadius within the rules as he only wanted to stop him. The demon said that Sadius could enjoy his last moments until his man played with Sadius's man. The masked man wrapped the girl's arms and legs together to keep her from escaping. The sadist attached the girl to a hook and said when they came for her, he would be waiting. The girl cried out in resentment and pain that her allies would surely come. Ho Min Jae twisted around and bit the sadist's ear. She held it with her teeth and wouldn't let go. The sadist took out a knife and cut off his ear. The girl was in shock. The man asked her if it was good. He told her not to worry. He wasn't sorry. He liked to share. The masked man said he knew about the girl's co-workers. He heard her conversation perfectly well while she was following him. The man said he could tell the girl why he didn't kill her on the spot but took her to his lair and why she's hanging on the hook like a worm. The sadist said the girl was bait if she hasn't realized it by now. The girl's allies will come to rescue her. That's when he's going to send them all to hell. He's got a very good bait this time. Anxiety, like a flame in a dry forest, swept over Ho Min Joy in an instant, making her forget all the determination with which she had waited for her allies. The girl was terribly afraid. They would come, but what if they lost and died? Meanwhile, the maniac was thinking on his own. He had the perfect plan in his head, a plan created by a clever psycho. He said he had the bait ready, and now he would wait for the main course. Yeom seung was walking in the city center, the same place where Ho Min Joy was walking. The guy saw that there were too many people. It had been a while since she disappeared. In such an environment, it was almost impossible to find the person who had kidnapped Ho Min Jae. But the young man had thought of everything. He asked Bramark to use his death scent ability. The demon emerged from the ground and began to use its unique ability to search for the scent of death. A lot of people passed by this place. It was a busy square. It's just like a game of bagel, the young man thought. But instead of avoiding dangerous places, he goes into a room with a death trap on his own. The guy figured the thicker the smoke, the closer he got to his death. Looking at this question another way, 
The ability to smell death can be used, among other things, to find other creators. The demon watched the young man move from place to place in this square. Brahmerk thought his human had figured out that this ability, which was originally positioned as a protective ability, could be used as a tracking ability under certain conditions. The demon thought his man had impressive data to analyze. The guy ran farther and farther behind the smoke. He was heading in the right direction. The young man saw where the smoke was leading. The trail was hidden inside an abandoned factory. The boy thought he'd found it. Now the young man must solve the problem of how to get there undetected. The girl continued to hang on the hook. She felt very bad. Ho Min Jae opened her eyes and saw the bloody torture tools beside her. The girl thought, if this man is a real maniac like from horror movies, there is only one way to survive. She decided that she would not show any emotion. She would have to be completely calm and indifferent, as much as she could. The girl first decided to pretend to be asleep or unconscious. The maniac tried to wake her up or bring her to her senses. The killer said he initially wanted to leave her to her sweet tooth, but he thought she might get bored that way. Maniac was nervous her allies not rushing to her aid. For some reason, they were late. The masked man started going through the torture tools and said he really wanted to have fun. The maniac started pulling the girl's hair off her head, said he knew she was awake. The maniac warned that she wouldn't die, but she would want to. The girl cried and thought to herself that her allies would not abandon her. She pleaded with them in her mind to do so. The maniac was about to pluck out the girl's eye with pliers. But at that moment, a siren sounded outside the window. Hearing the siren, the girl opened her eyes. She thought it might be a detective. The demon came up and said they had tracked his man. The maniac said that was impossible because he never leaves a trail. The sadist put the torture tool back in the basket. The demon wondered who it could be outside. The sadist thought it was likely that the creator of hell had found him and reported him to the police. The killer thought maybe the cop was the creator of hell himself. One of two things. The masked man told his demon not to worry. After all, he has a demonic ability. Detective Pak's co-worker asked if he knew the person who called the police here. Pak said it was an anonymous call. The detective thought of Seungi. This guy is quite timid and extremely cautious. If they catch that scoundrel hiding here, they'll be closer to victory. The young man did the right thing to stay away. This is a matter for the adults to handle. The detective's colleague said it was an abandoned factory. It's a very dark place. It's like a haunted house. The detective said that according to the informant, a girl was dragged here so they need to find her quickly before something serious happens. Siungi watched the factory from afar and thought that things were going smoothly. But something was bothering him. The boy noticed that the smell of death was growing thicker. Why would that be? The policeman asked why there were no lights. He's scared to death of the dark, really. The policeman, looking around the area, noticed that there was something there. He had to scout it out. The policeman stood in indecision. He was tense. There was someone behind him. A maniac who was dressed up in a demon costume snapped this cop's head off and decided that in this costume he could crush people with his bare hands. The demon told the man to focus. He must remember that his ability devours the man's life energy. He should not be carried away by it. The maniac said everything's going to be fine. And the demon doesn't have to worry. He feels great and he wants to get rid of everyone else. Detective Park walked alone in the dark. It seemed strange to him that this building was closed and unlit. He seemed to be walking in circles and he couldn't see any of his colleagues around him. The policeman thought this place was like a maze. It's easy to get lost and not find your way out. The detective on the radio said this building is bigger than it looks from the outside. They need backup. Somebody needs to go outside and call for that backup. The policeman radioed for a situation report and no one responded. The detective felt something coming. He felt it almost physically. He felt like he was about to die. The detective shined the flashlight on the area in front of him. He sensed that there was someone to his left. The young man thought someone wanted to strike him. He ducked and fired several shots from his pistol in response. The attacker's protective armor withstood the pistol shot and was unharmed. The young man wondered, what is going on here? Why does it have armor? Is it really a demon? 
The detective stood with his gun against the unknown man in armor. He turned to his demon, Gargamonga. What's going on here? Gargamonga said it was a demon. The boy wondered if it was a demon. Why was it interfering in the human's fight? The young man said that a demon should not interfere in the squabbles of humans. It's forbidden for them. They should only use their abilities. How can he deal with the demon? Gargamonga said it was his ability. He doesn't fight directly, Gargamonga said, giving the man a closer look. It's not just a demon. If you look through the hole in the helmet, you can see a human face. The detective got a good look at the face and thought it was even harder than he'd bargained for. The policeman fired all the bullets from his gun. It was already useless in this situation. Detective Pock said he doesn't care if it's a demon or a maniac. He's going to send him to hell either way. The detective was wrong in this case. The maniac said he was happy and excited. He didn't expect to have so much fun. That man's strength was already beyond imagination. The demonic armor increased it several times. A maniac in demonic armor hit the inspector so hard that he broke through the wall and flew outside. Seungi, watching all this from the sidelines, saw the detective being defeated by a maniac in demonic armor. The maniac said he had caught another one. The maniac suggested there might be someone else here. The maniac shouted, if anyone is here, let them try to stop him. The man in armor shouted that he was about to send the policeman to hell, and then he would come anyway for whoever was watching now. The young man was frightened by what he heard. The young man pondered whether he should intervene in this case. The forces were not on his side. Detective Pak recalled that his father was a police officer. His father's salary was not very large. The family did not live very richly, so he worked overtime. He was often away from home. The child's mother said he should study so that he wouldn't have to work forever like his father. The head of the family was a typical workaholic who devoted more time to work than to his own family. The young man thought his daddy was cool. Thanks to him, he could live a quiet life and eat well. That day when the father returned from work, everyone in the family was happy. He always brought the children presents and many different kinds of gifts. But one day the head of the family was gone. Colleagues at work said he was beaten up by a gang whose case he was investigating. The father of the young man who survived the stabbing died from hundreds of stabbing blows that caused his intestines to rupture. The young man learned that there were a lot of people who beat his father. The perpetrator of his death was never identified, so the perpetrator who killed his father remains at large. The case of the cop being beaten to death was dismissed for lack of evidence. The young man was disillusioned with justice. The boy watched the news and wondered why no one on TV was saying that his father, a policeman, had died. The young man decided that this was a society full of injustice. When the young man grew up and became a police officer, he wanted to finish the job started by his father. After that, the young policeman met with tremendous resistance from the system. The guy realized the holes in the law were too big. There's no justice here. The honest policeman saw that the people at the top were not interested in justice. The young man was sickened by such officers of the law. The boy realized that his father was not the only case. Following in his footsteps, he became a detective. That's when he realized the system was rotten to the core. Someone had to fix this rotten situation. Someone had to stand up for justice. At one point, the demon Gargamonga appeared before the detective and said that he would help the man. And then the detective created an eternal hell for the wicked. The maniac in armor laughed and said, why are the police so helpless? What their tax dollars go to? Detective Puck clenched his fists and decided he couldn't just die like that. He has to fight. The detective thought it was all unfair. Evil should never win. The policeman pulled out his key to the gates of hell. It was glowing. The guy told the maniac to go to hell and wanted to activate it. The maniac intercepted the policeman's hand with the key and told him not to turn it. He hadn't played with it yet. The detective thought again that all this was unfair. He must keep fighting. The maniac snatched the key from the young man and threw it away. Gargamonga was upset. He wanted to help his man. But it wasn't fair. Demons should not interfere in the affairs of mortals. The maniac moved closer to the detective and asked, the one who probably thought it was unfair. He wanted to play mind games. He hoped it would work. Maniac stated, 
No matter how advanced civilization is, man, it is still part of nature. The maniac continued, there is always a predator in nature. The villain strapped the young man down and ducked taped his mouth shut. The masked killer said there's also prey in nature, and this boy is the prey now. The villain started stabbing the young man, leaving wounds on his body. The maniac said no matter how hard the rabbits fight back, they can never beat the fox. After playing around, the killer said it was time to die, and then someone called him a psychotic freak with a troubled childhood. The villain turned around and saw a young man standing with his demon. He asked who it was. Where did this sunshine come from? The detective quietly muttered that it was Yom Syungi. He too was the creator of hell. The maniac, turning to the young man, asked, Why did the rabbit come out of the hole? Syungi realized that his fearlessness was just dust in his eyes. He could barely stand on his feet. The mere sight of this lunatic made him shake. The inspector wondered if the young man had some kind of plan. Maybe he's got an ace up his sleeve. Siungi realized that his opponent was relying only on brute force. The villain asked why the young man was silent. Maybe he swallowed his tongue out of fear. Interested in the young man, the maniac let the detective go. The young man decided that such an enemy needed a special approach. The boy said what a predator this freak was. He was covered head to toe in demonic armor just like a turtle. Seungi wanted his opponent to make a mistake. We must force him to do so. The young man asked, Does a true predator need anything but fangs? The boy had adopted a fighting stance on purpose. He wanted his opponent to think he was trying to scare him. The young man told Brahmark to show him the smell of death and maximized its intensity. The young man noticed that the maniac in armor was shrouded in dense smoke, the smoke of death. The maniac tried to hit the guy with his fist. The guy ducked. The villain thought that even a policeman could not avoid such a lunge. Siungi thought that when Brahamark had told him about his death-smelling ability, he had come up with a rather entertaining idea. What if he increased the intensity of the fog and used it in open combat? Based on the density of the fog, he can anticipate the enemy's attacks. This way, you can dodge any enemy lunges with almost 100% probability. This business is all about timing. The young man's idea worked. He effectively dodged all of his opponent's punches. The villain couldn't understand why this young man was so good at dodging. What was his secret? The demon was telling his man, the more he moves, the faster his life force drains away. He needs to pull himself together and end it all in one blow. The maniac said he was trying but the young man was as wily as a snake. Due to the fact that the young man did a lot of physical training and running, he had enough strength and stamina to be able to dodge in time. Shungi thought he might have a chance to win. The young man continued to effectively dodge his opponent's blows and wear down the maniac. The villain was losing strength. Along with them, he was losing vitality. Yom Shungi was confident of victory, and not just because he could dodge the blows. The villain kept getting nervous. Why is this happening? It's not fair. The maniac thought he must be stronger, since he had armor. There was no point in attacking a villain who was wearing armor, so the young man went completely on the defensive, and he kept it effectively. The boy kept dodging. The demon wondered how long it would last. Sooner or later, the opponent would still hit the young man. Will he be able to overpower him by somehow forcing him to betray the young man? The young man understood that his opponent's defense was perfect. The guy knew he had an ally in Detective Pak, and it must be used in the fight against the maniac. Detective Pak decided that he had to get to the key and open the gates of hell as soon as possible. It was hard for the man because his whole body was wounded. Yom Syungi won't last much longer. He must be helped quickly. Bramerk says that entertaining a psychopath while a policeman is looking for a key is very clever. But what happens if the maniac realizes what they're up to? Maniac asked, the young man keeps dodging, why does he want to do that? What is he trying to accomplish? The guy continued to stand in a boxing stance, the villain asked why he came out against him. Was it to show how agile he was? The maniac pulled away from the young man and looked at the detective. He continued to creep slowly toward the key. 
There was some distance between the detective and the key. There was also some distance between the maniac and the detective. The villain realized his mistake. He guessed that the two men had decided to trick him. The psychopath shouted that he would destroy them all and lunge toward the policeman. The policeman made a dash with his last strength and jumped toward his key. Detective Pak was faster. He grabbed his key and activated it. The young men were saved. The villain realized that he had lost. The gates of hell opened and out flew the chains that would entrap the villain. The villain screamed and struggled, but there was nothing he could do. That was the end of his game. His mission on earth had come to an end. The maniac was screaming. He knew he deserved to go to hell. The chains were pulling him in. The detective said he could keep resisting hell, but it won't help him. The maniac screamed that he didn't want to. There was so much more to this world, but he had a one-way ticket. He was born in a brothel. He was an abandoned child. Nobody wanted him. He was abused all the time. No one was involved in the child's upbringing. He was left to his own devices. His mother ran away from his parents with a man of questionable reputation. After that, the woman became a prostitute. The woman was constantly beaten and forced to do dirty work. He was the unwanted child of a woman of easy virtue and a pimp. In such an environment, he could not grow up to be a normal person. He developed violent tendencies. The boy inherited his father's cruelty and his mother's infantilization. Such a vicious cocktail created a truly horrible monster. This monster was going to become the reaper of human souls. He was going to become a danger to society. Yom Sungi shouted that this maniac's life is a great mistake. The young man kicked the villain's armor and sent him to hell. Detective Park lay bleeding. He had no strength. Gargamonga and Bramark said they had won. Yom Seungi said the detective has to get up. They still have to release Ho Min Jae. The detective was very pleased with the young man. Puck said that the young man hadn't run away after all. The winners of this battle were Yeom sung and Park Sang-shik. Their demons cheered. Inside the factory, in one of the rooms, what the two men saw really startled them. The young men saw a girl tied to a pole. She was dripping blood. She was pitiful to look at. It was a completely exhausted man, lost in all hope. The girl saw the members of her team and couldn't believe her eyes. Was she really saved? Puck said they were safe and almost unharmed. Shungi released the girl from the ropes binding her. She couldn't stand. The guy lowered the girl to the floor and asked how she was feeling. The girl cried. The young man said she usually looked cooler. The young man said he was about to call an ambulance. The girl sobbed and said she thought she was going to die. Shungi said he warned her not to act alone. If she had listened to him, this wouldn't have happened. The young man decided to make a joke. He said they had sent Friday the 13th to hell, and now they had nothing to fear. An ambulance pulled up and loaded the injured and took them to the hospital. A detective rescued a missing schoolgirl. A maniac was framed for the murder of a cop, and they put out a bolo. They showed the detective's picture on TV and told how he saved this schoolgirl from the hands of a ruthless maniac. Yu Yun Han, while watching the news on TV, noticed that once again this detective had caught his eye. The man began to collate facts. The Gagaki house. The maniac. The man had a thought. What if this detective was also a creator? That would explain why he was so far away from his station when he released the girl. Yu Nyung Han continued to analyze further. What if the maniac didn't escape? What if the detective lured him into his own hell? The man contacted the chief of police and asked that he arrange a meeting with one of the police officers. Yu Nyung Han said his company would like to show their respect and gratitude to the detective who saved the girl from the psychopath. The man said, I'll see you soon, detective. Yeom Shungi was at the hospital near the girl and studying the documents that had come into his possession. Ho Min Jae came to her senses and opened her eyes. She saw a young man in front of her. The girl was overjoyed. She called the young man by name. The boy continued to scrutinize the documents. The young man saw that the girl was awake and said hello. She jumped up and threw herself into his arms. The girl knocked the young man to the floor. The boy asked what had gotten into her. Ho Min Jae cried and said that she was very scared. She still can't believe that she is free. The girl came to her senses, calmed down, and thanked the young man for saving her. 
she had no one else to rely on. Yom Sungi tried to calm her down and told her to sit on the bed. She shouldn't get up yet. The guy gently sat Grandpa down on the bed and told her that she would be on the men now, and all the scary stuff was over. The young man told the girl not to worry, because it's all over now. He now wants to go to the next room and check on the detective. The young man handed the girl a document and told her to read it. The girl asked, is this the result of her tests? Yeom Seungi said that this folder contains information about the creators they saw outside Gagaki's house. The young man stated that he wanted to show the girl these papers earlier, but force majeure arose. Leaving the room, the young man told the girl to be sure to examine the contents of those folders. The guy wished his acquaintance a speedy recovery. He'll be visiting her. Detective Park said it was unfair. The young man visited Ho Min Jae first. However, he was the one who sent that maniac to hell. Now he's basking in the glory. Seungi asked if the detective was jealous. The detective said he was just reminding him to whom the young man owed the most. Detective Park pulled a key out of his pocket and held it out to the young man, told him to take it. The investigator said he realized something while he was dying. He thinks they shouldn't go after the creators of hell directly. The policeman explained that some of the creators, like that maniac, can be extremely dangerous. And that's just the beginning. There's no telling what the rest of the creators will be like. Seungi considered this key. It was an ordinary key. The detective said it was the key to his house. Puck explained that few people would think of breaking into a detective's house. Not even the worst psychopath. It's got a personal security system. It's more secure than the young man's apartment or Ho Min Jae's. Yom Seungi thought the detective was making a point. It's better to hide, not at home. It's good that the detective is on the same team as the young man. Seungi agreed and said he would be back as soon as he moved his things there, and he thanked the detective for his help. The detective said he had one more case and pulled his notebook out from under his pillow. He held it out to the young man. The detective asked if the young man here remembered the notebook he gave to the guy the other day when he proposed the union. The investigator said then he faked the numbers to keep all the cards straight. All the numbers in this notebook are correct. It's accurate. The young man was taken aback. He was even frightened. He realized what had happened. Yom Seungi guessed that their alliance might be over now. The irreparable thing had happened. What the detective did is called betrayal. And now the young man can easily send the detective to hell. Should he do that? The detective is actually a strong opponent. Pak said that he no longer had any reason to cheat. Now the young man has all the information he needs. Seungi thought the detective has access to police resources. He's smart and he knows how to fight. The cop is eloquent and extremely tough. The young man thought that at this rate, Detective Park would be one of the last to survive and then he would have to fight Yeom Seungi. The young man hesitated. He didn't know how to proceed. The detective had just activated his key. Would this policeman still be useful to him? Seungi thought about getting rid of this guy before he got attached to him after all. It would be harder to do that later. The detective noticed that the young man was thinking anxiously about something. He asked, is everything okay? Maybe the boy had a grudge. Seungi, to hide his excitement, said that he had to leave immediately. He left the room. The guy went into the bathroom, pulled out his hell gate key, and saw that it was already activated. So the detective really betrayed him, Brehamirk said, making an alliance to spread false information to his allies. The boy was lucky it was his prank that didn't play against the young men. The demon said, either way, the detective betrayed the young man. Brehamirk asked, what is the man going to do about it? After all, the detective is a very strong opponent. He could cause a lot of problems in the future. Brehamirk said they know very little about the policeman, and he knows quite a lot about the young man. The demon remarked that the next time the detective betrayed him, the young man would go to his underworld. The guy said he hated traitors, and when the demon gave him the opportunity, he built a special hell for such traitors. The young man decided that if he gave the detective away, he would then spend the rest of his life berating himself for becoming someone he hated. Shungi asked the demon, when the day of his death came, where would he end up? In the same hell, and with the scoundrels he had sent there. The young man told Brammerk that he would not send the detective to hell. He can't do that. 
Braham Merck said he saw the young man overwhelmed by negative thoughts and emotions, anger, resentment, feelings of inferiority. That's why he was chosen to be the creator of hell. But the longer he stayed in this alliance, the more the demon realized that the young man was becoming a completely different person. The demon added that the guy had a completely different emotion. Now he's interested in personal growth and relationships with people. Looking at all of this, Bramerk said that he was doing his analysis and drawing conclusions accordingly. It may so happen that the young man's actions threaten the life of the great demon Bramerk. The demon continued. He would be forced to make the young man beg to be sent to hell. The boy swore to the demon that no such thing would happen. He would feed it to the underworld of other creatures. After a while, Yeom Shungi returned to Detective Pak's room. He inquired about his ally's treatment. Ho Min Jae walked into the detective's room with an IV in her hand. The girl wanted to thank the policeman for saving her. She met both allies there. The young people were happy that their company was together again. Near the hospital and his car, Yu Nyung Han came out. He was carrying a gift for the sick policeman. The deputy said a police detective was informed that he would be visited to comfort and encourage him. After a little talk, the girl said she was going to go out for a bit. She left the room. The young men were left alone. In the corridor, Ho Min Jae and Yu Nyung Han missed each other. The girl came out of the room. The young man went in there. They were strangers. Yu Yun Han entered the detective's room and saw that he wasn't alone. The assistant he saw outside Gagaki's house was there. Detective Park and Yom Seungi looked at each other anxiously. They knew who was in front of them. Yu Neom Han said, what a coincidence. The two creators of hell have gotten together. Could it be that they are pondering how to deal with him? The detective was the first to pick himself up and ask, what is this man talking about? And more importantly, what is he doing here now? The visitor said the detective is a good actor and he is doing well in his role. Yu Nyung Han pointed at the young man and said that the detective's partner is completely wooden. He can't pretend. The man continued. Officially, he is here to express his gratitude to the detective for saving a schoolgirl from a terrifying maniac. Yu Nyung Han smiled and said unofficially, he was here to propose a new alliance. The young men looked at each other again. Yom Shungi was at a loss. He absolutely did not understand how this man was able to reveal them. The young man didn't understand where they might have miscalculated. Could it be that he might have exposed them because of that incident? The visitor said that he could hear the gears in the young man's head making noise. The young man must be wondering how he knew that the creators of hell were in front of him. Yu Neong Han said it was very simple. The detective had gotten in his way too often, and the young man doesn't look like an intelligence officer. He's too young. The visitor said he asked the clerk to check on both men. As it turned out, the young man was also a minor. The man said this is where he started to think and try to put all the facts together. If Puck is a real detective, why would he be on a call to another neighborhood? Next question. Why is the detective constantly followed by a high school kid who pretends to be a detective too? Yu Nyung Han said he had the answer. These two people are both the creators of hell, and they formed a temporary alliance. The man suggested they both showed up at Gagaki's house first. Then they dispatched the killer. It made sense that they were hunting other creatures. Yu Nyung Han asked, needing to explain anything further? Apparently, this alliance is very savvy since they've gotten this far. Seungi was having a brainstorm. What should he do? Should he confess? Maybe the detective has some idea? Detective Park raised his hands and said he was busted, and he's turning himself in, and asked if that's what his visitor wanted to hear. The detective continued, the man has exposed them and what happens next? I guess he wants them to bow down to him. The detective asked if he wanted them to become slaves like Zhang Zhang Chul. Yu Nang Han realized that they have information about him too, and they're insinuating that they're on equal footing. He must have underestimated them. The guest said it wasn't like that at all. If he wanted to make them his slaves, he would have attacked them first, or send a threatening letter. The man said he came here to organize an alliance, on mutually beneficial terms. The detective thanked and said they didn't need this alliance, and they don't see how he could be of any use to them. The detective said he saw his alliance and the way he makes it. 
He's rejecting the offer. Yoon Yong Han wanted to know what Detective Park had in mind. Is he bluffing? The guest said that Jung Chul is gone. He can't get in touch with him. The man was either sent to hell, killed, or kidnapped. The visitor said he wanted to catch whoever did this, who deprived him of his assistant without his knowledge. The man said, He doesn't promise this union will last forever, but they aren't stupid to believe such a thing either. Yu Neong Han held out his hand. Guest said, He suggests banding together to catch whoever did this. Yom Seung Gi realized how dangerous this man was, and in order to send him to hell, one must solve a possible problem. The boy did not know that he would have to go out of his way to make the stranger betray him. However, fate gave the young man a chance. It was the perfect opportunity. An alliance must be made with this man and he must be forced to betray him. In that case, the deed will be done. Yaom Shungi said, arm in arm, and shook the stranger's hand. The young man said he needed all the information about the guy they were looking for first. A man was sitting with a bloody head, tied to a chair, his face taped with duct tape. Above him stood the villains who had captured him. The next moment, a girl named Chi Mu Jin was wheeled into the room in a wheelchair. She was the creator of hell. The villains turned to face the girl, called her sister, said hello and bowed their heads to her. She was the eldest here. The woman said to have the prisoner's tape removed. He would have to be talked to. The man, as soon as he could speak, shouted, who is she? What's going on here? What do they want him to do? He knows nothing about any sin. The man was frightened. He realized that his shouting had no effect, and the matter was more serious than he had thought. The woman told her subordinate to take care of the man and set him straight. The man in the chair got scared and yelled, Don't do him! He doesn't understand what's going on here! The man, puffed up with anger, went up to the prisoner and looked him in the eye. The man pleaded and said, He doesn't know what this is all about. The next moment, the girl's subordinate broke the captive's finger. The man screamed in pain. Afterwards, the man said he would tell everything as long as he wasn't killed. But he doesn't know anything about any sin. His broken finger was very painful. The woman said the procedure should be repeated. The prisoner was in pain. He was in tears. The man said his sin was negligence. The woman asked if he knew anything more about the creator of hell. The captive agonized in pain, called out the name Yu Nyung Han. The man was grabbed by another finger. He screamed a name. He called out the name of the creator of hell. What more do you want from him? The woman said she needed something more than just a name. She needed more information. The captive said with his last strength, the woman promised him she would cooperate. He told her everything. The woman studied the information about this man, a name she just recognized. It was a director of a large company. He was skillful. Being a public figure, it would be hard for him to hide, and that would make their job easier. The woman looked at the monitor and said he was definitely going to hell. Her eyes were burning. The woman turned around and told her subordinate to gather the men. Soon they would pay this guy a courtesy visit. Yu Yun Han responded to the young man's question by saying that he knew absolutely nothing. The next moment the guest corrected himself and said that, however he had a little information. The man thinks that if the kidnapper gets information from Jung Chul, he'll probably attack him while he's working. A woman going to make a courtesy visit asked if her subordinates were ready for this meeting. All of them answered that they were ready. Yu Nung Han said in order to carry out what he had planned, he needs to organize a new alliance. Twelve years ago, parking lot. There are a lot of people bleeding in the parking lot. It's likely that there was a gang fight. A male survivor yells at a thug who is holding a bloody baseball bat. The man pulled out a knife, which is also covered in blood, shouting that his opponents will not go unpunished. They will be finished as soon as his boss finds out about everything. A thug with a baseball bat hit this man over the head and yelled at him to shut his mouth. Gromila said he knows who he's going up against. He has a case against that boss. It was the gang leader Kim Jong-su. The man told his opponent to just lie there and then maybe he'd only get by with a couple bruises and he wouldn't have to turn his face into mush. A car pulled into the same parking lot and stopped in front of the gunman. They all looked at its passenger intently. Che Mu Jung, the boss of another organization, got out of the car. He looked around at everyone present. The man was completely calm. 
Gromila said finally a man honored them with his presence. They had been expecting such a distinguished man. Che Mu Jung's assistant wanted to deal with the bully. Boss stopped him. The boss asked what this gang was doing in his neighborhood. The opponent said the boss should know what their claim was and told the assistant to get that person over here. An aide brought in Cho Seung Luck, the successor to the gang leader, in a wheelchair. The man showed it to him and told his boss to explain it somehow and explain why they did it to him. The man said his legs were shattered into hundreds of pieces. There is a possibility that he will remain in the chair for life. A man in anger asked his opponent how he was going to retaliate for this. This cannot go unpunished. The assistant boss of the feuding clan who was being sued said that if this guy had behaved more decently, he wouldn't have been touched. He came into their territory. The boss slapped his assistant and told him to shut up immediately. The man told him not to open his mouth until he was allowed to. He must not interfere in the affairs of adults. The opponent observed that Mr. Che still rules with an iron hand. Based on this, it can be assumed that Mr. Che is willing to pay the price for the incident. The man threw the suitcases at Mr. Che's feet and said they should be stuffed to the top with dollars and divide the spheres of influence in his neighborhood. The man thought it was a huge loss, even for a gang like Che's. It was a shame about the successor, of course. But with this money, they could get rid of their rival and survive for another 30 years. The bandit asked Mr. Che if he could afford that amount of money. Or maybe he wants to start a war. That was a direct threat. The boss told his subordinate to bring Mu Jin. The subordinate was surprised. The subordinate led the girl by the hand and told her that her daddy was calling her. It was the boss's daughter, seven years old. The opponent was surprised and asked, why did he bring his daughter here? Maybe he wants to evoke sympathy. A man told his daughter he had something he needed to pay off, and the daughter should help him with that. The girl said okay. The man suddenly pulled a knife out of his pocket. Everyone was puzzled. Mr. Che asked, so their man won't be able to walk? In that case, we would have to resort to the old biblical wisdom of an eye for an eye. A man suddenly stabbed his daughter's legs with a knife. The girl cried out and fell down from the surprise. The girl was lying in a pool of blood and screaming in pain. The father threw the knife aside and rushed to his daughter. The opponent thought he had been in the criminal world for 20 years, but this was the first time he had seen such brutality. The bandit didn't understand how a father could do this to his daughter. The girl continued to bleed. The child was lying there crying. The girl didn't understand anything, why her own father had done that to her. The man, leaning over the child, said he now owed her. The man added that he will definitely pay her back in full one day. After that, Boss Che, wielding his knife, brutally dealt with all his opponents. The girl grew up, but she never got out of her wheelchair. The demon said he could kill her. The woman said she had to return a favor first. She asked me to take her to her father's office. The girl was accompanied by her demon. She appeared in her father's office and told him it was time to pay. The man got scared and told her to stay away from him or even come near him. Mujin pointed the hell gate key at her father and activated it. Che Mujin eliminated all the enemies and became the head of the clan. Yu Neong Han was the king of the ordinary world. He had money and power in his hands. Che Mujin became the queen of the underground world. On her own, she could not do anything illegal because of her physical condition. However, Mamujin had many subordinates who obeyed her unquestioningly. When the woman took over the leadership of the Che clan, all of her subordinates were willing to do anything. The girl ruled fiercely in her clan. There was never anyone who disobeyed her, because everyone was afraid of going to hell. The aide showed the girl Yu Neong Han's schedule and said that they were able to bribe some people in his circle. Mujin scrutinized the document and pondered when she could pay him a courtesy visit. The deputy asked what they would do with this prisoner. Should they get rid of him? The captive was screaming to just be let go. He told them everything. He has a grudge against Yun Han too. The woman said if she let him go, he becomes her debtor. A man can choose now life or death. The man didn't have much choice, so he said he was choosing life and would become her debtor. The woman said to let the man go. Now he will be as bait. Mujin looked at the schedule and said that Neong Han has a charity party in two days. That's when they'll attack. 
The woman ordered to gather as many people as possible. It will be a responsible event. Mu Jin gathered all the personnel and asked if they were ready. Everyone answered their leader in unison that they were ready. They would do whatever she told them to do. Mu Jin and her gang members advanced in cars to a charity party. The party was held at a country residence. Yu Yun Han made small talk with the guests of the event. Yeom Seung Gi and Detective Park also showed up at the party. Naeong Han thanked them for coming, his brave bodyguards. Puck said he's not a bodyguard. He just came here for dinner. He didn't offer the alliance. He just said, yeah. Yeom Seung Gi said the detective should be his bodyguard and called the policeman a grump. Seung Gi asked the party host if he was sure they would come today. Neong Han said he wasn't very sure, but anything can happen. The man noted that this is the only event on his schedule that is in a residential neighborhood that anyone is relatively easy to show up to. This is the only chance they have. Nin Khan hopes they will definitely come today. Mujun heading to this party thought this charity party for the creators of Hell has begun. Majun watched the entrance to the mansion through binoculars. She found it amusing. The girl assumed it was a charity party for very important people. She determined that there was security at the entrance. Two big men. Majun thought the bouncers at her club looked more solid. They'd be easy to take down. The deputy looked through his binoculars and asked his sister what they should do. Maybe it was time to move out? The girl said we can move out. Target confirmed. The girl said anyone who gets in the way can be destroyed. There's no need to be ceremonious with anyone. Majun said she would take care of the rest herself. Deputy Majun got out of the car and proceeded straight to the gate where the guards were standing. One of the guards, who was bigger, said that entry was forbidden because this was private property. It was forbidden to enter here uninvited. The visitor said he seemed to have something instead of an invitation and reached into an inside pocket. The guard waited patiently. The man said one more minute. He had already found it. The guest pulled out a knife and slit the guard's throat. It happened so suddenly that the guard didn't even blink an eye. Blood splattered in all directions. Deputy Majin did the same to the second guard. He was lightning fast. As a result, there were two corpses lying near the gate. No one was blocking the passage. The man gave the command to the cars that they could pass because he had cleared the road. He had done his part. Majin commanded over the walkie-talkie that cars could pass. The girl continued to monitor the situation through binoculars while in the car. Just then, two black cars pulled up to the gate. They braked sharply with a creaking sound beside Assistant Majun. Yu Neong Han noticed the sound of car brakes coming from the side of the gate. The gate opened and a gang of armed thugs entered from there. They were heading straight for the guests. Majun announced over the speakerphone, Ladies and gentlemen, if life is precious, you'd better stand facing the wall. The girl continued, They are here on behalf of the Semiconductor Industry Union, and they intend to air their grievances. Majun said this is her final warning. If the guests did not immediately stand against the wall, they would be forced to use force. Yu Neong Han realized while looking at these thugs that they were already here. Then he was right. These are the guests he's been waiting for. The party host thought we should get out of here. While the crowd is confused, he doesn't have much time for that. Suddenly there was some kind of sound. The thug hit one of the guests on the head with a stick. He fell down bleeding. The guests were terribly frightened. The bandits shouted, which all present, unfortunately, do not understand from the first word. They must turn to the wall immediately, or he would smash their heads as he had just done to this unfortunate man. The guests started running towards the wall in terror. There was an unimaginable scream. A bandit with a bat spotted the party host and stopped him. He called his name, Yu Yun Han. Yom Seung and Inspector Park walked over to the wall and faced it. The young man thought, why didn't he leave? He had a chance, didn't he? The inspector said they could still leave here. The policeman thought there were too many of these raiders. The union's not worth it. Maybe we should reconsider. The detective said there's about a dozen of these bandits here. They won't be able to take them. The detective continued, they are still on the winning side right now. This Yunhan is very dangerous. Seung Gi thought that the detective was right. However, if he got out but they betrayed him, they would lose their advantage. 
the young man decided that it would be better to watch for the time being. Yu Nyung Han approached the raiders with a calm demeanor. The guy raised his hands and said sarcastically that he had been caught. That's a shame. He doesn't know what to do now. It was all said with irony. The deputy reported to Majun that they had found him. What should he do next? Maybe this guy should be captured. The girl said there was no point. It would be an unnecessary hassle. Ma Jung commanded that this guy could just be destroyed, right there on the spot, and don't make it any harder on yourself. The demon, who was near Ma Jun, asked if the woman would not send him to hell. The demon was directly interested in this. Ma Jun noticed that Lucifer said it was a game of survival. You don't have to put people in hell to get rid of them. To openly put the creator in hell is too risky. The girl noticed that this guy had recruited another creator, Gagaku. The captive confessed that Yu Nyung Han wanted to recruit another maker. It had to be Gagaka. Ma Jun thought, once she gets in there, it will be all over for her. So that's what she should do now. The demon said that, in other words, the woman ruthlessly sent her men to their deaths and is now watching it in cold blood through binoculars. The demon stated to the woman that he wanted his hell to be filled with souls anyway. Ma Jun said the demon didn't have to worry about that and laughed coldly. The girl continued when this deadly game was over, she would feed the demon to all her team members, who watched her legs turn to mush. Yu Neong Han looked around at the people present and said, it looks like all the guests are already gathered, and the party is starting. One of the bandits asked what he was talking about. Is he scared out of his mind? The bandits noticed that armed men had come to the host's aid. They weren't ready for this. It was going to be a bloodbath. The guards of the house rushed at the bandits, shouting that they were about to destroy them all. Their swords glittered in their hands. The two men clashed to the death. Everything at hand was used. Bones cracked and blood poured out in rivers. Yu Neong Han noted to himself that the enemy had studied his schedule, just as he suspected. This shows that the enemy is smart and dangerous. The mistake, however, was not checking out everyone the homeowner had invited. And that was a surprise to him. The host of the party had to be ready for anything. He had a bunch of bodyguards posing as invitees. Yu Neong Han told the bodyguards that they could drink moderately and socialize and report anyone who looked suspicious to him. Yu Neong Han liked to play chess. He thought it was a good opening, but the game had just begun. The young man decided to pay tribute to his opponent. Not everyone dares to stand up to him. What will be his next move? The aide reported to Ma Jun that they were surrounded. It's the bodyguards of the master of the house. That's why he can't get to Yu Nung Han. The girl radioed for backup. She said they need to move fast. We need their help right away. Help is on the way right away. Yu Yun Han watched from the sidelines as his party went on. He noticed that more guests had arrived. They were reinforcements for the bandits. Ma Jun said that now her demon was coming out. She asked him to bring her Yu Nyong Han's head. It's time to end this. The girl promised her demon that she would make him the unconditional master of hell. The demon grinned approvingly in response. The man got out of the car and headed straight for the epicenter of events. Majin was left in the car all alone. Archdemon Cherub was making his way through the fighting people. He was only interested in Yu Nyong Han. That was his target. His ability was the ability to enter people's bodies. One of Nong Han's guards saw the man who had been possessed by the demon and shouted that he was finished. He rushed over to stop him. The bodyguard pounced and beat the man. The demon couldn't fight back because he couldn't use his power. After that collision, the demon ended up with a broken arm and that body was unusable. To top it all off, the assailant pulled out a baton and beat the man. The demon's body fell. It was all mangled. The demon was unable to complete its task. Yu Yunhan was not caught. Archdemon Cherub realized that he needed to find a new body immediately. The demon spirit has left this body. The demon spirit had taken over the body of the person who had mutilated the previous demon body. It was the body of Yu Neong Han's bodyguard. Archidemon Cherub was pleased. He noted that this body was much better than the previous one. It was younger and stronger looking. The possessed person can do nothing with his body. 
He doesn't even distinguish between his own and strangers. This demon's ability allowed him to wreak havoc in the enemy ranks. He struck blows that no one expected him to strike. The demon shouted to his companions to waste no time and move to the mansion. That's where their target is. Demon shouted to find Yu Nyong Han, and he would take care of the bodyguards. Ma Jun and Yu Nyong Han were having an intellectual battle between them. It was akin to a game of chess. Ma Jun thought, no matter how well Mr. Headmaster prepared, it still wasn't enough. The attackers fought their way inside the mansion. They gradually eliminated the bodyguards who were forced to retreat under the onslaught of the enemy. The senior said for his subordinates to start the search, they must search all the rooms and find Unhan. The man said they should turn the whole house upside down. But don't come back without Neong Han. The sooner they finish, the sooner they can go home. The subordinates rushed to scour the whole house. The man said it was time for a fox hunt, and he's a master at it. The bandits remarked that the house was a maze. I wonder if all the rich people live like this. How do you find one person in here? One of the bandits decided to search all the closets, hoping that Yunan hid in one of them. The man searches all the closets in a row. In one of them, he found Gagaku, who was sitting with the activated key to the hell gate. The young man said hello. The bandit looked with surprise at the guy who was sitting in the closet. After that, Gagaka told him that he was saying goodbye and did not wish him luck. Everyone who was outside saw a bright flash coming from the windows of that room. There were also screams coming from there. During Gagaki's first visit to Yu Neong Han's office, they were peacefully talking while sitting at the desk. Yu Neong Han said he wants to put Gagaku in his mansion. He's prepared all the documents for that. Nong Han said he would need Gagaki's hell. The moment the uninvited guests arrive, it turns out that Gagaka will be at home in the mansion. Now Khan not only made his mansion the dwelling of Gagaki, but allowed him to furnish it to his own taste. Countless secret passages and hiding places and traps were present in the house. As a result, Yu Neong Han's mansion became the perfect place where Gagaki's abilities could be fully manifested. This house became purgatory. Gagaka could send bandits to hell one by one. Yu Nung Han was watching everything from the secret room, through the CCTV cameras. The guy realized that Gagaki's hell would be replenished today. However, there was not a single hell creator among them. The landlord wondered where their king really was. Yu Neong Han saw that the situation had reached an impasse. It was time to do something about it. The bandits took the surviving guards prisoner, but those did not know where their boss was. Majun was on the verge of a breakdown. Yu Neong Han continued to watch as the number of bandits steadily decreased, thanks to Gagaka. Majun too realized that her men who had infiltrated the house were quickly disappearing. Communication with the members of the organization who had broken in was lost. The only thing that could be heard was the screams of death. Majun guessed it was most likely Gagaki's doing. The prisoner in the office had warned her of that. The girl took all the members of her gang out into the courtyard. She said that everyone had to leave the mansion immediately. Majun realized that the key could not be used outside the house. It would not be considered trespassing. Yu Nyung Han, on the contrary, barricaded himself in the mansion. The guy decided that his opponent wasn't stupid at all. If he decided to get all the people out of the mansion, outside the house, Gagaka was useless to him. Nin Han wondered what to do. What would be the next move? The owner of the house did not know what to do next, so he just waited. There was no hurry. He told Gagaka not to chase anyone. Otherwise, he would die. The guy regretted that he couldn't call the cops. Every creator wants to send another creator to hell. Ma Jun and Yu Nyung Han were waiting. Each of them was in no hurry to go anywhere. The only thing that could upset this precarious balance was the Singa Alliance watching the confrontation from the sidelines. The phone rang. The young man put the earpiece in his ear. It was his ally. The girl said they had another maker. She discovered him. Ho Min Jae explained, it's most likely someone who is after Yu Neong Han. The girl was not far away because she wanted to help the young people, and it was in her best interest. Ho Min Jae asked the young man how they were doing and told him to say hi to Detective Park. 
The young man asked if the girl had been able to locate the creator. Where could he be now? Ho Min Jae said that she ran around the mansion and was able to spot a few people who are creators. These people are Yeom Seung-gi, Detective Puck, Yu Yun Han, Gagaka. The girl said she found someone else. Ho Min Jae said it's a woman. She's from the car watching the events through binoculars, but the girl can't use the key on her right now. Seung-gi said that it's not necessary to use the key now. We have to wait, the guy asked as the girl confided in him. Yom Shungi said that the girl would have to follow his instructions, and he would guide her. The young man explained that the girl should approach the creator. Considering the fact that she hadn't shown up yet, and the fact that she was still in hiding already spoke volumes. The young man concludes that her hell is highly specialized. It's weakly universal. The guy said he couldn't help the girl from here. She'll have to take action on her own. The demon of this creature is now at his side. Majun tried to get to Neong Han without entering the building. If the police come here, we'll have to shut down the operation. Ho Min Jae opened the car and looked inside. Majun saw the girl and was very surprised. The girl improvised. She said hello to Majun and said that she wanted to join her. It was chilly outside now. Majun asked, who is she and what did she want? The girl must have gotten the wrong address. Ho Min Jae showed her companion the key to the hell gate and asked if this thing said anything to her. Ma Jun was at a complete loss. How did this girl know she was here? Why is another hell creator here? Could it really be her ability? Ho Min Jae winked and told that one not to worry. She didn't come here for her. The girl showed her key again and said it was not glowing. So her companion had nothing to worry about. Ma Jun asked, then why did that girl come here? Ho Min Jae said that someone wanted to talk to her. seung said hello to the stranger and told her that he too is the creator of hell and is at this party right now. She can call him Baham. Ma Jun asked what he wanted from her. It turns out he's one of Neong Han's guests. seung said that Ma Jun got it right and they have a common interest. The young man said he wants to eliminate Yoon Han. They can work together if it's interesting. Seungi said that judging from those militants who are smoking on the sidelines, their mistress's situation is stalemate. The guy said if the woman wants to get to the principal, he suggests following his instructions. Jean wondered, what am I going to do now? She doesn't know the true intentions of this Baham. However, he is right. The situation is indeed a stalemate. The young man wanted the girl to make up her mind and become his puppet. Majun said she might agree. But what is the young man's plan? She wants him to tell her what it is. Majin gave a command to her subordinate. He said he wouldn't let her down. He would do as she told him. The militant turned to the guests. He asked for their attention. He said if they didn't want to be harmed, they should follow his instructions. The man ordered everyone to line up and head to the mansion to see the host of the event. Yom Seungi looked at this and noted to himself that everything was going just as he had planned. Now he had an assistant. Deputy Majun, already inside the mansion, gave a command to his subordinates. They should take one hostage each and search the mansion again. It was like a game where the two teams had to pair up. It was a very clever move. The person who came up with this plan was Yeom Seungi. Seungi knew that by doing so, he had neutralized Gagaka's ability. And now Gagaka is out of the picture. Gagaka has contacted his boss. What will be the instructions? Should he send everyone to hell? Yu Yun Han was upset. Guests can't be destroyed. He didn't expect that. He had to think of something. Many of the guests at that party were very powerful people. Nothing should happen to them. It shouldn't happen that any of the guests see the abilities of the creators of hell. Nin Khan realized if this happened, it would be very difficult to explain to the police and the media. Nin Han realized that if he did that, he could go to jail and that would be practically guaranteed. Nin Han, having lost the ability to use hell, was left unarmed. Under no circumstances should he allow anyone to see him use hell. Yeom seung realized that the bandits could now continue their search for the director unhindered. The young man had realized from the beginning that the creator who opposed Nin Han was not a threat. The most dangerous opponent in this game is Yu Yun Han himself. The most important task is to eliminate Yoon Han. Yu Neong Han suddenly felt something was going wrong. The bandits behaved like a brute, unorganized force. It was a kind of chaotic movement. From some point on, 
the guy noticed that the bandit started taking unexpected clever actions. Nin Khan tried to see some kind of pattern and figure out what was behind it. The guy assumed that the person who was running these people was someone else. The director couldn't figure out who it could be. He was getting even more nervous. Yu Neong Han knew that he had Yeom Seungi and his team and Gagaka on his side. Is there really someone behind his pursuer too? The young man dismissed the thought. It seemed implausible to him. The director suggested that he may have been betrayed, some of his allies, and thus undermining his defenses from within. Yu Nong Han said that he didn't want to rely on the demon's strength. However, he was left with no choice. The boy summoned his demon Ram. Neong Han said he would need the demon's ability. He wants to write a poem of the future. Ram said the man decided to use his powers for the first time. The demon Ram was ready to share his ability with the young man. It was a surprise to him. Yu Neong Han said that it was natural. After all, this quite honest ability can only be used three times. The director said he was just waiting for the right moment. And now it's here. A poem of the future. This is an ability that allows the user to look into the future that will happen in the next hour, in snippets. The principal saw an unknown man burst into his room. The director has seen how the unknowns are already many, and all of them are aiming for him. Among them is Yeom Seungi. Nin Han is trying to activate his key to the gates of hell. Nin Khan is stabbed in the arm with a knife and drops the key to the gates of hell. The unidentified men disarm the director and strip him. Noin Khan dies from a fatal stab wound. The bandits leave the room, leaving the principal dead. Yu Yun Han realized who the traitor in his team was. Yeom Shungi. How could he let that happen? Bramurk's ability to sense his own death approaching. The future poem allows one to know what will happen in the next hour, thereby allowing the user to change their destiny. Yu Neong Han told Gagaka to get rid of Yeom Shungi right away, by any means necessary. Straight to hell, Gagaka said because the boss forbade the use of the gate because of the guests. Gagaka added, the boss himself invited this young man to his house, so it can't be seen as an intrusion. Yu Yun Han was in a panic. The young man was able to calculate everything. Xiongi knew from the beginning that he was in no danger here. The director looked out the window and saw young men walking nearby, looking for the owner of the house, one of them, Yeom Xiongi. In fact, there was no such calculation in Xiunga's plans. He didn't have enough information and time to prepare well. However, Yeom Xiunggi had comrades he could trust. It was a detective who was willing to protect. It was also the Ho Min Jae that Yu Neong Han didn't know about. Without the help of these two, there was no way to gain an advantage over Noin Han in the information war. It could be considered that today the director was just unlucky. It was a coincidence not in his favor. Ram asked if his man was confused. The man said that he was mistaken from the beginning. The director thought that the person who kidnapped Zhang Zhang Chul and the detective were the most dangerous. However, the young man turned out to be a dark horse. Nin Han complained that he couldn't send a guy to Gagaki's hell, so it's time to invoke his own underworld. The director thought that the game wasn't over yet, and that young man couldn't foresee everything. He will judge him for his incompetence. Yu Nyung Han told Gagaka that he's giving him carte blanche. He can send all the guests to hell. The director told Gagaka to act quickly but carefully, and not to mess it up. Gagaka told his demon that they needed to put on a show again, and then they could escape. Gagaka said to let his demon turn into Yu Nyung Han. The demon turned into Yu Nyung Han and appeared in front of the pursuers. They started chasing him all over the building. Gagaka only had to send these persecutors to hell in secluded places. For example, he was able to send four people to hell at one time. The chief among the bandits said the target was seen near the lobby. He told the others to leave the guests and head there. The young man asked them if they had found Neong Han yet. The bandit said he was discovered in the lobby and he didn't need the young man anymore. So Xiongi was free. The young man wondered, why was Neong Han in the lobby? Why would he leave his bunker? What was the point? The guy realized something wasn't right. What's he up to? We have to be very careful. Suddenly, Yu Neong Han appeared beside the young man. Yu Neong Han and his demon Ram appeared in front of everyone. 
Yu Neong Han had always hated people who were above him. Demon Ram asked his man if he had a plan. Ram inquired why the man had come out of his hiding place. Who needs this unreasonable risk? The man said he went out to get rid of Yeom Sheungji. Ram inquired in what way is the person going to do this? Yu Neong Han showed his demon the key to the Hell Gate, making it clear how he wanted to get rid of the young man. Yu Nong Han said that unlike the others, he has the ability to predict the future, thanks to Ram. In matters of prediction, that young man is far more incompetent than he is. The guy told the demon not to dare question his decisions anymore, because it was extremely unprofessional of him. Yu Neong Han really hated those who looked down on him. This man had been growing up on the bottom since childhood. Yu Yun Han lived with his grandmother. He had no one else. The grandson and the grandmother loved each other. Grandma always praised and encouraged him. Grandma asked if her grandson must be hungry, so she brought him a baked potato. A grandmother asked her grandson what he wants to be when he grows up. The boy said when he became an adult, he would be a big boss. That was his dream. The child says that when he is an adult, he will make a big pile of money. The grandmother was proud of her grandson. The boy said he would buy a big house and eat bananas every day. He will also have his own dog. The kid said he would pay all his father's debts and then he wouldn't have to hide. The grandmother praised the child and said that money and fame are not the most important things in life. There are more important things. The woman said the time spent with her grandson was priceless to her. No amount of money can buy that. The grandmother clarified that there are many things in the world that money cannot buy. Even if the grandson becomes a big boss, some things he will not be able to buy. The wise woman said for the child to remember this. You can't lose your soul in the pursuit of wealth like his father. The boy still can't forget what his grandmother said to him in that little den. It's like those words are seared into his memory. One day my grandmother learned at a doctor's appointment that she had to report to the hospital immediately. It was tantamount to a sentence. The boy was shocked. He didn't know what to do now and where to get money for his grandmother's treatment. The boy tried his best to look after his grandmother. The woman was very ill. A child was crying as he watched his loved one die, and there was nothing he could do to help. After his grandmother died, all he had left were her ashes. The boy was billed to pay for the cremation of a loved one. The boy was unable to do so. The young man could even lose the urn containing his grandmother's ashes. In the end, the urn was smashed by the young man, left with nothing. When the boy grew up, he tried not to waste time in vain and study, to earn a lot of money, but he remembered his grandmother's words. Some things cannot be bought with money. A young man walks alone in the rain through the night city. A guy saw some old discarded stuff in an alley. The young man had no money, and without money he could not buy anything at all. Now Khan began to study. He decided to become famous. The young man wanted to climb to the top and tried his best. The young man always looked after himself. He despised incompetence. A young man once became a director of a large corporation. He remembered his grandmother and said that he had become a boss. The subordinate tearfully asks the young man to forgive him. He promises never to let his superior down again. Nong Han says not to touch him again. He doesn't want to deal with a mediocrity. The boy decided he would never go back to the bottom again. Better to die than to dishonor his father's name. Yu Neong Han hated incompetent people who held high positions because of their kinship with their bosses. He wanted to send such people to the furnace. One day, a demon named Ram encountered the young man. The demon said the man was competent enough. Ram asked if the young man wanted to literally send all those he hated to the fiery furnace and he told him about the key and the terms of the deal. Yu Neong Han, of course, agreed. He couldn't let people like him suffer anymore. Yum Seung Gi was walking in front of Yu Hyung Han's residence. Yu Hyung Han himself was behind him. The young man was very surprised. Wasn't Yu Neong Han just now in the lobby? Yu Neong Han told the young man that he dared to look down on him. That was his strategic mistake. The headmaster held out his hand with the key to the hell gate towards Syunga and said that he would burn him in the flames of his hell. The reason why Neong Han went out to Syungi was confidence. As long as there was a commotion around, he would get rid of Syungi. 
Then Yu Neong Han decided that he would send everyone else to the same place. The director was sure that Xiongi wouldn't be able to use his gate, because Xiongi's hell must be extremely non-universal. Xiongi didn't use his hell back then at Gagaki's house. At the hospital when they met in Detective Puck's room, the young man wasn't using his hell either. The young man didn't use his even today when he was in real danger. The young man didn't pull out his key even in very dangerous situations. Yu Nong Han suggested that this is a sign of the extreme non-universality of this hell. Yu Neong Han was certain that Yeom Xiongi had already committed the sin of incompetence. It was extremely reckless to attack the creator of hell without properly knowing his abilities. Yu Neong Han knew that he always made a rational decision. The principal passed judgment on the young man. He is fully guilty of his incompetence. But was that really the case? Was Yeom Xiongi really a sinner? Yu Neong Han began to have doubts. Is it a sin for Xiongi to be unable to foresee? The key didn't glow. Why not? Shouldn't this guy be losing out on competence at predicting the future? Yu Yun Han was outraged. Why isn't the key active? After all, the young man would have a hand in the future to kill him. Yu Neong Han shouted that he was the first to figure out the young man's plans. He's more competent. The guy said he can see the future. That's his skill. The young man kept puzzling over how to catch him. But now that he has come himself, Siungi can no longer smell death. Siungi said that Neong Han won't be able to destroy him. The guy can see every action he takes that could lead to his death. However, can a man who has contemplated murder be considered a murderer if he hasn't done it yet? The answer is no. After all, it hasn't happened yet. You can always change the future by changing at least one variable. Seungi continued, even if Yu Nyung Han saw his sin in the future, did he commit it in the present? After all, in the present, he had yet to fulfill the conditions of this sin. Just because Yu Yun Han knows how to use his ability doesn't mean anything, Min Han said after thinking for a moment that the young man was right. Yu Nyung Han admitted that it was the first time he'd been stumped. I have to admit my mistake. The young man agreed that he had become very arrogant and incompetent. It had ruined him. Yu Neong Han said that he doesn't care in this case. After all, his opponent's hell doesn't work either. Yeom Xiongi took out the key to the gate of hell. The key was glowing. Yu Neong Han was startled and surprised. Why did his key activate? It wasn't universal as much as possible. Yu Neong Han had distorted the future so that everything was turned upside down. Now Yu Yun Han is going to hell instead of Yom Xiongi. When Yu Yun Han saw his death, he began to distort the future and thus betrayed Yom Xiongi. The gates of hell opened. Yu Neong Han was terrified and tried to run away from that place. He screamed in fear. The principal shouted that he always makes a rational decision. Yu Yun Han outsmarted himself and betrayed Yeom Xiongi because he only did what was good for him. The young man said that his opponent's sin was inevitable. It was a matter of time. Betrayal is betrayal. The serpent of hell bound Yu Neong Han's arms and legs and plunged him into the abyss of hell. Looking at the already closed gate, the young man thought philosophically. Waves in the river, only ripples in the sea. The young man pondered. The fact that he hadn't killed the detective on the spot had finally brought him to this point. Demon Ram thought, this is the end of it. A thick fog of death enveloped him. As a result, Yum Seungi won in a confrontation against Yu Neong Han. Brahamurk said that Yeom Seungi is a pretty confident person. The demon reminded him that there were still a few more creators to get rid of. He held out his hand to the boy. Seungi said he's not overconfident at all. There's no need to think that way about him. The boy noted that he had been very scared from the moment they arrived at the party. He felt out of place. The young man recalled that when they had to enter the mansion, additional fears were added. It couldn't be called overconfidence. Shaking the demon's hand, Xiongi said that all this stress had taken a toll on him. He should get some rest and hang out by the computer. The boy said that no normal person could have handled this situation. Bramurk noticed that the young man is not completely normal. He is a special person. The guy continued, a normal person would have run away long ago and hid somewhere. The young man pulled himself together. 
said it wasn't the time to relax and decided the place needed to be cleaned up. Yoon Young Han's influential guests were still in the house. There were also a lot of Chaemu Jin gang members in the house, who didn't all disappear in Gagaki Hell. It was the perfect setup to activate Gagaki's Hell Gate and Inspector Park Sang Shik. Based on all these inputs, Yom Seungi decided to take matters into his own hands. The young man settled down in front of the CCTV screen and decided to start a cleanup day. The young man dialed the emergency number. He tried to pretend to be a victim. The guy said in a frightened voice that gangsters had broken into a social party. They're holding all the guests hostage. The emergency operator said they needed the address where the hostage taking took place. The police will definitely rescue them. The important thing is not to panic. Yeom Seungi called the police using a hoarse voice and gave the necessary address. The guy decided to call the police to settle things here. The creators are scattered throughout the mansion. If we let it go, they'll start killing each other and that'll create more problems. The police squad called in to free the hostages was already arriving on the scene. The police officers spread out around the perimeter. The young man realized that something had to be done about the bandit formation whose members were still in the mansion. The police officers, using the surprise factor, broke into the premises and took the bandits captive. The entire mansion was surrounded by police officers. Cars with flashing lights kept coming. Police officers armed with firearms took the bandits out one by one and put them in police cars. Among the detainees was a demon, who at this point was in a human body. The demon was handcuffed. This had never happened to him before. The demon realized that he needed to change his shell and move into the body of another person who could move around safely. The demon decided that for such a purpose, he would be suitable for one of the policemen who had arrived to free the hostages. The demon moved into this policeman and the policeman, having lost his identity, became a shell for this demon. Demon, the policeman decided to act and leave the place, in search of his man, Majin. The demon realized that something had gone wrong. That was why he couldn't fulfill his mission and deliver Yu Neung Han. The demon couldn't understand what the police were even doing here. What was their purpose in coming here? And he had to find Majun. Demon, the cop unhooked the machine gun, threw it away, and decided he would go in search of the car his man was in. Demon, the policeman, ran outside the mansion grounds. Yom Seungi, watching through CCTV cameras, noticed one of the police officers leaving the cordoned-off area. This seemed strange to him. The young man guessed what was going on. Seungi sends a message to Ho Min Jai saying that Neong Han is in hell. He also said that the demon Ma Jun was running towards them. The girl, upon hearing this news, decided to leave the car. She said if Nung Han was already in hell, she was leaving. She said goodbye to Ma Jun. Ho Min Jae said, thanks for the company. Maybe we'll meet again. The girl realized that she was completely out of time. She had to leave the area quickly so the demon wouldn't be able to detect her. The demon in the policeman's body found Majun's car and asked if the man was okay. Majun thanked her demon and said he was back very quickly. The girl was very interested in who this Baham was. Who could he be? Majun was amazed. Baham had eliminated the principal in such a crowd and none of her men had even noticed it. The girl decided that this man was extremely dangerous. Majun told the demon that there was nothing more for them to do here and they could get away before the police got here. The girl decided that she had underestimated this enemy, and now she will have to gather as much information about him as possible. Yom Seungi decided to destroy the evidence of the crime. It was necessary to destroy the office and the CCTV cameras along with the hard disks. The young man decided that the police must not know what had happened, otherwise they would put everyone on the wanted list. The guy mimicked the signs of a fire that was later extinguished. The only thing left to do is to join the crowd, which will be let out by the police. Brea Merck asked the young man if he was finished, or is there anything else to do? Gagaka also decided to hide in the crowd. He unnoticeably got lost among the people who were being let out by the police. Gagaka couldn't contact Neong Han. The gates of hell can't be opened while the police are here either. We must get out of here without being seen. Blend in with the crowd and disappear into the darkness. One of the policemen offered Gagaka a ride home. 
It must have been a very difficult day. Gagaka agreed and thanked the policeman. It was good for him. Gagaka settled into the back seats of the car and decided that he would be able to rest at his house soon. The police officer was watching the passenger in his rearview mirror. The passenger gave his address where he wanted to be taken. The policeman said he would deliver the passenger safely, and he could take it easy. Gagaka noticed that the police car was traveling in a different direction. Why are they driving out of town now? Gagaka saw in the mirror that the driver, it was the detective. He recognized him. Gagaka was frightened. He knew that this detective, one of Niun Han's allies. Gagaka thought they had decided to get rid of him while the director was not responding. So they're traitors. Gagaka noticed that the car was not traveling very fast. He figured he could jump out of the car at the corner. The driver, noticing that the passenger was nervous and holding on to the door handle, said that it was a police car, not a cab. So you can't just open the doors. So the passenger can sit there and be still. Gagaka was frightened and declared that he was about to open the gates of hell. The detective said he's willing to see what happens. A little later, the detective stated that Gagaka wouldn't succeed. Gagaka was even more frightened. The detective said that bluff about opening the gates of hell wouldn't work on him, and Gagaka's in no position to make threats. Inspector Pak was pretty sure that Gagaka could only use his hell in his places. The policeman knew he had nothing to fear in this vehicle. If you take the Gagaku out of his place, he will not be able to activate and use his hell gate key. The detective showed his key to the gates of hell and said that his key in this case was glowing. Inspector Park said that Gagaka has sent a lot of people to hell, and his conscience is bad. The inspector told Gagasa to sit still, or he would inhale the smell of the underworld. Pak hoped Gagaka would start answering questions. The policeman drove up to the hotel, near which Yom Shungi was already waiting for them. Shungi said he paid the cab driver twice as much money, so he got him here very quickly. And then he realized, speeding, that's against the law. The detective said he would be handing out gifts now, and took hold of the door handle of the car. The policeman opened the door and Gagaka jumped out and knelt down in front of the young man. He began to apologize. He said he had chosen the wrong side. Streamer says he'll do whatever they ask. He wants to be spared. Gagaka was surprised to see the young man. The director had told him that this young man was a detective's errand boy. Gagaka realized it was the other way around. It turned out that the policeman had been dancing to the young man's tune all along. Streamer realized that this young man had outplayed everyone. Now I see why Nyung Han disappeared. The director's corpse would have been found if the gangsters had destroyed him. Gagaka tried to comprehend the situation he was in now and to understand the danger he was in. Seungi said, as Gagaka can guess, Yu Nyung Han was sent to hell by him. Yom seung specifically asked aloud, what should he do with Yu Neung Han's henchmen now? Streamer said he has an offer. He'll take it if he's spared. Yom seung said if the one wants mercy, he has to prove his usefulness. Yom seung decided to use Gagaku, the creator who had recently targeted his life. The young man knew that Hel Gakaki was very good at defense, and it is unwise not to use it you could send anyone who invaded the creator's territory to hell. Comparatively speaking, it's like an automatic turret that eliminates intruders. Another very useful thing is Gagaki's demon ability, Jinky Johnny. The young man realized that using this ability could do a good job of disorienting the enemy. The young man decided that this ability could be used especially well as bait. Yeom Seungi thought that he would eventually deal with this Gagaka. However, he could be useful right now. An unknown demon was watching the grounds of the mansion from the roof of a neighboring building. He assumed it was already resolved, since the police had arrived. It was the archdemon Samama. Resting on a chaise lounge was Jane Doe, the owner of Hell. The demon asked her who she thought had won. The girl assumed that Nyung Han had been defeated. The demon was surprised she had said that the principal was a strong opponent. Why should he lose? The girl replied, if the principal had won, no one would have called the police because it would have attracted too much attention and that in turn caused a lot of questions and therefore problems. Jane Doe continued, if he wanted to hide the evidence, he would have called in a private company. Demon asked, 
So the gangsters won. Jane Doe said she wasn't sure. If the gangster had won, he would have just left with his boys, way before the police arrived, so he had to leave them behind. The girl said there had to be a third person. The demon praised the girl and said she was very smart. Samama so asked, so is this third one their next target? They only chase after strong guys after all. The girl offered to send him to hell before he confused their cards. A fat man wrapped in a blanket lies on the floor. The demon says he doesn't want to push. The demon added that sitting here, they are unlikely to win. They need to do something about it. It was archdemon Gordon Killius. Fatty said he can't take it anymore. Everyone's giving him a hard time. First it was Yu Yunhan. Then it was the bandits. The fat man cries and says he's been hurt very badly. There's not a living thing on him. The fat man is screaming that he's not going anywhere. He's going to lay low and eat by ordering home delivery. The fat man weepingly said that he had only signed the contract because he wanted to send all his fellow scoundrels to the scorcher. But he didn't sign up for all this. Gordon Killius was disappointed. Why had he contracted this loser? Suddenly someone rang the doorbell. The fat man thought it was a delivery. Throwing the blanket off the man said to leave the delivery on the doorstep. He walked cautiously to the door. The fat man opened the door in anticipation that he was about to get a delivery with food. A man noticed a child on his doorstep and a demon standing next to him. The child said hello to the man. It was Sung Min Wu, 10 years old, the owner of Hell. After Yu Neong Han's defeat, the media published the news that the director of a large corporation was missing. A director of a large corporation is currently a missing person. After the incident at the villa, his whereabouts are still unknown. There is a lull in the deadly game. Inspector Pak was doing official business at his workplace. Yom Syungi at his home, along with Gagaka, were having a blast playing computer games. Ho Min Jae was paying attention to herself. Sung Min Woo, like all children his age, attended school. Ma Jun took an active part in the affairs of her clan. Jane Doe was also idle in her hotel, and that was not surprising. After all, no one else posed a serious threat. Plus, with a large number of players, it's easy to run into an opponent. Not much time has passed since the game started. However, everyone has already begun to understand the rules of the game. If someone is hunted, they will soon be hunted. A literal stalemate situation has developed, which entailed this lull. Lucifer, looking at this picture, began to get bored. The struggle for survival had stopped. Lucifer's assistant, middle-rank demon De Miguel, asked his master, did he expect this? In multiplayer games, alliances are often formed. This is usually just an attempt to maintain a balance of power. Lucifer noticed that the deadly game he had participated in 700 years ago was not the same. There was a tension in those days that didn't let you catch your breath even for a second. There was relentless carnage. It was what Lucifer expected to see even now. Demigel suggested in such a case to make adjustments to the game and spice things up. Lucifer thought it was a good idea. We should diversify the existing rules somehow. Demigel advised Lucifer to summon the man who brought the game to a standstill to himself for a conversation. Demigel showed the boss the young man and said it was him. This is the young man who became the center of the alliance. After a long jog, the young man was tired. He had shortness of breath. The demon followed him all the way. It was hard on him too. Brahamurk said that the young man should not have run. Shungi said that when facing a face-to-face -face creator, good stamina is never unnecessary. The young man added, he doesn't know what opponents he will face in the future. So for the time being, training won't hurt. The boy said it was the best thing he could do for today. The demon was satisfied and said that he had not chosen this young man for nothing. Yelm Syungi asked Brahamurk how things were going in hell. Did any of the people he sent to hell try to get out? The demon replied, Surely there were those who wanted to get out of there, but there is no going back from there. Brahamurk added, Some of them have not given up hope yet, but they and the young man know that this hope is in vain. The hell that Sungi created only works one way. Brahamurk added that no one is trying to kill the young man yet. Therefore, he has nothing to worry about. The demon said he had one question. How long is the young man going to play allies? Brahamurk reminded them that they were already in the middle of the game. 
this alliance won't last too long. The demon warned that if the young man dragged on, it would be much harder to get rid of the ballast later on. The demon hinted that it might happen that his allies would decide to deal with him first. For example, Ho Min Jae will apologize to the young man and activate his key. Inspector Pak will say, nothing personal and can also activate his key. The young man replied, so that was his way. He promised Bramark that he would never let him down. The demon replied that he believed the man. He just needed to make sure he didn't ruin everything with his human feelings. Suddenly, the demon Demigel appeared in front of Brahamark, greeted his colleague. Demigol turned to the young man and said that this appeared to be Brahamark's favorite, Mr. Yom. Yom Syungi said hello to the demon and looked questioningly at Brahamark. He was surprised by this encounter. Demigol said human names drive him crazy. Brahamark asked, what is Demigel doing here? Singi asked. Does Brahamark really know him? Brahamark said it's Lucifer's assistant and his successor. The young man was frightened. What did he want? Brahamark read the message that Demigel had delivered to him and said, Not bad. Lucifer is extremely capricious. At any moment he can change the rules. The young man, hearing the word capricious, became very upset. It could mean something bad. The young man turned to Demigel and asked if Lucifer wanted to change the rules. Demigel said the young man was very guessing. The demon said he had appeared here to escort the young man to Lucifer. Syungi was even more surprised. Lucifer said that he was very happy to see the young man in front of him. Also, the boss said hello to Brahamark. Lucifer added that he was very pleased to welcome the young man into his humble abode. Yom Syungi was very tense. He realized that he couldn't expect anything good from such a meeting, but he was not prepared for this. Lucifer turned to Brahamark and said he knew he was talented. But his sense of genius was beyond Lucifer's expectations. This man was able to unite four of the remaining seven into an alliance. Lucifer added, this young man was able to straighten out the strongest opponent. Brahamark said, his master is too kind. They are just thoroughly enjoying the games that Lucifer has perfectly organized. Lucifer added that he didn't take Brahamark's words as a compliment. Lucifer explained that the human and Brahamark were getting in the way of his fun. He doesn't like a lull like this. The demon shouted that he was counting on a bloody spectacle. They arranged alliances and alliances. This is kindergarten. Yom Sungi thought that his last day had come. Brahamark began to doubt his carefree future. Lucifer stepped closer to the couple. The young man's knees trembled. Brahamark was afraid to lift his head. Lucifer, turning to Yom Sungi, announced that he could just replace the man. Lucifer then added, however, that wouldn't be fair. They are playing too cautiously. Although it wasn't against the rules, they had upset him. The main dungeon boss said, so he wants to give this couple a little punishment. Lucifer said the assignment is to get rid of one of your allies, at your discretion. Lucifer said that he gives exactly one week to complete this task. Yom Shungi experienced a state of shock. He must get rid of one of his two allies. He realized that it would have to happen someday. The young man found himself unprepared for it. The next emotion that visited the young man was indignation. How could this be? The young man shouted that it was unfair. After all, he had not broken any rules. Why should he be treated so cruelly? Brahamark tells the man to watch his tongue. Before him is the Prince of Darkness. It is Lucifer himself. There is no one more terrible than him. You should be in awe of him, not talk to him that way. Xiongi decided to change the tone, but not the subject. The young man turned to the Lucifer once more. He hadn't broken anything. This sounds more like the whim of a small child. Why would he do this will? Lucifer said that the young man should temper his ardor. But he's right. Lucifer repeated, The young man is only right in that this is his personal whim. This whole game is one big whim. Lucifer said the terms are very simple. Either the young man plays by his rules, or he will simply replace him with another man. And the game continues without him. Lucifer clarified, No one asks the young man his wishes, whether he wants to kill his ally or not. It is man's responsibility to choose whom he will destroy. Lucifer said, he is tired of having these unnecessary conversations. The man goes back and chooses. 
this conversation is over. Finally, Lucifer tells Bramark not to mess up his game anymore. He knows what we're talking about. In the next instant, Brahamark and Yeom Syungi were back on the surface of the earth, in the same place they had disappeared from. The young man looked at his hand and saw some numbers. He realized that Lucifer had set a timer on him, and the countdown began. Brahamark said things are bad now, and that report is a separate story. Yeom Syungi was in serious trouble, and he was clearly aware of it. Ho Min Jae and Park Sang Shik, the young man knew he would have to take them out someday. The young man said he was sorry, but he had no other choice. The young man didn't think it would happen soon enough. The boy entered Detective Park's house, where he had been living for some time. In his heart, Yeom Sungi cried out that it wasn't fair. It shouldn't be like this. The young man turned to his demon and said he had a question. Braham Merck listened attentively. The boy asked the demon which of the two was more useful. The young man clarified that he was talking about demons. The young man said he wanted to ask about Lucifer in particular. Brahamark was frightened. Why would the young man want Lucifer? Yeom Syungi inquired how Lucifer became the ruler of the underworld. The young man also asked if Brahamark could take Lucifer's place. Brahamark began his story. Lucifer had once been an archdemon just like him. There was nothing unusual about that. One day long ago, he signed a contract with a man named Dante. Then still young Lucifer turned to this man. The demon asked, why doesn't this man contract with him to build hell? Lucifer said he didn't care what hell was like, and man can use it any way he wants. Lucifer added, if a man builds a perfect hell, it will be all his own. And Lucifer showed the key to the gates of hell. Dante created an inferno of heresy. It was a masterpiece. Never has hell been filled with the screams and shrieks of so many people. No one has ever seen a better underworld. The architecture, the versatility, the flavor. Hell reflected the power of the demon who owned it. Lucifer dreamed in a few years of becoming the full master of the underworld. In an instant, Lucifer gained unprecedented power that helped him ascend to the infernal throne. Yeom Syungi interrupted the narrator. Then what happened to Dante? Brahamark said that second, Dante was given eternal life as a reward. The young man immediately interrupted the demon. So Dante, the creator of hell, is still alive. The demon replied, that's unlikely, but it's possible. The young man began to speculate, what would happen if you sent Dante to hell? What would happen to Lucifer in that case? There is a church service in the central cathedral. The priest says that everyone must therefore believe in him. The priest continues, no one should doubt the teachings of the Lord God. If anyone doubts, he will go to hell. The priest's name is Dante, creator of heresy hell. Brahamark said if you defeat Dante, who has signed a contract with Lucifer, the devil will disappear. The demon added, but that was just a guess. Dealing with Lucifer, the prince of hell himself, was not easy. Brahamark advised the young man, better let him choose a victim. Then he would continue the game and win. The young man lowered his head in thought. The demon said it was the best strategy for the moment. Yeom Syungi said, no. Brahamark probably didn't understand anything. Young asked what Brahamark would do if Lucifer changed the rules again. The guy said these rules were made for a reason. They were made to keep the game going. The young man didn't like that Lucifer decided to push him around. It's an unfair interference. Syungi said that in the future, Lucifer will try his best to stick him. He wants the young man to expose himself, and then his chances of making it to the finals will be zero. The demon said it all made sense to him now. Why didn't he realize it before? Brahamark said that Lucifer is very cunning. Under the guise of a game, he decided to get rid of all the high-ranking demons. Brahamark was outraged. Now Lucifer was brazenly preventing his man from becoming a winner he would again pull more than one trick in the future. The demon inquired of the young man. Maybe he wants to organize a coup from hell and change the government. The young man said if they won, the survival rate would be 100%. Man and demon struck hands. Yeom Syungi said they couldn't act blindly. The young man asked Brahamark to learn more about Lucifer and Dante. The guy needed to find out if Lucifer was really that omnipotent. Brahamark immediately replied, Lucifer is omnipotent. He is, after all, the ruler of hell. 
The young man said he didn't mean hell. How omnipotent is Lucifer here on Earth? The young man wonders if Lucifer will be able to kill the young man here on Earth with a snap of his fingers, or at least cripple him. Bramerk admitted that he didn't know that. Demons don't usually interfere with human life. That's why demons usually use possession, sweet speeches, and contracts. That's why Lucifer summoned the young man to himself. Hell is his sphere of influence. There he is like God. The young man remembered that the demon had once threatened that he could devour the young man's soul. The demon had said he was bluffing. He had to motivate the young man somehow. The boy was disappointed. What else could he expect from a demon? Bramerk suggested changing the topics of conversation. Singy said he has a second question. He believes Lucifer has the ability to observe them. However, can he hear them? Bramerk questioned, though he said Lucifer was watching them. Brahamurk added that Lucifer is assisted in this by the lower demons of Sadius. They are called the Psi. They are connected to the underworld. These lower demons broadcast everything they see to Lucifer. They certainly can't transmit sounds. The demon was finished, or he and the young man wouldn't be talking anymore. From this story, the boy concluded that it was almost impossible to kill him directly. All he had to do was to stay out of the draft circle. He also noted to himself that Lucifer could see them, but not hear them. If he pretended that they were dancing to his tune, there was a chance that he wouldn't suspect anything. The boy decided he could turn the game around. All that's left is to convince the others to join him. Seungi sent a message to his friends that he would have a meeting. The young men arrived at the appointed time. The girl on the doorstep asked if Seungi had decided to celebrate his victory over Neong Han. Park thought something serious had happened. Gagaka appeared on the doorstep and gladly took the guests. Ho Min Jae wondered, where did Seungi get this houseboy from? The girl was angry. Had the young man made a contract with Gagaka without telling them anything about it? The boy said he would explain everything. Seungi knew that the quickest way to convince people was to tell it like it was. He warned them to leave all their questions for later. If they started interrupting him, he wouldn't be able to do it in one night. The first question was from Ho Min Jae. What should they worry about? Park covered her mouth with her hand. The inspector said the girl would ask her questions later. The young man was at a loss. He didn't know where to begin. He didn't want to shock his listeners too much. In order to gain true allies, Yom Seonggi decided to reveal his cards. He told about his true hell. The hell of betrayal was good. Seonggi also talked about how he dealt with Niun Han and poached Gagaku. Trailing off, the young man recounted what Lucifer had ordered him to do. The listeners were dumbfounded. They could not utter a word. The young man said that's all he wanted to tell them. Now they know the whole story, and they can ask questions. Ho Min Jae was the first to speak. She immediately gave the young man a right hook. The girl was outraged. Could it be that everything he had told her before was a lie? The girl looked at Gagaka with anger and said, so he is a defector. Gagaka, hiding from the blow, said his sister was right. The girl repeated that his true sin was not trespassing, but betrayal. Ho Min Jae slapped the young man again. He made hell for himself, you traitor. Gagaka told the inspector if he didn't intervene, Seungi's girlfriend would be driven into the ground. The inspector agreed and took the girl's hand, asked her to calm down. It wouldn't do anyone any good. Puck told the girl to stop and stop acting like a child. We must keep cool and calm. Ho Min Jae kept saying, why doesn't the investigator care? The young man used them. He can beat him up too. The girl continued. They risked their lives to get information for him. And he'd been lying to them the whole time. Park said that Yaom Seungi was the one who saved her from the killer. Whatever his goals were, he risked his life to save the girl. Puck continued, even now, the young man is going against Lucifer to save them. The investigator added, although all of this the young man might not have done, Seungi could have safely sent any of them to hell. Puck asked why the young man wanted all this. What is his gain? The young man, without turning to his interlocutors, said, He just doesn't want to kill them. The guy added that they don't deserve to suffer in his hell. They should all live. The young men were touched by the young man's reply. There was room for sentimentality. Singi said, 
Lucifer has a weakness. It's Dante, the creator of his hell. By getting rid of him, they would get rid of the Prince of Darkness. The young man offered to work together to defeat him. Gagaka asked if he's in the game too, right? You can count on him. The young men asked what the plan would be. Siungi can't attack Dante without a plan. The young man said before talking about Dante, he wanted to point out two things. The young man reminded them that they were still in a deadly game. No matter how good their plan was, and even if they found Dante, they would still be in danger. There are still other creators that can attack them at any time. This is something to keep in mind at all times. Also, the guy warned everyone that Lucifer is always watching them, so they must continue to play their roles. In other words, they must not give themselves away. Ho Min Jae asked the question again, interrupting the young man. How on earth are they going to defeat Lucifer? The other creators will constantly get in the way, and all of this in front of Lucifer's eyes. Shungi said there was an option where they could kill two birds with one stone. The young man suggested one of them would look for Dante, the rest of them would be busy finding the remaining users and neutralizing them. Junosha finished. They should remove the unnecessary variables and focus on Lucifer. Ho Min Jae said, okay, but what should they do about surveillance? Shungi said if they made a show out of confronting these two, they could distract Lucifer from their true intentions. The young man finished as far as he understood from the conversation, Lucifer desires bread and spectacle. By fighting the remaining two, they will not only get rid of any unnecessary threats, but also buy time to find Dante. The young man said that Ho Min Jae will play the lead role. She'll find Dante for them. The boy turned to Gagaka. He's in the game too. He'll do what he does best. Would make great bait for other creators. Seungi asked how they liked his plan. Inspector Pak said it was theoretically possible. As for practice, he is not sure. Gagaka stated he will do whatever they tell him to do if it was within his power. Ho Min Jae said she remembers that the young man saved her, so she will trust him this time too. Yeom Seungi really decided to stand up to Lucifer. Let's have a hell of a coup. Suddenly, the demon Gagaki appeared and asked what they were up to. Don't people want to ask their opinion first? The rest of the demons showed up and indignantly declared that this was some kind of outrage. People must be out of their minds. How can they rebel against Lucifer? One of the demons stated that the stakes were very high. All their lives were at stake. Demon Gagaki said he wasn't the only one who thought so. People have clearly lost their minds. Brahamurk intervened in the conversation. He moved the boy aside and said that he would take care of it himself. Brahamurk said, since they are archidemons, human logic would be difficult for them to understand. He will now explain everything to them in a language they can understand. The subscriber told Brahamurk that there is no logic to explain here. It is a suicide plan. Brahamurk added that Lucifer doesn't care about demons or his own rules. Don't they realize that? Brahamurk explained that this game is designed to choose the best hell for a new generation of sinners. Also to pit the Archidemons against each other in order to get rid of their rivals to the throne. Only one will survive. Demon Gagaki asked what would happen if his man survived. Gagaka, seeing the key to the hell gate in Singa's hands, cried out in fear. Brahamurk said if anyone survives, it certainly won't be this man. Demon Siungi said that they still have a chance to step out of Lucifer's shadow and stay alive. Don't they want to take advantage of that? Don't they want to dance to the devil's tune so that, in the end, he will get rid of them as useless trash? Brahamurk reminded them that Lucifer had stayed in power for too long, and this was his thanks for all the sacrifices they had made in his name. Brahamurk reminded him that they were all higher demons. They must be more judicious than humans. Humans and demons looked at each other in silence. The demon remarked that this was the first coup in the history of hell. The chances of success seemed slim to none. However, the Brahamurka man always won the tug of war, even in a losing situation. The demon walked up to the young man and told him that he would have to perform a miracle again. He simply had no other choice. The coup operation begins to take shape and the Yeom Seungi alliance prepares for full-scale war. 
The young man began renting hotels around the city using his father's cash. The conditions were two people rent a room for seven days. That's really necessary. They tried to look like couples, and then they were given double rooms. On the sign-in sheet, Shungi put his name and Gagaki's name on the same line. It was a trap of sorts, setting up a safe zone. The young man explained, if suddenly a stalker were to corner someone, one would have to get into one of these hotels. Get to that hotel where Gagaka is waiting and unleash invasion hell. This trap was created to lure one of the creators into it. That's why Yaom Seungi focused on finding them. Of the remaining three opponents, there was only the possibility of finding only one quickly. Seungi decided to rely on Detective Park for this matter. Seungi reminded Park of the bandits who had been at the mansion. He asked me to find out who was behind them. Some of them are under arrest right now. Maybe they could tell us something if they were interrogated. Ho Min Jae showed the portrait she had quickly sketched. It might come in handy. Detective Park showed up at the cell of the gangsters who were at the mansion of Neong Han. He blackmailed them and tried to get them to cooperate. Seungi said it was also necessary to carefully check the arrival sheet at the airport. We need to find the foreigner that Ho Min Jae accidentally found. The girl remembered that it was three days before Gagaki's abduction. It was 2 p.m. on the airport clock. The girl sketched a drawing and said that the lady had a suitcase like that. If they had access to video cameras, they could track where she was staying and what kind of passport she had. Seungi asked Inspector Pak if he could arrange all this. The inspector replied that using his official position, he thought he could get all this information. The inspector, using his official position, requested video surveillance footage at the airport. He was told that he should not take any photos or video recordings. The inspector saw the necessary recordings and was able to record the owner of the suitcase. The date and time of the videotape matched. The policeman discreetly took some photos. It was against the law. The detective thanked him for his services and said it was a pleasure doing business with him. In the end, the young men were able to find all but one of the creators. Inspector Park played an indispensable role in this case. The final touch in Xiunga's plan was to create an environment where Ho Min Jae could learn about Dante. The girl arrived at the hotel and said she would be here for seven days. Hotel security was excellent. This could have been a good alibi for them. The girl wondered where the young man had gotten so much money. Had he robbed a bank? The boy said he had money for exactly seven days. Then the girl would have to move out. The young man remarked that there will be necessary arrangements. There is a security room downstairs that will not let anyone but residents through. Security standing around the clock. The elevator won't go up to the penthouse without the key, which is a plastic card. Even if someone could sneak in, there would be two bodyguards waiting for them on the floor. The young man bidding the girl farewell said that she should just focus on finding Dante and not worry about the other creators. The girl thanked and wondered if she and the detective could manage without her. She didn't want to lose them. The young man, smiling, told the girl not to be afraid. They would be a brilliant success, so bright that it will blind Lucifer and he will not notice all their machinations. The guy wondered, did the girl really think that he could lose to someone? After all, he even got rid of Yu Yun Han. The young man reminded the girl once more to put all anxious thoughts aside and focus on finding Dante. Singi thought, all they currently knew was that Dante had created a hell of unbelief and that most likely his work is related to that sin. Ho Men Jae decided to start with a keyword search on the internet. If his hell is a hell of unbelief, most likely his job is related to religion. It could be a high-ranking pastor or priest. The girl thought, if you study Dante's life, you can guess where he might have stayed. She might have to reread the poem. As the young man left the hotel, he wondered if he was doing the right thing. He still had doubts. The more they trust him, the heavier the burden of responsibility becomes. Each time, it becomes more and more difficult to keep his composure. In any case, the young man knew it was too late to change anything. The first step had already been taken. One evening, Che Majun stayed late in her office. The girl made a phone call. Majun asked her demon how far did he climb. Demon said he's now the police commissioner of the Western District, just like Majung wanted. In theory, 
The ability of this demon allows you to take control of people with great power. In order to do this, you need to move into the body of the right person. There was some noise in the police commissioner's office. The subordinates became alarmed. They rushed into the office to help their superior. The subordinates asked what was happening to the commissioner. The demon in the commissioner's body said it was under control and ordered his subordinates to remove the victim. Che Mu Jin, knowing her demon's ability, did not abuse this ability. She was acting extremely cautious. The reason was because she was thinking about life after this deadly game. Mu Jin contacted the police commissioner of the Western District. She was answered by Cherubimbo, her demon. Cherubimbo's ability was unfair, but it gave Mu Jin a huge advantage. However, this ability leaves a lot of traces behind. If Cherubimbo is caught, the world will never be the same. There has been a lot of news in the press about high-ranking officials fainting en masse and talking nonsense. Mu Jin used possession in such a way that no one would suspect the existence of hell and demons. Mu Jin doubted that now that her organization was so badly destroyed, she would be able to survive this deadly game and emerge victorious. Mu Jin told Cherubimbo that it was already dangerous to go higher. They must find all the creators using this position. They won't have any other cards in their hands yet. The police commissioner said he has accepted the information and would do his best to do what he could. Mu Jin added, she has another big request. Cherubimba must be sure to put her in prison. Mu Jin wanted to use the demon's possession not only to find the creators, but also to build an impregnable fortress for herself. The police commissioner ordered his subordinate to make the prisoner as comfortable as possible. She must be isolated from the other prisoners. This woman is a particularly dangerous criminal. She must be handled with the utmost care. Mu Jin chose a place that is always under police surveillance and inaccessible to the general public. The girl realized that 24 hours a day, there would be cops everywhere. And this was the safest place to be. Not even that guy with the weird name Baham could get to her here. Mu Jin knew that now all she had to do was wait for Cherubimbo to find the others and deal with them. The police commissioner of the Western District reported at a staff meeting that recently there have been more and more reports of missing persons in the vicinity of the city. Therefore, their headquarters has taken the initiative to solve these disappearance cases. The police commissioner said he's giving his men carte blanche. He wants them to find everyone who's missing. He personally wants to be in the loop. The police commissioner said we should put current assignments aside and focus on the missing persons. It's his personal order, and he takes full responsibility. Police officers, after this meeting, wondered why their chief paid such great attention to solving these crimes. Carabimbo thought that no matter how much he studied human speech, it was still bad. I wondered if his subordinates could do it in one week. Che Mu Jin hid herself in a fortress surrounded by dozens of policemen. Here she could relax a little and think less about her safety. Cherubimbo used the full power of his Western Police District to find the creators of hell. Mu Jin enacted a plan that combined spear and shield. The girl thought she had it all figured out. However, there is always a margin of error in any plan that can't be anticipated. That margin of error from a perfect plan can make a perfect trap. It's just that Che Mu Jin didn't consider one factor. One of the creators was a policeman. Mu Jin didn't know that. Inspector Park met a policeman from another neighborhood at his station. His colleague explained that, out of the blue, the commissioner of the Western Division decided to put all his forces into the search for missing persons. Inspector Park was wary. He thought it was more than a coincidence. We have to look into it. In one of the prisoner cells, Puck discovered a girl who had recently joined them. She had no idea that one of the guards in her fortress would be an ally of the great and terrible Baham. The policeman was once again surprised. It was the same face in the portrait drawn by Ho Min Jae. The inspector asked the guard who was the woman sitting alone in the detention center. The guard replied that she was locked up for tax manipulation or something like that said she was a prime suspect, and she'd be watched closely. The inspector asked whose order it was. Thus, he wanted to know who in the police force was behind it. 
A colleague said the order was given by the Western District Commissioner himself. A co-worker asked why Puck was interested in her. Maybe they knew each other. Puck replied that it was strange for him to see a frail, disabled girl in the detention center. Inspector Park called Sungi and said he found her. It was pure chance that helped him. Seungi asked who they were talking about. Park explained he was talking about the girl, the head of the gang, who had been hiding from them for a long time. Inspector Park clarified that the girl was now in a temporary detention center. Yelm Seungi was interested in this information and wanted to see this particular suspect. The two young men came to the police station together. The officer on duty asked why Inspector Park had come back. Park said he forgot to leave something behind. The inspector suggested that his colleague go out for a smoke and talk about everything. The colleague agreed. The duty officer asked who the young man was. Pak said he was a new trainee. Inspector Pak told the newcomer to stay here and keep an eye on things, because you need to keep an eye on the prisoners. The policeman went out into the street. The officer on duty on the road was grumbling something. Shungi thought that so far, everything was going according to plan. The young man walked up to the camera and asked the girl. She probably thought she was the smartest. The girl was wary. The young man continued and said she had a good plan. To use her demon to take over and use the power to shield herself from the creators of hell. It was pretty good. Yom Seungi said, smiling, that the girl had overlooked something. He asked if she was well-fed, by the way. Mujin was very frightened. She remembered that voice. The young man said his name was Behum, and he had already talked to a girl the other day. Mujin was defenseless now, because she was separated from her demon. Cherubimbo was always protective of his ward. She was behind him like a stone wall. This was different. Everything changed when Mujin locked herself behind bars. The girl had cut off the last escape route, and this isolation could be critical for her. The girl began to doubt, had she read into something? In fact, her plan was perfect. She was just unlucky. Mu Jin couldn't have known that one of the creators, Park Sang Shik, was a police officer. Nor could Mu Jin have known that Park was an ally of Yeom Seungi. The girl also couldn't even guess that these two creators would come to this particular branch. Perhaps it was fate. Perhaps it was just chance. Yeom Seungi showed the girl the activated key of the Hell Gate. What Mu Jin was sure of was that this was a game of survival, and if you're unlucky, you have to die. Mu Jin was very frightened when she saw the key in the young man's hands. The young man was pleased with himself. His rival had fallen for this false key. The guy printed this key on a 3D printer and stuck an LED inside. It looked kind of gross, but fear is great. The young man who made this fake was not sure of success, but he had nothing to lose. He decided to give it a try, whether she'd notice. Mu Jin, seeing this activated key, was terribly frightened. She didn't want to go to hell. It was better to die than to go there. The woman in fear decided to bite off her tongue and die of blood loss. Yom Seungi stopped her at the last moment. The guy said he wasn't going to open the gate. Mu Jin tearfully asked, what does that mean? She had a little hope. The young man said that he didn't want to barter with such players. The boy asked, can the Mujin demon move into people's bodies? Mujin thought it was not surprising. The fact that the young man knew Karobimbo's ability. During the battle with Yu Neong Han, the demon had often used his ability. The boy asked the girl to elaborate on this demon's ability. Mujin asked why she needed to know. The young man phrased the question more specifically. What are the conditions for using the ability? And how many times has she already used the possession? At that, the boy extended his hand with the glowing key in the girl's direction. Mujin explained, the condition is the possessed body must touch the next host. Only one body can be possessed at a time. The ability takes one day to recharge. The more often the ability is used, the weaker the effect of possession. The girl added that there was no limit to the number of uses. The young man thought it was the most versatile demonic ability he had ever seen. The guy thought that with this ability, he could safely enter the big leagues, gaining access to all the classified data and resources of many governments. 
With this ability, one can easily find the remaining two creators of hell. Perhaps they can also get a glimpse of Dante. The young man decided that now he must have another relationship with this creature of hell. The guy crouched down in front of the girl's camera and tossed the key to the gates of hell aside, making it clear that he wanted to have a different conversation. The young man wondered how the girl had gotten into these hunger games. Why didn't she have a normal life? Mujin admitted she didn't want her hell to go away. The guy asked, does she have someone important in there? The girl confesses that she has imprisoned her own father in her hell. Because of his fault, she is in the chair almost all her life. Yoram Syungi thought, what a coincidence. His father is also in his inferno. The young man said he didn't want to let his father out of there either. But things are different now. Syungi confessed that he has people he wants to protect, and he doesn't want to kill anymore. Mujin, looking at the key, said that she thought the young man didn't care about anyone. That's the point of the game after all, to kill. It's either you or you. The young man, after thinking about it, said, he wants to confess this game can be ended without killing each other, at the same time saving everyone's hell. The young man inquired in that case, would the girl be willing to help them? Mujin questioned if such a way really existed. Yelm Seungi decided to talk about his mini-game in a death game that the young man designed himself. The young man shared that he is currently searching for Dante and explained what it was for. Mujin admitted that it sounds like a plan, but the risks were too high. The girl nervously asked, what if they don't succeed? What guarantees do they have? The guy replied that if they made a mistake, they'd be boiling in a common cauldron at Lucifer's place in hell. Mujin shouted that in that case, she doesn't agree. She doesn't want to take that much risk. The guy reminded me that the girl has an alternative. It's his hell, right now. That's her choice. The guy clarified, if she decided to betray them at some point, she'd have a straight ticket to the underworld. Singi said that even if she succeeded in killing them, Lucifer would still fry her. The only way to escape the frying pan is to kill Dante. He hopes she realizes that. Mu Jin was pissed off that the young man was threatening her. Though it really is a life-saving strawman, the girl realized that she had no other choice. Mu Jin says the guy won. She joins their team. This time, the chess game was won by Xiongi. When the policeman returned after a smoke break, the young man was still in the same place where they had left him. The officer on duty did not suspect anything. The policeman said their goodbyes and Inspector Pak and the young man left the station. Xiongi said that as soon as Che Mu Jin knows anything about the other creators, she will contact them. Now they can use Karu Bimbo's ability. Therefore, finding the creators would be much easier now. Inspector Park said it's very good information. Now they have another ally, who has a demon with a useful option. The young man thought they now had a full house. There are five people in the team. Xiongi said he gave Mu Jin a phone that only works for incoming calls to avoid Lucifer's suspicion. Inspector Park said that the guy will now control this girl remotely. Young said that while they are looking for other creators, they could use a police commissioner. The boy realized that to find Dante, they'd need bigger fish, the kind of fish that would allow them to use spies overseas. Yom Syungi, enthusiastic about his project, said that they still have a lot of work to do. There is no time to waste. Che Mu Jin got out of detention and went to her office. This time, she was unaccompanied by her cherubimbo. Cherubimbo, using his official position, took some actions at Yeom Syungi's request. The Western District Police Commissioner has put Jane Doe on the criminal wanted list. It's all over the news now. Jane Doe was charged with distribution of narcotics by a foreign person. That's the article under which she was wanted. The problem of drugs is a very serious issue for modern society. This is a very serious article. Being a drug dealer, that's a long time. If the drug dealer turns out to be a foreigner, it is even more aggravating. A man, after reading information about a wanted felon, called his deputy. The man said he was a member of the National Assembly who used to be a detective, but he had never encountered anything so egregious until now. The man has ordered this information to be sent to all police stations. We have to find this criminal, no matter what. At the police station, the chief gives an order to his subordinates. 
They have to put all their business on hold. The order came from above. It's urgent to catch this criminal. The detectives have to work overtime, undercover, using their sources of information. The most important thing is to get this girl. There's a department-wide reward for catching her. There were at least a hundred detectives involved in the Jane Doe hunt. They even searched cars on the road. Detectives were interested in her travel history. The police were interested in financial matters, the settlement and movement of money on bank cards. Detectives were checking hotel records. The entire city police department was on Jane Doe's trail. The capture of the criminal was considered a matter of days. At some point, the young man received information on his phone that a foreign woman had been spotted. She was heading towards her hotel. The guy thought she was busted. Bad luck for the foreigner, he thought. The young man sent a message to the demon, the police commissioner. The message contained an order that this foreign woman be arrested. The police commissioner ordered his subordinates to act and use all their resources. They were prepared for the possibility that the perpetrator might resist. The subordinates, having received the order, decided to move towards the hotel in order to fulfill this assignment. Detectives already had an arrest warrant for Jane Doe. The only thing left for the girl to do was to appear in plain sight. Police raided the hotel room where the suspect was staying. They said that Jane Doe was arrested on suspicion of possession and distribution of drugs. The girl, hearing this, thought there had been some misunderstanding. What kind of drugs could she be talking about? She didn't even know what it was. The policeman continued, the suspect has the right to remain silent. Anything she says can be used against her in court. The girl has the right to have a lawyer present during the interrogation. Jane Doe is handcuffed. If she cannot pay for a lawyer, one will be provided for her by the state, the girl was thinking. An arrest warrant can't come out of nowhere. It's the creator's handiwork. The girl thought that his demon's ability was probably used, or one of the creators holds a very high position in the state. Jane Doe tried to remain calm. She was ready to play the game. First, it was necessary to solve the problem that had been created. The girl summoned her summon demon. The cops were making a lot of noise. They thought the girl was drugged. We have to be very careful with her. Jane Doe saw the key to the hell gate lying on the bed and rushed to it. Sumama was playing along at the same time. The demon was trying to make a mess of the hotel room to make it easier for the girl to get the key in the chaos. Archidemon Sumama's ability was very unique. Sumama had the ability to always get out of a desperate situation. The demon's trick was that Sumama could enhance some characteristics while limiting others. Creatures are limited by the rules. The maximum radius of application of the hell gate is eight meters. The maximum number of people, that's eight. Also importantly, the creator must recognize that the other person has committed the sin of the hell he created. If at least one of these points is not fulfilled, the gates will not open. However, Sumama's unique ability is that the demon can change these rules. Sumama shouted that he was about to help. The girl grabbed the key and pointed it in the direction of the oncoming police officers. Sumama did his best and the distance from 8 meters was limited to 2 meters. The archidemon made it so that the number of men was reinforced from 8 to 14. The girl thought that the hell of ignorance must be opening up. The police officers don't know anything about her. They don't even know why their superiors are asking them to arrest her. The girl pointed the activated key towards the policeman. The policeman shouted in fright what was going on. The girl apologized and said that she was sending them to the furnace. The gates of hell appeared. They opened. A black demonic cloud burst forth to engulf the new inhabitants. The policemen shouted in fear and shivered, but there was nothing they could do. Everyone was sent to the other side of the gate. After the current problem was solved, Jane Doe collapsed exhausted on the bed. She needed to think things over and calm down. The archdemon, pleased with the addition to his inferno, said, not badly played, and praised his partner. Jane Doe decided she had to leave right away because the police might send in new officers. The girl, in her haste to pack, decided she would have to exit through the parking lot. Jane Doe decided that after she could change her dislocation, it would be necessary to find out who had decided to set the police on her. 
The young man received information on his phone that all 14 police officers had disappeared. Perhaps it was the gates of hell that had worked. The boy was stunned by this information. This girl should be taken much more seriously. This is a dangerous opponent. The young man tapped into the security cameras of the hotel Jane Doe was in. The young man watched the tape and saw a flash of light coming from that room. There was no doubt about it. It was the gates of hell. The young man wondered, how could she lock up 14 people at once? The young man remembered that even Detective Puck's notebook listed eight people. Something didn't add up. Shungi speculated that it was probably a demon's ability. Brea Merck asked what the man was thinking of doing. The news that 14 policemen were missing at once would resonate in the community. They might be exposed. The young man said that wasn't out of the question either, but it could play into their hands. Yom Shungi contacted the police commissioner. The young man said he had an important message. The demon said the young man must be out of his mind. After hearing that the young man wanted to make a press release, Yeom Syungi said he knows what he's doing. A police commissioner should do what he is told to do. The police commissioner can tell you that this happens a lot when dealing with drug cartels. No cause has been determined, but the police are trying to figure things out from surveillance cameras. The police commissioner can come up with the headline himself. The demon asked, if they looked at the security cameras, wouldn't they realize that the creators existed? The young man said that this is exactly what he wants. If such information came out in the press, who would act first? The police commissioner said that logically, the first to act would be the participant in the game of death. In other words, the creator of hell, Demon said. So Yeom Shungi is planning to use Jane Doe to lure out the remaining two creators. The young man said it was most likely only one person. The other person was probably already dead. It was supposedly Zhang Zhang Chul. If he were alive, Lucifer would have no reason to summon the young man to him. The young man added, Lucifer would be quite happy with a battle, four on four. The young man concluded, since Lucifer ordered one of his own destroyed, he can assume it's four of them against three. Lucifer wants to see an equal battle, not the beating of babies. Brahamark realized why he had left out one more person at the last meeting. One will look for Dante, while the others take care of the other two. It wasn't the fat man's helplessness. It was that he was already dead. The demon thought that Yeom Syungi isn't playing Lucifer's game right now. The young man is creating his own game. The young man said that was the only way they could lure out the last creator while observing the situation. Jane Doe is one step away from revealing their secret and the creator knows it. Syungi knew it was unlikely he would want to reveal his cards, so he would come after her. The kid told Jane Doe she was too slow and activated her key. Because of her, they might start getting hunted. Syungi added because otherwise she would be caught. And then she would have to explain how she had managed to get rid of those policemen. The police commissioner said it all makes sense to him now. So they're catching the last maker, Jane Doe. The police commissioner is holding a press conference on drugs and the press is in attendance. The TV news announced that 14 detectives are missing in action while apprehending drug dealers. The perpetrators have not yet been arrested. Passersby say how can anyone feel safe when law enforcement goes missing in broad daylight? Citizens are very concerned that these criminals are still on the loose. Tentatively, the suspect is still in the city. Her identity has been compromised. All the cops have been tracking Jane Doe. The boy, sitting in the park, was reading the news. He was aware of current events. The kid was angry. He thought it was the girl who made the mess. He told her to just play the game. Who in their right mind walks around town killing everyone in their path? The demoness asked the child, wouldn't it be better to sort things out? If the situation gets out of hand, the game could be over. The boy said he was in complete agreement with his demon. He would take some action. The kid told his demon Liazan that Jane Doe would have to be destroyed. Sung Min Wu began stalking Jane Doe according to eyewitness accounts on social media. The boy came to the place where she was seen a few hours ago. It was getting evening. She needed to find shelter. Everything was going according to the plan that Yeom Syungi had devised. Even in a perfect plan, there can be inaccuracies. Inspector Park showed up at the young man's house. It was obvious that he was anxious. 
The policeman grabbed the young man's chest and asked if he had lost his mind. The young man was puzzled. He asked the inspector to explain everything to him. The inspector screamed. The young man called the cops to arrest Jane Doe. After that, she sent all the cops to her hell. What's going on? Now everyone knows about it. The inspector shouted that they were his work colleagues. They had done nothing wrong. How will their families, who have lost their breadwinners, live now? Yom Seungi condemned those cops to eternal torment in hell. Seungi yelled that he couldn't have foreseen this. He didn't know Jane Doe would go to such lengths. The young man excused himself. He had used the manhunt to find this girl. If he had known that the consequences would be like this, he would have done things differently. Inspector Park said the two of them had gotten carried away. He said they shouldn't take risks on ordinary people anymore. It's unfair to use other people as bait. The young man said that they would definitely catch her, and then Puck could avenge his co-workers. But right now, they need to move forward. They made a mistake, and if they can't fix it, at least they'll try to get revenge. The inspector realized that there was no point in continuing this pointless conversation any further. Yeom Seungi, I knew it all. Jane Doe had an ace up her sleeve. But even if she isn't caught, with Jane Doe's help, it may be possible to find the last creator of hell. The young man was willing to sacrifice people's lives. All he cared about was his friends who believed in him, and himself. The young man mentally apologized to the inspector. But other people were absolutely indifferent to him. Yeom Seungi realized that he couldn't say such a thing to the inspector. In that case, the inspector would start to interfere with him. The young man respected his policeman friend, but he believed that his mind was limited. The guy thought it was a warm-up before his match with Dante. A young man decided to play a game called Kill Jane Doe. The news announced that the drug criminal, Jane Doe, was currently on the run. The boy knew he would find her soon. The girl thought she could hide out in this hotel for now. Jane Doe hoped the landlady of this hotel wouldn't give her away. The girl realized that her staying here wouldn't solve the problem yet. She had to wait for a while. The most important thing now was to survive. The officers were still able to narrow down the search. They were informed that witnesses had seen the suspect in such and such a place. The police commissioner, having received the information, drew a circle on the map in which to look for Jane Doe. The young man received this information from the police commissioner and decided that the girl had been found. He decided to try to catch two birds with one stone. He decided to use Ho Min Jae. The girl answered the call from Syunga and asked what happened. The guy said there was a job for the girl, she should come. The girl asked, wasn't her job to track down Dante? And he needs her to figure out his location. The young man texted Ho Min Jae the coordinates and told her to go there. Yom Syungi says that if they succeed, all that's left is to find and destroy Dante. Ho Min Jae moved around the specified area to figure out the creators. The girl had to find out who they were and what their exact location was. The girl made a portrait of a child and said that the last creator is a schoolboy. Apparently, there is no age limit in the game. Ho Min Jae sent her sketches in a message to the young man. The guy had almost all the information. He decided it was time to move out. The young people acted according to a well-established plan. A criminal broke into one of the apartments and spilled gasoline in it. A man set fire to this gasoline and the flames broke out. The apartment was on fire. The stranger quickly fled from the premises. The fire engulfed the entire area in flames. On his way out, this offender met with Commissioner Pack. The arsonist says he did what the inspector asked him to do. He hopes they never see each other again. Inspector Pak went up to the desk clerk, showed his ID, and said they had a room on the second floor on fire. The woman saw through the surveillance camera that the fire was already breaking out. The inspector said that the building is made of plywood. It will burn quickly. And asked if there were sprinklers in the rooms. The young man added that he had already called the emergency services. And now we have to evacuate. The woman asked what about the lodger. The girl lives on the second floor. Should we evacuate? The inspector said he would take care of her. Inspector Pak took the hard disk with the CCTV footage. He then smashed the computer with his foot. Jane Doe, sitting in the room, said she smelled a smell of burning. She asked Sumama to check outside to see what was wrong. 
Sumama looked outside and saw that the hotel was in flames. It was urgent to escape. The demon yells that there's a fire in the hotel. There's a fire in the hallway. Jane Doe assumed it was the work of the creator. She told Sumama to check the first floor. Sumama cautiously made his way to the exit and saw that there were pursuers. The demon returned and reported to the girl that they were now on the first floor. The girl assumed they had discovered her. She should be the first to stick them in her hell, then she'd be saved. Jane Doe told the demon to increase the radius to 10 meters and to do it right after she got down to the first floor. The girl pulled out her key and commanded that the hell of ignorance be opened. Jane Doe approached the inspector, pointed her key and tried to activate it. The inspector was completely calm. The girl looked at that key in bewilderment. What had happened? Why didn't the gates of hell appear? Inspector Pock stood up and said that the ability of his demon Gargamonga is a vigilante. If a girl committed the sin of his hell, her sin is canceled. The inspector angrily told the interlocutor that in trying to save her life, she had killed innocent people. It was an unjust act on her part. The girl thought, closer than eight meters you can't go near this man. Jane Doe realized the fire wasn't just needed to lure her out, the flames were blocking her escape route. The inspector coldly pulled out his key to the gates of hell. It glowed. The policeman said that the crime must be answered for by the law. The young man activated his key. The gates of hell appeared. It swung open, and Jane Doe was out of the game. Inspector Park says he's finished, and now Gagaki's coming out. Gagaka was traditionally in the closet the whole time. Gagaka said he was fully prepared. All that remained was to wait for the guest, and he did his part. Jane Doe is out of this race, just gotta deal with the little kid. Lucifer, who was watching the events, was outraged. Could it be that this man wanted to deceive him? Lucifer ordered the dissolution of the Alliance, even set a deadline, and their team, on the contrary, began to work more united. Lucifer pondered what he should do now. Lucifer thought maybe they just didn't want anyone else in their way. The young man's intention was a mystery to Lucifer. He couldn't figure it out. Lucifer thought he really needed Dante right now. Lucifer thought he would turn to Dante and say he had a request for an old friend. Lucifer decided that not even that, he would say he needed Dante's help. Dante replied, he had, after all, already told Lucifer that he shouldn't bother him anymore. The man will continue. They're not the same as they used to be. Lucifer's grown up a lot. He used to be a little demon. Lucifer said it was ridiculous. He could say the same thing about Dante, but unlike him, he'd grown inside. Lucifer said he remembered that young madman willing to sell his soul to the devil. Now Dante, he's a sensible grown man. Dante believed that to trust those around you, you need faith. He created his own hell. The fear of unbelief. This is the only way to save the souls of sinners. Lucifer says they're not what they used to be. They have become powerful and he realizes that they are not allowed to see each other like that. However, he has one last request for Dante. The man asked, what's wrong? The young man was devising a plan to eliminate the boy, Sung Min Wu. This plan turned out to be surprisingly easy to execute. Jinky Johnny takes the form of Jane Doe. The boy thought, here comes his target. He was lucky to find it before the police did. The next step is to lure the child into the room. The boy himself hurried to get into the same elevator as Jane Doe. In the elevator, the kid was dead serious. He gave no sign that the girl was interested in him. Jinky Johnny didn't pay attention to the kid. The kid thought he should go to her room where there would be no CCTV cameras. It didn't take long for the intruder to show up. The child came into Jane Doe's room and said he had found her at last. She made him worry. The child said that they would deal with the misunderstanding now. Jane Doe apologized to the boy and said it was nothing personal. The child was trying to activate his key. Gagaka, sitting in the closet, activated his hell from the intrusion. Gagaka said the bird is caged. But what about the demonic ability? What if the archdemon can sense the opening of the gate? It doesn't really matter. After all, people won't be able to react to a gate that's already open. The child was trapped. The gates of Gagaki opened and ropes entangled this boy. The child demoness was furious. They couldn't have done it alone. This whole plan from start to finish wasn't theirs to come up with. The demoness disappeared and asked Jinkijani, 
Whose work was this? Who pulled the strings? Jinky Johnny laughed in response and said that it was the work of a man to devour Lucifer. Gagaka called on the phone and said everything went smoothly, just as he had planned. Gagaka reminded the young man that there were now five of them left. Gagaka asked, since he was extremely useful, the young man wouldn't destroy him, would he? Yom Syungi said, of course it won't. Gagaka is very useful. He has the best trap. Inspector Park and Ho Min Jae congratulated Gagaku. He had done as well as they expected. Gagaka was very pleased with that. He felt like a member of the team. Demoness Liazan was extremely worried. He was up to something special. Lisan said he hoped Gagaka would like his dream. Liazan's ability, this is a cloud of sleep. This ability can only be activated on one person. It forces the victim to see their ideal dream, which is as similar to reality as possible. In addition, it is impossible to get out of this state until the subject realizes the difference between reality and fantasy. Jinky Johnny can't wake Gagaka up. Gagaka won't wake up. It's not bedtime, though. Demoness says it's useless because they've already lost. The boy says we can tie Gagaka up now. He's not going anywhere. Gagaka woke up and saw the reality. He was bound hand and foot. Gagaka was very frightened. The child sat down across from Gagaki and looked him over from head to toe. The boy was pleased with the result of his work. Jinky Johnny said with annoyance how Gagaka could sleep for so long. The kid said, finally Gagaka woke up. Babe said they could talk about work stuff now. The child asked, with whom did Gagaka ally himself? How many people are there in total? What are the abilities of his allies? The boy said to answer politely, briefly and succinctly. And to make it more convincing, he extended his hand with the activated key to the gates of hell. Otherwise, Gagaka and his demon would go to oblivion. Yom Syungi saw that Gagaka had been out of contact for a long time. He tried to track him down. Either he was killed or caught. That kid's not that easy. The young man said he was ready to confront this boy. Gagaka was completely perplexed. What's going on? He had sent that child to hell, hadn't he? When did Gagaka activate his sin? Gagaka was in a panic. Gagaka didn't know how he would look into Siunga's eyes later. He was afraid that the young man would be able to get rid of him later for this oversight. Gagaki's mind was assaulted by many thoughts. He didn't want to die. What should he do now? The fear that Gagaka felt was squeezing his heart more and more tightly. The child saw Gagaki's face and realized that he was very frightened. The child thought that Gagaka reminded him of his mother. This baby's mom was always cheerful. She worked at a fast food joint. She had a hard time raising a child alone. But despite this, she always had a smile on her face. She was always sociable and friendly. His mother believed that one should walk through life with a smile. The guests of the cafe noticed that this woman was glowing with happiness and smiling all the time. That's why she had no shortage of customers. The child thought it was a pathetic embarrassment. He wanted to wipe that stupid smile off his mother's face. The woman said her child behaved very well while she was working. He deserved a reward. The woman offered to buy him an ice cream. Minwoo wished his mother had at least a modicum of pride. A kid under the covers at night watching killer videos. He enjoyed watching a maniac massacre his victim. Minwoo was willing to watch such movies around the clock. The little boy was willing to watch anything but a smile. He liked even that expression on his face. It carried so much more sincerity. Then the boy decided to help his mom. He asked her to buy him a bird. The woman gladly complied with this request. It was willing to do anything for her son. The little boy said, this is what he did for his mommy, and he showed how he had done it to that bird. The woman was very upset. She told her son it's not a toy. He shouldn't do that anymore. The next time his mom came home from work, he showed what he had done to his favorite pet. Minwoo did something bad to his peer. He smashed his head with a rock and told his mom to see what he had done. One day a child showed his mother a severed finger. After that, the boy smiled. Finally, his mom cried. The kid didn't stop there. He liked his mom's real face. Eventually, the woman broke down. Minwoo's mom was no longer so friendly and welcoming at work. It seemed to the boy that his mother was afraid of him now. They no longer had such a sincere relationship. The woman really became afraid of her child. He was bringing her to tears. 
Minwoo thought it was a beautiful sight. The boy decided to create a place where everyone would have the same facial expression, where everyone would be honest and alive. Gagaka sat with the same expression on his face that this child's mom had. Minwoo asked, Gagasa is afraid of him? That's probably why he can't speak. The boy said, then Gagaka will have to be destroyed. Gagaka better answer, for he is running out of time. If Gagaka doesn't speak, the child will send him to hell, and there he will have this fear forever. Someone knocked on the door, and they told Jane Doe to open it immediately. They know the girl's here. The kid started to calm himself down. Don't panic. Jane Doe's not here. Gagaka shouted that they were policemen. Jinky Johnny has to help him. Min Woo realized that this might be an unpleasant situation for him right now. Jinky Johnny was removing the bag from his head. The cops kicked down the door and broke into the hotel room. The policemen shouted, everyone in the room. They saw the little boy, Jane Doe, and the bound Gagaku in the room. Yeom Seungi answered the phone. It was Kiru Bimbo calling him. He said they had Gagaka and the other creator. The young man found out that the little guy wanted to find out about them by questioning Gagaku. The young man told them to take them to the police station. The Gagaki trap, it's almost a 100% option, but even that has its drawbacks. Lucky it ended this way. It was a good idea to use Jane as bait. Police officers escorted all detainees to the station. Jane Doe was a wanted woman and wherever she went, detectives would come after her. The cops also bring along a witness who is likely to be the creator of hell. The kid thought he needed to get out of here faster. He thought he should have just sent Gagaku into the furnace and disappeared from there. Inspector Pack entered the room where the child was and said hello to the little boy. He asked how the boy was doing. Gagaku was released from the police station. Young Sung came to get him. Gagaka threw himself on his chest. He was his savior. Siungi praised Gagaku for not giving them away, even though he didn't know the detectives were coming. Turns out Gagaka can be trusted. Gagaka said that if he betrayed them, the young man would send him to hell. It was a hopeless situation. Shungi said that he was doubtful at first, but now he was sure he would let Gagaku live. And he thanked him. Agagaka said there were five hellmakers left. Yom Shungi said that he wasn't going to let Jemu Jin live. Western Police Station, two hours earlier. The police commissioner was informed that he had a visitor. Cherubimbo noticed that Yeom Shyungi had come to see him. This will be a business conversation. The police commissioner asked how the operation ended. The young man said that everything had gone according to plan. Now there were five creators left. Cherubimbo asked why the young man had come to see him. Usually they communicate by phone. Yom Syungi said that he personally wanted to ask the demon to leave this body and take the place of some high-ranking official from national intelligence. The demon said he would do anything. The young man asked Cherubimbo who Che Mu Jin was to him. Cherubimbo said the girl created hell for him, therefore she's his partner. Young Sung said that if he makes Brahamark the king of hell and ask him to save Cherubimbo's hell, Will Karabinbo be able to destroy Mujin in such a case? The young man corrected himself. He wouldn't call it murder. He only wanted Cherubimbo to destroy her brain. Cherubimbo stood up anxiously. How can this be? The young man said he could do it by entering another body. The demon asked, why do it? Isn't Mujin useful to him? The guy explained, he only needs Karabimbo's ability. Che Mujin is the ballast. It's just another variable. Che Mu Jin can be influenced by Lucifer in exactly the same way as a young man. He can't go up against the devil himself with such vulnerability in his defenses. The guy added that there was too much blood on her hands. With such bloodthirstiness, she has no right to condemn anyone to torment in hell. Yeom Seungi said he would repeat his question. What does Karubimbo want? To die with Mu Jin or to live and rule his own baki? The young man said he needed an answer now, or else Cherubimbo would go to hell with his man, and as for finding Dante, he would find another way. Chemu Jin in her office could not sit back and wait for the weather to clear. At any moment, Baham could betray her. The girl decided to reconvene her people. Cherubimbo appeared on the doorstep of the office. Mujin asked, what happened? 
Had he finished his business? Why did he change his body again? The girl said that Cherubimbo showed up just in time. She needs his help. She wants to gather her bandits again. Cherubimbo silently walked over to Mujin, grabbed her by the throat and lifted her up. The girl understood everything. The demon said he thanked her. She was a pleasure to deal with. Even though she was human, Mu Jin wheezed, Why is he doing this? Cherubimbo said he had no choice. The demon tearfully added that that guy was the devil. A young man read a message from Cherubimbo. He was transported to a regional hospital. Determined brain death. He's working on an infiltration into national intelligence. He was a man who played mindlessly in his room. At what point did this person take a wrong turn? This young man goes after his goal like a man possessed, sweeping away everything in his path. A young boy breaks blocks, kills animals and monsters on his way to his goal. Siungi has created a world of his own. Now the young man's goal is to save his men. It didn't matter to the guy that it would take killing Dante, Lucifer, or Chemu Jin. If that's how he achieved his goal, there was no stopping him. The young man looked at his hand, which had a countdown on it. Three days left, he thought, and he had already gotten rid of all the variables. Now it was time to solve the main problem. Inspector Park conducts an interview at the police station with a young boy. The investigator knew he had to lock up this child as Yoam Syungi had told him. If it's the creator, it looks like a small child. The kid didn't know what to do. He can't send a detective to hell right in the police station. If the cameras caught his abilities, then he'd be hunted down just like they did to Jane Doe. The child realized that on the other side, he could be attacked at any moment by another creator. The kid thought that if you put that cop to sleep, the other cops wouldn't let him out anyway. It was a stalemate for the kid. He didn't see a way out of it yet. A co-worker came into the room and said, maybe Puck would take a break for a few minutes and come out to rest. The inspector told the boy he would be out for a few minutes. He would bring something to eat. The policeman reminded him that there are CCTV cameras here, so the child had better not indulge. Sid sat pensive. A demoness appeared beside him. They had to do something. The next moment, the vacant chair in that room lit up and some strange signs appeared on it. Then Lucifer himself appeared in front of the child. He decided to visit the boy. The demoness immediately kneeled before the master and greeted Lucifer. Lucifer said the situation was not good, so he came here in person. Lucifer said that this creator of hell is too young. That's very surprising. But she chose him in spite of that. I guess she saw potential in him. The kid said he had a talent. He had always dreamed of creating his own hell. After that, he wanted to show it to people. Lucifer told the child to continue. He had captured his attention. Lucifer asked if the little guy wanted to work with him. Lucifer explained, there are a couple of low-grade demons along with their hell creators. Demons and humans have decided to stand against Lucifer. Lucifer says he can't let that happen. He wants to punish them all severely. The kid said he'd gladly do anything if Lucifer would get him out of here, and then he'll give them hell on earth. Lucifer said that in reality this game is not for the right to create a new hell. Dante himself is the ideal of the underworld. Lucifer could always create hell by using another human being. Lucifer asks Dante to create another underworld for him. He realizes that man has found eternal life, all the more so because he doesn't need anything. However, present-day people cannot be converted with the help of the hell of unbelief. Lucifer added that every day technology consumes the souls of people more and more, and with it the number of sins committed is increasing. Lucifer asks Dante to show his divine talent one more time. Lucifer doesn't ask this for him, but for those who can still be saved. Lucifer and Dante shook hands. In this way, Lucifer could ask Dante to create another hell. Lucifer admitted that he made this game in order to reduce the number of archdemons. The ruler of hell has been thinking for a long time about what rules to prescribe for this game. Demons are necessary to keep hell in proper condition and to motivate them to do a better job, he created ranks. Rank 1. That's the lowest rank. Then comes the middle rank, and closes out the top rank. Lucifer said that the higher demons carried his word throughout the world. The higher demons always obeyed all his orders without question. Their help was invaluable. It was a perfect arrangement where everyone had a role to play. 
but even a perfect mechanism can sometimes malfunction. The number of lower and middle demons serving the higher demons was growing, unlike the latter. Along with this grew the popularity and influence of archidemons. Lucifer realized that if things continued like this, there would be no escape from the rebellion. Lucifer, as the prince of the underworld, had nowhere to grow. The archidemons were confidently following in his footsteps, approaching his throne. The Lord of Hell felt it was necessary to point them to their place. The Lord of Hell felt it was necessary to show them where they belonged. However, Lucifer could not destroy them by his own hand. That would have raised doubts in the hierarchy of Hell. If the lower demons find out that the promotion is not worth a dime, then they will stop working. Eventually, Lucifer got the idea to create a game. In that case, the arch demons would have been consumed by their own ambitions and did everything with their own hands. After Lucifer fell silent, the demoness asked, why did the master choose to tell her everything now? Lucifer repeated, he needs help, and of course, he would be paid accordingly. The kid laughed. Judging by this revelation, the deal with the devil will be a fair one, and Lucifer will spare us if they agree to cooperate. Lucifer replied that the child was smart for a little man. Now he could see why Liazon had chosen him. The boy said Lucifer's motives were clear to him. He wanted to filibuster the number of higher demons, safe from the coup. The kid will continue that everything was thwarted by chance. Man confused battle royal with survival. Lucifer clapped his hands and said he was pleased with the little man's train of thought. Lucifer confirmed one of the creators, instead of killing all of his opponents, decided to team up with his opponents, thus upsetting the balance of the game. This man developed his own rules by which he operated and drew opponents to his side. Lucifer pointed his finger at the baby and said, that's why he needs this baby. The boy stated, Lucifer wants him to get rid of that man. The child said that in the power of those people, already law enforcement. In addition, there are several creators in their team at once. The boy asked, how could a small child handle them alone? Lucifer said the child would have a partner and he wouldn't act alone. The Lord of Hell said that this partner would be the first creator of Hell. It will be the genius who created the present underworld, Dante Alighieri, in person. Lucifer said he would enable him to create a new Gehenna. Doesn't he want to bring all the lost lambs back into the fold of the church? Does he not want to cast down all sinners who defame the name of the Lord? Lucifer asked Dante to give him and all those in need a helping hand, as in the old days. He called him an old friend. The Lord of Hell said that only Dante could do that. Dante and Lucifer shook hands again. The man said he had one condition. He wanted all other infernal realms destroyed. The young man received a message from the inspector that Baby Song Mi Nu was missing. Yeom Syungi immediately called Kerubimbo. He said that he urgently needed to infiltrate the National Intelligence Agency and get a list of people who had gone through the procedure and received entry visas. He needs to find all the clergymen on there. He wants to get their names. The young man called Ho Min Jae and told her to go to the airport with Gagaka and use her ability there. Gagaka will be the backup. Brahamark, watching the man's actions, decided something had gone wrong. However, it doesn't affect their plan much. Her Sayungi said they were already at the finish line. Lucifer and the little man and the demoness looked down on the night city. They believed they were at the beginning of great things to come. Lucifer was angry at Syungi. He felt that this wretched man had no right to underestimate him. Lucifer recognized the young man's courage, but it would soon end badly for him. Against Yeom Syungi, the decisive duel of the underworld began. Dante Alighieri stepped off the plane. Well, friends, I don't know about you, but I like this man Hua. The plot itself is quite interesting and intriguing. So if you liked the video, then subscribe to the channel and write a comment about what you liked. If new chapters of this title are released, I will definitely make a continuation. All the best. See you soon.